Welcome everybody to the, I don't know, seventh edition of the TAG this year. Um, we have today and we have um, next week and hopefully we can finish up in those two weeks. So um, I sent an email through Krista of what I think would be a good process for the day. Of course, you as TAG members, as the public get to decide what we actually do because I can't make motions and do all those things. So we need to make substantial progress today and next week. Um, I think most of the major revisions were sent in by the Tuesday deadline that I was hoping everybody would. I saw a few things trickling after that. Um, hopefully you've already reviewed everything in advance so that you can make quick, substantive comments um, and suggest changes as we go through this. I proposed two things in the email to the tag, and of course it's up to you as to whether we do those things, but um, for the uh, heat pump water heating uh, one, um, I'm hoping that we can review that in 30 to 45 minutes and then vote on it um, and then spend additional time on the minority report. Um, and then for C406, I'm hoping we can come to a consensus on the uh, Reed Hart proposal uh, after just a little bit more discussion and then vote on each of the other 15 or 20 um, C406 proposals after that. And I know Reed has reached out to some of the pro proposers for those other, um, other C406, so the language should be somewhat aligned or at least the, the battle lines drawn for today. So, um, Welcome, thank you so much for your time. It's, it's amazing. We've probably put in 1500 volunteer hours uh, to date and there's many, many more uh, to come. But the tag process is, is almost over for this initial burst. So thank you so much for showing up and for making your quick pithy comments. As always, please use your reactions as often as you can to clap for things, say you don't like things or that you do like things. Um, or you have a thumbs up for things so that I know what you are thinking and if we are ready to move on to the next subject. Um, also use your raise hand feature. I will call people in the order in which I see them raise their hand. Um, Zoom is not perfect about that. So if you feel like you haven't been called on for a long time and should be, um, just unmute and say something because um, it's, it's imperfect the way I see people's hands raised. Okay, with that, let's do um, a roll call just to make sure we have quorum. Okay, Michael Baranek. Eric Bedell. Here. Christopher Burroughs. CJ Brockway. Martin Connor. Michael Kurtwright. Kevin Duell. Here. Mike Fowler. Good morning, here. Patrick Hayes. Present. Gary Hickenet. Scott Henderson. Chris Holiday. Luke Howard. Present. Dwayne Johnlin. Here. Elizabeth Joyce. Bill Krause. John Lang. Here. Mike McGivern. Good morning here. Alan Montpelier. Henry Odom. Here. Eric Olnon. Andrew Poltorak. Irina Resputnis. Here. David Reddy. Here. Lisa Rosenau. 
here. Good morning. Poppy Storm. Gavin Tennell. Here. Sean Vig. Here. Amy Wheelis. Okay, so we do have a quorum present. Yay. All right. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. We have an exciting agenda today. Um, we would like to review it and then um, prove it. So are there any comments on the agenda as seen? We will not get to everything on the agenda today. We know that. Um, but this is everything that remains uh, for this uh, code cycle. So um, any comments on agenda items? This is Lisa Rosner. I'd like to withdraw one, uh, 184. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Entertain a motion to approve the agenda or Kevin. So moved. I Wait. second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Kevin, you had your hand up, so I was gonna see if you have discussion on this item. No, I'm the second. Okay, all right. Um, so we have a motion, we have a second. Um, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay. Uh, passes the flying colors. Um, Patrick. I'd like to make a motion that we operate regarding voting as we did during the last two sessions to where if we have one nay, we do a roll call count. No, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second for that motion? Second. We have a motion, we have a second. Further discussion? Okay, we're voting on adopting a rule that if there's a single nay in the voice vote, we will do a roll call vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay, that passes. That is a rule we have adopted for this session and this session only, even though we've adopted the same rule for the last couple of sessions. Um, rules like that need to be adopted at every session um, just as a matter of, of, of practice. Uh, Kevin. Yeah, I'm guessing that would apply to more than one day as well. Yes, I, that would be my interpretation that uh, one or more nays would require a voice vote or uh, a roll call vote. Very good. Okay, all right. We have uh, minutes now from 16th and the 30th of July. I hope everybody's comfortable with those on the ones for the 23rd but they should be available next week okay thanks Krista. are there any comments on the the minutes of july 16th or july 30th motion to approve second a motion and a second is there further discussion okay all in favor say aye Aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay. All right. We are now to the good stuff, the proposals. Um, and we are going to start um, with 239. Um, and I appreciate that, that Chris has put the names in front of these so everybody knows that they're about to come up. So they should, they should get ready to talk about it. So Henry. Yep, thank you. Um, so this came up last meeting or the meeting before, and there was a concern that if someone wanted to use their ventilation airstream to actually condition the space in a very low load building that this would prohibit. But um, in talking through with uh, David Reddy, we, um, oh, is this, sorry. Uh, I think this is an old code language. I had sent a new updated version last. Uh, hang on just a second, let me find it. Okay, I can help continue anyway. Um, 
Speaking with David Reddy, uh, the language had specified that if your vent system operates in conjunction with zone level heating and cooling system, so a true DOAS system, um, then there's limitations on conditioning that airflow. Um, and I think David's on. Um, I believe we came to uh, an agreement on the code language and um, I believe he raised the only concerns after it was put up for a vote. So unless he has further to add, um, I was going to keep the language as it was written. Yeah, no, nothing to add. Yeah, you're right. Um, it, it doesn't apply to the situation I was concerned about. So thank you for going through that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and presumably tempering in this language doesn't include heat recovery or anything like that, right? Yes, it was a mechanical uh, tempering outside of the core of the ERV system. Um, Chris, I can resend it to you. I've got it. I was just trying to find a word version and apparently I okay. don't have that. Not sure what I did with it. Did the revised language increase the, or rather decrease the supplier temperature? Um, yeah, I took it down from 60 to 55. All right, okay, there it is. And um, the one on the agenda is the one that's on the screen right now. So um, the one Crystal brought up initially isn't, isn't the one that was sent out with the agenda. Um, Robbie. Uh, is tempering defined in the code somewhere? I don't think it is. No, it is not. So I don't know what this is restricting me from doing. I, I suggest the proponent provided a definition of tempering or reword this to not use that word. Henry, does that, is that a reasonable thing to do, you think? Um, yeah, I could do that during this session and bring this back up or what would, what would work best? Well, one thing that can happen after we get to Lisa is someone could make a motion to table this for an hour or two and then we would then reconsider this in an hour or two with your revised language, if that's acceptable. That, that might be something that the type could do. Um, motion to table until um, the word tempering is defined. We have a motion, we have a, motion, we have a second. Um, um, I do have, I guess I would have one suggestion. If we just changed it to fire so, stream, heating and cooling. So the motion to yeah. table cuts off debate, I think. So, um, David, I, you have great things to say. Um, uh, I withdraw my motion to table. Okay. David, David speak your piece. Well, if, if it was changed to just supplier stream heating and cooling, I think that accomplishes the same intent or mechanical heating and cooling or something like that. Right? Uh, yeah. Okay. So you do have the word document, Krista. So if you take tempering and change it to mechanical heating and cooling, the word tempering to mechanical heating and cooling, would that be kind of what you're suggesting? I would suggest putting it in the, uh, not the, the code section, but because yep. I don't think that's language, but yeah, Sorry, following that. Mm -hmm. I, both places. Both places might be Supplemental good. air treatment and then supplier stream heating cooling. It's a lot of words. But... Yeah. <laughs> Is it um, possible? Does it have to be in the uh, the section name? I mean, we can use tempering in the section name, right? No, it, it, I think tempering in the section name is fine. And I think most people know what it refers yeah, to yeah. and it's clarified in the actual language. Uh, Dwayne Llewellyn. Yes, good morning, everybody. I suggest using supplemental heating 
um, because that's a known term and heat pump systems and we already have heating and the heat recovery. So wouldn't supplemental heating work? Exception two includes cooling as well though. But limiting to 55. Do we want to limit cooling to 55? The heating 35, the cooling is dehumidification only. Yeah, I, I think that the, I get confused because it says supplemental air and I'm going, what's the supplemental air? I mean, it seems like it is supplemental heating and cooling. Correct. Okay, um, Lisa. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, sorry, uh, can you guys hear me now? I can hear you, but I'm trying to mute everybody. everybody um, you're echoing. Yep, can you guys hear me now? Yep. Yeah, sorry about that. I was on my phone. It didn't work very well. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I, I uh, concur with Mike Kennedy's comment. I, that's what I was thinking too. What, what is supplemental air um, tempering? It was kind of confusing. So if we just say supplemental heating and cooling, I think it seems like that would take care of it. Um, but I also am kind of confused about the cooling side as, as well. So for Dwayne uh, Llewellyn's comment. Hmm. Okay, so it sounds like we have solved problem one. We have not, you're identifying, or are you, Dwayne and Lisa are identifying a different problem, which is with the cooling side. Is that what I'm hearing, Lisa? Show of hands of how many people think the language on the screen is great. Okay, a few, a bunch of people think it's it's great. Um, so, I guess what specific comments do you have on the language in front of us, um, Dwayne Llewellyn? Yeah, so um, so I think a supplement we want to allow supplemental heating and cooling, heating to temper the air. Although I agree, tempering is not a good, and to uh, take care of the latent loads, and so. Um, I think the intent is there is just defining the language. So, so you think the language is, is not great the way it's written on the screen right now? Well, I don't, I don't think supplemental heating could be defrost control, but it also can be discharge air tempering. Um, so I think maybe we should add another exception for discharge air tempering without using the word tempering. But the cooling, the cooling language is fine. So the it says shall be limited to section C4373, which kind of does lim define the supplier tempering. And then those two exceptions would be dehumidification or defrost. But I, I don't think we're talking about defrost only. We're talking about discharge air temperature. Correct. Uh, yeah. So if we put discharge air temperature in C4373, would that make it more clear? It would for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's fine with me. Uh, Robbie. I think with this change to referencing section C43.7.3, you've lost the cooling restriction. <laughs> Because the C4373 doesn't seem to tell anything about cooling. Oh. Yeah, that was my confusion too. I mean, C403.73 is clearly talking about heating. It says it shall not warm ventilation air. Um, and so, I mean, I think it's okay in the sense that, you know, the supplemental air, um, or the supplemental heating and cooling points to. C403.73 and C403.73 limits the heating side. So, you know, maybe it is okay 
stand alone. I, I guess I'd be looking for feedback from other experts. But you see what I'm saying is like, you know, it doesn't, C403.73 doesn't have to talk about cooling. It's a limitation on the heating side. Yeah, I mean, you could move exception two up into the base language, maybe. The C4355, if you moved exception two up there, then it's telling you comply with C4373 for heating. And then when you're cooling, you're only doing that for dehumidification. Yeah, that's better. Dwayne Llewellyn, what, what are your thoughts about that change? No, I agree. I think that should be in the root in the um, charging language. Great. And then would we eliminate the word hand cooling from the first sentence under C4 3.5.5, C4 3.3.5.5? Yeah, I think that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Oops. Okay. Um, uh, hang, hang on just a second. It says, shall be limited to section C403.7.3, but that doesn't seem like code language uh, limited yeah. to, the, to something or rather. Yeah. Yeah, shouldn't it just say uh, it shall comply with, just shall be, shall comply with. Good catch, Dwayne. Okay, my candy. Now, is there something in C4373 uh, that I need to add regarding the discharge air tempering and where? I don't understand that. Why would we temper discharge air? Well, that was Dwayne Llewellyn's comment that it needed but yeah, is there is there some some language we need in there about discharge air? There were there were two people that seemed to agree with with that. Yeah, this is this is Dwayne Llewellyn. Uh, so in cold weather climates, um, even with fifty or sixty percent sensible heat recovery or larger, the discharge air temperatures are less than fifty five degrees, which is undesirable for discharge directly into spaces in parallel path systems. And so there will be some uh, engineers will want to temper that air. So um, yes, we want them to move to high efficiency DOAS systems so they don't have to do that. But I think in the interim, we, we need to account for some discharge. And we wanna put that load on the more efficient heating and cooling system rather than electric strip resistance, which is what they're using for tempering. And so I think we need to limit um, the discharge air tempering to 55 degrees, which may not be a requirement in Western Washington, but uh, will be a requirement in Spokane. Henry, do you, do you understand or agree with what is being said? Uh, yeah, that was my intent for this proposal to they can they can deliver at 55 to the space. So whatever we need to make that clear works for me. Dwayne, Dwayne Loyland, it appears not to be clear to you um, that this is um, what, what would make it clearer to you? Well, I, I, 55 is pretty clear. I mean, currently it's 65. So this is big energy savings um to put that load on the more efficient um heating and cooling system so i'm fine with 55. okay so the language as written is is acceptable yes okay great um uh mike kennedy yeah i guess i'm confused did we edit 403.7.3 because in the integrated draft it's set to 60. so yeah mike i mm -hmm. So it seems like we're allowing, and I thought this whole point was to make it so you couldn't temper the air for just comfort purposes. I, um, so now that it's kind of changed and we're allowing that, and, and maybe it always did, I just didn't read it correctly. You know, we're saying you can temper it for whatever reason to 60. And then we have this exception for defrost control, which is really has all these I, limits. Mike, if we could interject, the, the revised language is on the screen here. So it's just above the C4355. Ah, okay. I still have a problem with, okay, it says 55. Why do we have all these limits for the defrost control in exception one? 
the 10% peak capacity and the lockout. And I mean, cause we're not requiring any of that for the supplemental heat. That was mainly put in there. A lot of manufacturers will have integrated defrost controls in their ERB packages. So mainly not to limit their product um, functionality. Hmm. Okay. Reed. Yeah, thanks. Um, and maybe this is covered elsewhere. I'm not totally familiar with all the proposals going through, but by eliminating heat recovery above, um, the heat recovery heating is not beneficial necessarily between the range of about 50, well, about 45 outside and, and 75. Um, and I don't know if the ERV section has a bypass required. Uh, that may not be cost effective on very small units, but uh, a bypass requirement may make sense. I believe in the ERV language, it's tied to an economizer and 100% outside air unit doesn't necessarily have an economizer. Henry, do you know the answer or does anybody know the answer to that one? This is, this is Dwayne Llewellyn. Yeah, there, no bypass is required less than 5,000 CFM currently. Um, I assume that's the same for the code language we're dealing with. Okay, so, so there is a, a bypass requirement above 5,000 CFM? Correct. Okay. All right. That, that's fine. I mean, I suspect that limit should be lower, but there's no proposal in there on that, so. Okay, I just want people to be aware that this actually requires a bypass for all units. So. Thanks, Reed. Lisa. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to just kind of answer to, to Reed's point. Um, does does this temperature difference or actually question to Reed really just drive the equipment to have to have bypass? Right. So, I mean, I. Are we are we achieving it indirectly? I guess is my question. I th think by removing heat recovery, we eliminate that. But I think the current code's language does technically require bypass. It yeah, it sounds like at five thousand CFM. So. Well, but the ventilation air heating control says you can't use heat recovery to heat it more than 60. Just to be clear, when you say bypass, it, the code doesn't require a bypass. It just requires that the heat recovery turn off. So like right. a, a right. wheel just would so stop. If it's, a, if it's a wheel, you just stop the wheel. If it's a fixed plate, you have a bypass, right? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing consensus on this, that we have good language in front of us. Uh, does anybody feel like making a motion or a comment on this? Actually, I'd, I'd make a motion to um, accept the uh, language on the screen. Okay, we have a motion to accept the language that we have edited uh, this morning. And do we have a second? Second, Dwayne. Okay, a motion and a second. Further discussion on this proposal. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed say nay. Okay, we are on to center MLC updates. Uh, Nick, are you around? Yes, I'm on currently. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So this is a revised proposal from the original one that we submitted. Um, we, we talked through this a couple of meetings ago and our original proposal was to look at um, aligning with ASHRAE 90.4 version 2019, which is the most current version, uh, but then also restricting the um, size of the data centers to, to a lower threshold than what they have. And I think Dwayne, you had a comment on, on that during the last call and I've since talked with the 90.4 committee and they're they haven't provided any more information to suggest that we should change that. And so this revised proposal simply aligns with what Seattle did um, and requires that just data center systems comply with the version of, of 90.4 2019. And it, it just adds language to, uh, to, to do that. And the definition section just revises some language that's unnecessary and removes a term that's not used in the code. Cool. Thanks, 
Are there any comments yeah. on this? Dwayne? Uh, just, this satisfies all my concerns from last time. Motion to approve as shown on the screen. Second. We have a motion. We have a second to approve the language as submitted and as shown on the screen. Uh, is there further discussion on this? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay, we are done with two proposed Two proposals. Thank you, Nick, for, for working so diligently and, and making sure it, uh, it was good when you resubmitted it. We are to PTHP controls by Mike Kennedy. You have the floor, Mike. All right. Um, this proposal is, is targeted at, I guess, package terminal uh, equipment. Um, currently, in the supplemental heat section, we require, we gave them an exception that we're requires them to have a 40 degree ambient air lockout of the supplemental heater. Um, this, from what I can tell, is roundly ignored. Um, none of the units um, can comply with this. One manufacturer allows a 46 degree lockout. None of the other ones have a lockout. Most of the units lock out the heat pump at 40. Um, so this is an attempt to, I guess, get language that maybe is more enforceable and at the same time kind of requires that the heat pump be somewhat functional at temperatures that we care about so that it has defrost and can run down to a temperature that at least covers, you know, some amount of the heating season in, in multifamily and, motel and lodging where the units are common. Um, there are a lot of units that do meet this, including some from major manufacturers. Um, and so that is the attempt of this language. Um, someone did point out that perhaps it should be, um, at least in the text at 403.3.2.4, instead of package electric equipment, it should be package equipment providing both electric heat and cooling. So that would be the one change I would make to this. And I guess I'd, Dwayne, does that work for you? I think it should say electric resistance heat because the heat pump is electric heat. Yeah, you could say that, <laughs> but that has its own way of being redundant. I, I agree. So does Mike, does, does what uh, Krista struck through electric, does that satisfy what you were saying? I would move the electric to uh, just after both. Yep, there you go. Robbie. Just curious what's meant by the capable of and configured to. I'm not sure that's common code language. Uh, Robbie, we've been trying to. We'd be trying to push all of our code language to capable of and configured to. So we're adding capable of to all those configured to's throughout the code? Yeah, actually, I think I, I agree with Robbie on this. We initially were going capable of and configured to, and then I think we did start just saying configured to. I know that there was a recent, you know, in previous code cycles, we switched to configured to, but capable of and configured to is new to me. Are there other comments on read? Yeah, I, I would argue that capable of and configured Two is a wordiness that came from format and compliance at 90.1. Um, I agree that configured two says enough, so. Lisa? Yeah, I, I, I like this proposal. I'm glad that Mike put this together. I mean, this is, this is a detail that I, I don't know if jurisdictions are enforcing this. Um, so, you know, by adding this additional language, you know, perhaps, Highlighting this will uh, draw attention to, as Mike was saying, that there's a lot of products that have been installed out there that, you know, basically were 
utilizing supplemental electric supplement. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Tighten that up. Oh, did you, I think you might've cut out for a second there. Oh. That should have been... All right, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, so bottom line, I think I, I like this proposal. I think that it tightens it up um, and hopefully this will kind of highlight um, to the jurisdictions to look for this detail. Thanks, Lisa. Kevin. Sorry, mute button. Uh, I was wondering if the screen could be a little bigger. Thank you. Maybe if one more step up. <laughs> good, there good we go. Kevin. That's Thank you. For everybody. Six hours of looking at code language. <laughs> that's too small. It's, it's oh, that's beautiful. OK. Um, Reed, you still have your hand up? Um, I don't know if you have an additional comment. Oh, and I'm sorry. I had an additional question. Oh, go ahead, Kevin. Uh, in the exception for the first paragraph, it, it refers to personal wireless service facilities. Uh, I was wondering what that means. That, that comes from a, a requirement that's in legislation that that it's those little cell phone mm -hmm. closed groups can, um, is, is what they're talking about. Gotcha. Thank you. Dwayne Lowen. Yeah, this question for Mike Kennedy. Mike, on the 25 degrees, um, are you implying then that they that uh, designers should size their packaged terminal heat pumps for 100% of the load at 25 degrees so that compressor only uh, heating will meet the load? I was not proposing that. The intent was, I mean, there's a lot of ways we could get, there are units that run that are like, basically ductless heat pumps and are full on heat pumps. They don't need electric resistance heat at all. Um, it's just that they're kind of some of the smaller makers of those units. Um, the 25 was just, I want the heat pump to be able to run down to 25. Most of these units lock it out at 40. No, I understand that. But from a design standpoint, most engineers in electrical does engineers do not size the load for both compressor and resistance heating operating at the same time. Right? Um, in the, yeah, I, th I think you're correct. Well, yes, it, at the design condition, that's true. So then that forces designers to size the unit for 25 degree outdoor temperature, which is basically design around here for compressor only. Um, I think it depends. It doesn't say that you can run, you have to run the heat pump only. Right, but they're not, they're not sizing the electrical load to run the strip and heat pump at the same time. I'd, I'd love to hear from other, if there's any electrical engineers online, but I'm pretty sure that's the fact because that increases the size of electrical service consist dramatically on a uh, R1. Right. I, well, I, you know, somehow they managed to put in, you know, it's a couple of major manufacturers that make units that do this and somehow they managed to get installed in a lot of situations. So I'm not sure that this is a concern. Okay. Reed. Yeah. As far as I know, you typically do size the electric supply to handle both um, and and you operate them together both heat pump and strip heat um, you know this just says above 40 degrees you can't operate the strip heat I mean that's already in the current language so but the idea is the heat pump operates with it down to 20 Hey, are there other comments? Dwayne and Reed, you still have your hands up? I don't know if you have further comments or... Well, I just, um, I'd love to hear from an electrical engineer because I think that's a major change to require the compressor and electric strip to operate um, 
at the same time with package terminal equipment. Normally there's a changeover that allows them to reduce the electrical service size, but um, I'm not an electrical engineer, but I've, I've specified a lot of these systems and I don't think that they typically operate concurrently, but- This um, doesn't require them to. So it just requires a changeover at 25 degrees. It, it, it requires that the unit be capable of running at 25 if it can be, I mean, if it doesn't meet the load and that, you know, obviously package terminal units, I mean, they're kind of terrible the way they run their resistance. They run it all the time. Um, and that does not limit this here. So I mean, essentially the first stage of heating is heat pump down to 25 compressor. And then if it's unable to meet the load, the compressor can turn off and the electric strip can operate below 25. Or even above 25. Okay. There's nothing here that limits that. Okay. But Dwayne, Dwayne's concern is that above 25, they would both have to operate according to this. Um, but I mean, a package terminal heat pump is just that it's packaged, right? So it's gonna have a single power connection. So that MCA that the electrical engineer is using to size that um, service to that unit has to factor in both of those components, right? Well, Mike McGivern. Yeah, I was just going to uh, reiterate what Robbie just stated that the typical electrical load would be sized based on the nameplate uh, MCA of any given piece of mechanical equipment. And um, so I would agree with what Robbie just said and that uh, it, it shouldn't be an issue uh, with regard to this proposal. Thanks, Mike. Are there further comments on this? Okay, does anybody wanna make a motion on this? Motion, motion to approve. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 I think the motion should aye. have been, we did a couple edits, so it was a motion to approve as modified, but I'm sure Chris has got that. I think that was assumed that restating the motion, the motion is to approve as, my understanding of the motion was motion to approve as modified. Thanks, Mike. Um, any opposed, say nay. Okay, thank you um, everybody for, for contributing to a great discussion and um, taking action on this. The next one is also about package terminal heat pumps. This is a Lisa one. So Lisa, you have the floor. Uh, actually, I, I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Dwayne Llewellyn to, uh, to present this one. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, I'm, uh, we've made some great inroads around package terminal heat pumps, which have been a thorn in my side as a uh, as a provider of technical support uh, and an inefficient solution, frankly. And so, uh, Dwayne Johnlin's proposal on the U factor adjustment, Mike Kennedy's proposal on the controls, has made a great inroads in that. Um, but that said, um, we still have uh, the opera. Uh, there still is a pathway in the code to install package terminal heat pump equipment in group R2, uh, multifamily. I was just talking to a, 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 about a big project uh, locally here, which is all package terminal heat pumps in multifamily R2 with DOAS. So that exception still applies that if you provide, um, which you have to provide anyway, energy recovery in R2, um, but if you meet the DOAS requirements, then you can use package terminal heat pumps um, and get out of the economizer requirement. So this proposal is to essentially delete that option to not allow um, that exception for economizers for other than group R2. So in R2, we want to steer them to more efficient, I believe, to more efficient heating and cooling options, whether that's ductless or some of the high efficiency, the plus 15% PTAC solutions are gonna be coming on board. So that's essentially what this is, is to eliminate that exception for economizer with DOAS for R2. 
Thanks, Dwayne. Um, my, I'm going to have one initial comment, which is that this exception is kind of a word salad. And um, I'm going to suggest for clarity that maybe this is one and then uh, this yeah. is two, just because there's a lot of ands and ors. And I'm assuming that this whole thing is one exception. So it has to be in mechanical room adjacent to the outdoors and installed in order to get the exception. Is that is that correct? Yes, because that that yeah. in mechanical rooms adjacent outdoors was clarified by Eric Vandermeer's. Um, yeah. I can't remember about. So there's been an issue about whether P tax or package thermal heat pumps no. meet the definition of installed outdoors because a section yep. of the unit is installed outdoors, the condensing portion. Um, but I think that's been clarified. Okay. That's, that's the yeah. next proposal. That's proposal number 228. Yeah, the next proposal coming up. So yes. Okay. I, I guess I'm, I'm suggesting that I think we could clean up this language a little bit. Um, and I think there's two exceptions really in well, there's two bullets maybe under the exception. There's there's um, two exceptions here. Okay. We've got Eric Vandermeer's coming up, which redefines what's installed outdoors in a mechanical room. And then you've got this exception. Um, while we don't want the exception to apply to group R2, yep. um, I'll leave it up to you guys to write the language. I, I was thinking one way to clean it up would be to have this be one bullet for cooling systems not installed outdoors. And then the second bullet would be uh, cooling systems in a mechanic room adjacent outdoors and installed in conjunction with DOS compliant, blah, 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 blah. Because I think that there's two exceptions in here. It's not clear to me just reading it that that, what all, which and and which or, or applies to what. So that's that's just my argument. Can we do that on the screen right now, Krista? Can can we just make a 1A and a 1B uh, as starting with the word cooling? I, I have a suggestion that Eric Vander yeah. made Proposal covers the same thing, and we're going to end up, you know, doing it again. So perhaps we make these changes in the next proposal. That's I, so I second that. But we don't do it twice. Okay. There wasn't a motion, so no second is is required. Yeah. Seems like we like this. So I, I don't know what what's the path forward for this. What are we? What would we actually vote on if we vote yeah, on? This? I, I think we vote on excluding R two from this exception. I, I would like to make a motion to approve this proposal just as it is on the screen. And then the cleaning up the word salad, we could do via Eric Vandermeer's proposal number 228. Okay, we have a motion on the table. Is there a second to release his motion? Second. Yep. Which is to, uh, the motion is to approve this with full knowledge that we will reconsider this very, very shortly and clean up, clean it up at that point. So we have a motion, we have a second. Is there further, you have the people with your hands up um do you want to comment before we vote if yeah, so yes okay, yes go yeah go ahead eric so so this this is a tough one because um i've seen this happen on on numerous projects where these computer rooms idfs whatever you want to call them or even pccrs or sccrs uh, if you know that nomenclature for microsoft um where it's real tough on the constructability side to get an economizer, especially because most of these rooms use fan coils uh, or some type of fan coil to serve them um, and trying to duct outside air in, in the middle of the building or in garages, to, it's, it's real tough on the constructability side. So what I'm saying is, yes, I agree that an economizer is, would be helpful, of course, right? I mean, for the energy efficiency, but maybe there's an exception that's also uh and maybe i need to write this exception for heat recovery for example if you use a fan coil unit that has heat recovery that you can negate the use of an economizer um because again constructability is, is brutal for this one so that's all i need to say for that one those exceptions already exist eric those, uh, yeah. there's a there's a prescription oh, oh, okay. one for heat recovery chillers and then I believe if you're a, if you're actually a data room like what you're describing, uh, yeah. the previous, I think we reviewed a proposal earlier today. That section where you have to comply with the ASHRAE, um, I don't I don't remember the chapter number, but uh, that doesn't require economizers. You're allowed to meet that via heat recovery. I, I don't know who was just talking, but 
but thank you for that clarification. And if that's in the code, then I have no issues with this uh, with this proposal. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, uh, Henry. Yeah, I, I paused. My internet cut out the wrong time. So how is this specifically only removing lower efficiency P-tops? It's because they have an outside air connection that's always ventilating the space. Um, I mainly ask this because there's a there's a slew of really new promising P-tops, inverter driven, um, potentially going to hit the market well before this code proposal comes in. And I don't want to negate them just uh, based on this proposal for other than group two our occupancy. So um, could the proponent just, you know, highlight the reasoning real quick here, please. Uh, yeah, Henry, this is Dwayne. Yeah, they're still eligible for the exception for plus 15% efficiency increase. So that's if, if more efficient PTAC products like Anova or some of the others come online, then they can still meet, I think it's exception five. I'm, I'm not, I just, it's not in front of me. Um, right? Yeah, this is Lisa. I, I, I concur with what Dwayne Llewellyn just said that, I mean, really what we're trying to do is we're just trying to limit the use of the, you know, poor performing equipment basically, which is what this kind of, it leaves the door for those, you know, right now. And so what this does is it pushes people over to exception five, which requires 15% better than code efficiency. Okay, uh, those new inverter driven ones actually don't have HRI ratings and they do behave differently. And so there is gonna be, this is outside our issue, but there's gonna to have to be maybe a new standard set up for them or something like that. So I, I, I can't tell you right now if they would be 15% more efficient or not, so. Um, yeah, Henry, Henry, this is Dwayne. That's an H -A -A -H -R -I issue that needs yeah. to be resolved because they're not rated at part load. And I, I totally agree with that, but I think that's out the, outside the scope of this DAG. Yeah. I mean, we, okay. we kind of need to make sure that, that general and general products are available for the market and, and all that. Is there somebody from AHRI uh, that can speak to that? Okay, in the past we've had some people from that group, I think. So, okay, we'll go to uh, Dwayne Johnlin is has his hand down. So Mike Kennedy. Yeah, I, I guess I just wanted to follow on with the comment that was just made. Um, I did do some research of a, a unit that's being sold in the Northwest that is a, basically a DHP. You know, it performs like a DHP. I'm not sure it's rated efficiency at the rated point would comply, but it, this would totally shut off that market. Um, Potentially, I mean, the 15%, they may or may not be able to make that at 100%. So I, I, I hate to, I mean, those are completely great um, units. So I think there is an issue potentially. Um, we would be giving them three years to figure it out, I guess. Yep, that's, that's an advantage. Yep. So the HRI generally doesn't move that quickly. Well, Nick, Nick Harbeck commented that um, He's going to bring us back to the engineering team there and talk about it, I guess. So um, just for everybody's knowledge, so you know, even when we get done with next week's tag, the code will not be final. It will go to the MBE committee. It will go to the council. Then we'll be out for two months of public comment. Then we'll go back to the council for another few months uh, for more public comment. So um, AHRI, I would love it, Nick, if you would um, Make a public comment when this goes out for public comment on uh, whatever you see fit about those 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 new um, PTHPs and how they would fit in here or not fit in here. So we we still have latitude to modify the code. We not the tag, but we the MBE committee and the building code council. So I just want to make sure everybody we it doesn't have to be 100% perfect. And if there's updated information, those can be taken into the public comment period. So David, ready. Um, yeah, I guess I would just want to make the point that, I mean, it seems like it, this intent is focusing on R2 to try and mitigate the PTEC, PTHP issue, but I mean, 
Oh, it's it's not actually doing that. It's just saying you can't do this for R2. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I guess I'm not quite necessarily agreeing. And I also am concerned with some of the more efficient systems that could come to market um, uh, or that don't meet the rated performance. So why, why only focus on R2 here? I mean, what about non-residential applications? Hi, David, this is Dwayne. Um, so R2 is, you know, continuously occupied, tends to have a lot of more heating hours. Um, and also, um, the, the, this is an economizer exception. So don't, don't forget that. This is an exception to an economizer for R2. Um, it's not eliminating P-tax. It's basically saying that you can use P-tax if they're plus 15% efficient through exception number five, which I think will account for any future AHRI changes or improvements to steady state efficiency that we've seen. I think this combined with some of the other changes um, will still allow the use of, of PTACs in both R2 and R1 occupancies. We've also, as you know, we've uh, now required ERVs or HRVs for R2. Um, so there's some mitigation there of, of savings. So it's just trying to promote um, more efficient heating options for R2 occupancies. Okay, Th thanks, Dwayne. Um, Eric, you still have your hand up. Um, I'm nope, assuming- Nope, uh, sorry again, I'm gonna take okay. that right down. Hi, <laughs> John. I'm just concerned about how how does this relate to the requirement now that for balanced ventilation that's in the code that requires R2 uh, to have continuous mechanical ventilation and, and heat recovery exhaust of, uh, of that. I mean, is this still necessary under that condition? Hi, Dwayne. Uh, this is Dwayne Llewellyn. Um, so right now there's a loophole, right? You, if you meet the requirements of DOAS per exception one, you're exempt from economizer in R2. So R2 is allowed to do a base efficiency, standard code efficiency P package terminal heat pump um, if they classify their balanced ERV as DOAS, correct? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> All right, so exception one says that if you install a DOAS, it doesn't say it's not a uh, group, uh, occupancy group specific, less than five watts per square foot, which would be residential occupancy, you're exempt from economizer. So if I put in a package terminal heat pump and I have a DOAS system, we can call it energy recovery, residential energy recovery, if you want then we're exempt from economizer. And that's a bad thing. Right, so that's why the proposal is to exempt R2 from that exemption, unless they have a more efficient package terminal heat pump. Mm. Thank you. Okay, um, I think Henry. Oh, yeah. Lisa. Yeah, yeah, just quick comment, and I apologize. I, I'm going to try to get a better connection. Um, I also want to emphasize this is a prescriptive, economizer is a prescriptive requirement. So if a project really wanted to put in a PTAC unit um, that maybe doesn't have an AHR, AHRI rating, they can <clears throat> show 15% better than code they can always do the total building performance task. Yep. So we're not eliminating this, the opportunity to use these types of equipment. It's just, we're saying that it's, you can't do it prescriptively. If, if you wanna do that, you have to model your, your building. Henry. Yeah, um, so one of these specific units I'm thinking of inverter driven versions don't even have an outside air connection at all. So would that just be disallowed entirely? And that 
in a sense is even better than what the current ones are that always just leak outside air through the unit, which you're heating directly all winter. And so actually cutting that connection out entirely would be an overall energy savings. So Henry, are you talking about a split system? No, it's uh, it's one of these new inverter driven, it's called Olympia Splendid. It's really, really ideal for single family homes, but um, it doesn't have any sort of outside air ventilation capability. So we're not talking about outside no. air ventilation. We're talking about it's economizer. A, um, and so- a, It's a P-tub. That's exactly what this is referring to. It sits in the wall, has two connections to the outside, but does not ventilate. Correct. So is it plus 15% more efficient? Well, this kind of goes back, even if it's not, this says you have to have an economizer if you're one of these units. So it's saying you have to have an outside air connection. Uh, uh, well, first of all, an ERB, an outside air connection for ventilation is required by the code, a balanced ventilation system. So we're not talking yeah. about that. We're talking about economizer. I just want to yeah. understand your question. But the economizer yeah. is, is, is assumes that that you're doing your your heating and cooling via your your uh, an airflow. And, and uses that airflow, but but we're not doing that. We're doing a, some minimal ventilation mechanically, and then with like one of these Innova products or something like that, we're we're doing the heating and cooling that doesn't involve pushing any air into the um, unit. So an economizer that would just outlaw that category of equipment, which is looking really promising. <laughs> I knew you'd like that, Dwayne. Okay, we, uh, Mike Kennedy. Yeah, I just looked up the unit I'm familiar with that I think is a, a great package terminal unit. Um, and at least in their product literature, they do provide EERs. It's inverter driven. It's based on the Mitsubishi uh, mini split. Um, and they do actually exceed the current requirements for package terminal equipment by 15% on the cooling side. So those units, I don't know about the other ones, but it would not preclude them. Thanks, Mike. That's great. Great to know. Um, Why not limit these to R1, since this is really a hotel unit that is really crappy when we need to get cooling and, you know, especially affordable housing units. I don't know why we're targeting R2 with the new class of equipment that isn't quite hit the market yet. And this is really a hotel motel issue. Uh, well, this is Dwayne and I, I don't believe this is tip, uh, really a hotel motel issue. I, I'm seeing a lot of multifamily in Seattle that's going this direction, but also mo hotel motel is intermittent occupancy. So I don't think the savings would be substantial. And basically the way we've rewritten the code now for hotel motel, uh, moving on, if they want to do P-tax or package terminal heat bumps, they're going to have to put in DOAS. There's no other, um, or these plus 15% efficiency. We basically, for hotel and motel now moving forward, um, starting when this code goes into effect anyway, um, they'll have to put in uh, uh, heat recovery ventilation. Just to keep us on track, uh, the proposal on the table that we have a motion and a second for is just about accepting the group R2 occupancies from the economizers. Uh, is there further discussion on that particular issue? My only final comment is the new PTUPs are about you know, 3,000, 4,000 per unit and they should uh, respond very similarly to the current inverter driven heat pumps. BRFs gets up to $10,000 per residential unit Mini splits are about 7,000. And so uh, there's a serious cost impact if this does ex uh, not allow inverter driven PTUPs in the future. That's it. And uh, just Henry, all I say to that, that's an A8. Once we get a part load efficiency value for these new PTAC equipment, 
and get that updated, then we'll be able to include those. I have no problem with that. But right now, we rate all that equipment on steady state, and that's going to be an issue. Teresa. Yeah, I, I'm going to say it again to underline. This exception is not eliminating the opportunity to install this higher efficiency. Can't comply with this um, prescriptively. So underlining that again. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I see no more hands up. Let's do the vote. Um, all in favor of the proposal, uh, it has not been modified. Um, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Okay. Ab abstain. I abstain as well. This is Kevin. Okay, we have two abstentions. Um, we have no nays that I heard. So we will not do a roll call vote for the rules adopted earlier. Um, okay, this passes. And um, we are on to the next one which is a similar subject. So, uh, Eric. Eric, are you in the house? Is anyone representing uh, proposal 228? Uh, Eric Bandeme is on vacation this week. Hmm. Okay, well. But, well, could I could I just say something in favor of this one? It, Please. I, I think it's a pretty straightforward clarification of, of what we meant by um, these exceptions. And and uh, it's is not adding a requirement, it's just kind of making clear what it is that we are talking about um, to to just just clarify <laughs> that that um, uh, we were talking about where the, the supply fans were located. Um, this, I think, his explanation is that this cleans up what um, what the status of split units is. It's Dwayne, uh, Dwayne Warren. Yes, I just want to second uh, John Lynn's comment there. We this has been a an issue in terms of enforcement on you know, there's there's through the wall equipment like package thermal heat pumps vertical equipment and so part of the equipment is located outdoors technically from the envelope and part of it's indoors and so I agree with Dwayne Johnlin that this clarifies that so that we can kind of uh, more simply apply the economizer exceptions. Thanks Dwayne. Lisa. Can we make a motion to approve a proposal if the proponent is not present? Sure. I believe we can. Um, I would like to make a motion to approve. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. I would just like to say that I still think that this, this is not, it's not clear to me. Maybe it's clear to everybody else, but it, it um, there's some ands and ors that are that are not don't, don't seem like they're, they're as clear as they could be. So, oh, we have a motion on the floor, Mike Kennedy. Then we have a second for it. So, I for the discussion, Mike. Um, just wanted to. I, I was a little confused about whether this really clarified the PTAC and the vertically separated package equipment, um, uh, particularly the PTAC, where the supply fan. I mean, where is it in that unit? It's in the wall. Um, it's. I guess I'm not right. I'm unclear. Go ahead, Lisa. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think it's pretty clear that the supply fan. He's saying that 
this, you can't use this exception if the supply fan is outdoors, you know, so it's actually not within the space at all, um, or it's in a mechanical room. So, you know, a PTAC unit, the fan is, it may be adjacent to the outdoors, but it's, it's not, the fan itself is, is actually located within the, the occupied space. So I think this clarifies that this only applies to those units um, that are okay. you know, installed outdoors. So, uh, uh, Shell, to, to your concern, I can see that it is clunky wording. Um, uh, so it's, it's reading uh, supply fans, fan is not installed outdoors nor in a mechanical room adjacent to the outdoors. I would insert comma and, and is installed in conjunction with Toaz blah, blah. So, so what you're saying is where supply fans fan is not installed outdoors, nor in a mechanical room adjacent to the outdoors is two options. And then everything else is required for to, to meet the exception. Right. So either the supply fan or the um, mechanical room could, yeah, okay. That, and, I think that, and the other change I'd make in that sentence is one line down the word serving. Would be, would be serves. I'm just doing this on the fly, so you engineers, please make sure that I didn't just do something ridiculous. Should the and is be a comma is? I think. I think and is is fine. I think serving is actually appropriate because you're saying cooling system serving only spaces. Or wait a minute, you're saying cooling system where the supply fan is, I think the, the, but the, the noun is still cooling system, the subject of the sentence. So I think it's serving. Okay, I'm fine with serving. Um, okay, um, Dwayne Wallen. Yeah, I, I think that the issue, the, the potential question here is the definition of outdoors, because really, technically, uh, even on a rooftop unit, the supply fan is within the condition envelope, because the condition envelope extends through the unit and the supply air. So could maybe we clarify this by saying that it's outside the building envelope, which okay. is a defined term? I don't know if that's actually a concern because it says either outdoors or adjacent to the outdoors, right? Well, what is outdoors? <laughs> when the unit is running, the supply fan or the supply fan and the dampers open, the supply fan is in the envelope on a rooftop unit, correct? Okay, I, you, yeah, you're more clear to say outside the building thermal envelope. Or condition space, maybe? Uh, no, because it's within the condition space. Even within a, a rooftop unit, the, the heat of the fan motor goes to the condition space. But the but these mechanical rooms generally aren't. No, that that's clear. Mechanical room, I think, is is clear. It's the I don't know. I'm just because outdoors. Um, I'm thinking outside the thermal envelope. Okay. And the term building thermal envelope is it would would be uh, would be italicized as a defined term. That's correct. Kevin. So as I understand it, the concern here is an exception for split systems versus unitary. Well. That's well, if the indoor air handling unit of a split system is in a mechanical room adjacent to outdoors, economizer is required, regardless if they provide DOAS. Okay. So rather than saying what you don't want, why don't we say something about split systems since they are a defined item? It's a good point. 
and I, I don't want to tread on Eric's language because he's a <laughs> code god. But yeah, <laughs> and 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 supply fan. I'm not sure if that's a defined. Uh, you know, it's assumed that we're talking about the fan that supplies air, conditioned air to the space, with a split system as the air handling unit. Um, okay, so there gonna, are some assumptions here. If we're going to, you know, sub substantively change language per Kevin's suggestion, I'd, I'd hope that we would table it rather than use this group of 46 people's time to, <laughs> to modify it, unless it's, it's a quick word or, or two. Is Kevin, were you suggesting a word or two change or were you suggesting a rewrite of the exception? Well, it just seems like we're trying to get, get very fine pointed here, but getting wrapped around the axle. And I thought, well, perhaps we're going in the wrong direction here. So I, I guess I would like to make a motion to table this for further work. Okay, we have a motion to table. Is there a second for that motion to table? Second. I have a motion to table and a second. All in favor of motion to table say aye. 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 Any opposed to the motion to table say nay. Okay. Um, it has been tabled um, probably until the next meeting. So, um, Chris, I'd hope that you'd send the, the markups as a suggestion to Eric and, um, and the, the questions that were asked. And um, anybody who has any questions that they want, make sure Eric hears about this and Kevin, especially your suggestion. If you want to send that as an email to Eric, then that, that will probably expedite our next meeting. Great. Thanks. OK, so we are on to. John Lynn, hydronic system, max flow and piping system, 166. Okay, um, and this was this was tabled before because there was a question about the, the five and six inch pipe sizes and whether that, that was appropriate flow rates. And we did um, check with the uh, um, grand masters high atop the ASHRAE tower and there, there was a, a a logic path to doing um, to to doing those flow rates as uh, as we have it in the in the copied it over in the table here. Uh, it was based on on uh, life cycle life cycle cost analysis, but um, in in the interest of keeping us aligned with the national standard, I'd like to just um, go back to uh, the language. As we've got it on the screen, and and um, um, move that we accept it as shown. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Further discussion, Abby. Dwayne, can you remind me this uh, added line about larger pipe sizes? Is that uh, from Ashray? <laughs> Because that's um, a change from your original proposal, right? Oh, geez, I don't remember. Somebody commented that we needed to have uh, a, a formula in there for uh, to handle other pipe sizes. If that, is, that is from ASHRAE. OK. Robbie, your hand up. Yeah. I'm I'm good at that as long as it's straight from the standard. Okay. And I can't wait to see what kind of a building has a 24 inch uh, hot water pipe, but hey. I'm, work <laughs> I'm working on one with your, uh, your old firm. Cool. Okay. Um, he's, all right. Well, we have a motion. We have a second for it um, to approve as, um, as proposed by Dwayne. So, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed to nay? OK, this passes. We are on to another vendor may want DDC controls. Is there anyone who is 
wa wants to um, present this one for Eric. Does anybody know if Eric is back next week from his vacation? I could present it. Okay, go ahead, Mike. Um, this basically reverts our control language from um, to the, what is required in 90.1. Um, the first line here was added and I'm kind of somewhat responsible for it being added um, as a result of an interpretation believe of the 2012 code. Um, and it does require, would require some, you know, single story buildings, uh, warehouses potentially to have to have DDC controls. Um, and I'm not sure what Eric's reasoning was for doing it, but I agreed that it would be a, a fine thing to eliminate. Um, it does seem a little heavy handed. Um, and then he's added a demand response set point adjustment uh, information. And I'm less clear on that, um, but generally uh, uh, feel like it's a good addition. Okay. Uh, getting ready for the future. Okay, we could, we could have a motion to approve it. We could have further discussion, we could table it until Eric is back. Um, what is your will tag? Lisa Macbord. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I just a quick question. So when I click on the link for this, it, it's different language. So this is a, a, a revised proposal, correct? Correct. Yeah, okay. So I don't think that this revised proposal, I don't see it on the website. I don't know if this was made available for the public to review. I mean, it's just a point of, Point of order. So it is to table. Yeah. It was back to the meeting, 16th meeting, and didn't get reposted. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, no worries, no worries. Uh, as long as it has been made available, it's good. I, I didn't see that it was posted back then. Was there a motion to table, Amy? That was a motion to the table. Okay, do we have a second for tabling? Second. Okay. We have lots of seconds for tabling. Further discussion? All in favor of tabling, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Okay, table. The next one is uh, Henry. Henry, you have the um, Yep, I apologize. I've not updated this since this came up uh, several weeks ago. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about actually clarifying uh, different types of interlocks with doors and double doors. Um, my intent here and um, well, my intent here was those big open garage doors that, you know, street restaurants will have that uh, when one of those opens, um, you have to shut off your heating and cooling system. There was other requests for different setbacks for different kinds of doors, but that did not make it into here. So um, same as it was proposed a few weeks ago. Okay, do we want to table this, Henry, or what do you want to do with it? Um, I mean, I don't want to keep adding more <laughs> tag meetings on. Um, if it's important, I could take another stab at it. Uh, there's a few people interested. Um, okay, show thumbs up or thumbs down. Do we think this is important enough to revise and um, send it back to Henry? I'm going to make a motion to disapprove. Okay, we have a motion on the table to disapprove. Is there a second for that motion? Uh, yes, this is Dwayne. With a second? Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a, 
A motion to disapprove. We have a second. Is there further discussion? I made the motion to disapprove because nobody's worked on it and it's just, it's not vetted to the code and it can come back in the next cycle. And we just keep chasing rainbows. We have to get done with this. Yeah. Probably not saving that much energy. My concern was just, um, well, it might save energy, but my concern is whether um, building with a lot of these interlocks, um, whether uh, those those door, door switches or window switches are dependable enough to not inadvertently shut off the HVAC system. Okay, Dwayne Long. Yeah, I, yeah, I just want to add that we do need to clarify this language. So I think that that is it's worth discussing, and I would like it limited to entrance doors, so that the overhead door internal that goes out to the dining area in the tap room is not required to have an interlock. But uh, some some may disagree with that. But um, entrance door is a defined term. The forty square feet comes from the IECC. Um, I don't disagree with that, but I do believe this language needs to be improved. Okay. So you could make a motion to table it, but we have a motion on the floor to disapprove. So Eric Fidel. Yeah, I agree with this. I, if it's all for operable windows, and if you have operable windows on an entire building, is each one of those have to be interlocked. Again, I, th I think that's cost prohibitive, but I, I agree that maybe we either table this or, or disapprove this at this moment in time. Um, I, I would like to, I'd like to withdraw my second in, in favor of this idea of tabling. So somebody else would have to second I'm gonna second it. Okay. Okay, so is there, a motion to table? is there a motion to table? Did I hear that or did I not hear that? Okay, I apparently did not hear that. There's the I, I moved the table. Okay, Amy moves the table. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion to table. We have a second. Is there further discussion? Okay, all in favor of tabling, say aye. 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 Well, any opposed, say nay. Nay, because we have a, don't we have a motion to disapprove at this time? It doesn't that. We do, but a motion to table takes precedence over okay. any motion to approve or disapprove. Okay. Um, so you voted nay, so that means we need a uh, vote. Oh, sorry about so, that. Um, I think you can change your vote because I haven't called. Yay, because we're okay. we're at least moving it down. But yeah, so so yep. yay okay. to table. <laughs> sorry, about okay. That shell. No worries. Um, okay, so we have no nays. Uh, and um, so this is tabled. So we've now tabled a few of them. Um, so let's, and Henry, um, we've got one more, hopefully only one more of these. So uh, if you have comments uh, for Henry, please send them. Mike Kennedy, you have the next one, BCV. Yeah, I don't believe we've talked about this one yet. Um, this is a fairly complex proposal for which I apologize. Um, it redoes the DCV section of the code. It basically replaces it. Um, the current language in the integrated draft requires all single zone systems uh, and as well as all spaces with 15 or more people per thousand square feet um, to have uh, economizer and that or DCV um, and then with a bunch of exceptions that basic trigger has been preserved in this language um, then uh, if we could stay scrolled up um, in item two and added there's an added trigger which is spaces with uh, high ventilation rates per person there are some spaces primarily uh, gym spaces that have uh, low densities, five or 10 people per thousand square feet, but have very high air flows per person. So that it's kind of the same quantity of outdoor air. 
Um, so that has been added to two. Um, the exceptions have been um, condensed. Well, the previous language had kind of two sections of, of, well, one was exceptions and one was system criteria. Um, and they have been condensed into one section of exceptions. Um, the big change is the exception one for energy recovery has been eliminated. Um, so you would have to do DCV. Um, there's some other criteria now, but in general, just having energy recovery does not get you out of DCV. Um, exceptions one and two are the same as the current exceptions four and five. Um, and the, where it gets new is exceptions three and four. Um, exception three has a, um, basically says, previously we had a room size limit um, and a system CFM limit. And exception three is kind of going after replacing the room size limit. And exception four is kind of the system size. Um, exception three says, if you have, if the outdoor air you're introducing to the space is more than 50 CFM um, or more than 100 CFM in systems with energy recovery, then you have to have DCV. Um, and those numbers were derived um, essentially from an ASHRAE 90.1 proposal that's uh, being, has been accepted um, and is being published uh, with adjustments made for the fact that our economics from our OFM calculator are quite a bit more aggressive than the ASHRAE ones. So these are below the ASHRAE levels. Um, and this is a, a different trigger now it's saying, hey, you've got to take the number of occupants in the space and multiply it by the, the airflow for the, the occupant, you know, CFM per occupant airflow. Um, and then exception four has been derived uh, previously, if you had an economizer or modulating damper or your system was over 3000 CFM, um, you had to do uh, DCV. Um, this has been, and that's been the 3000 CFM has been there forever. Um, this has been lowered uh, to 750 if you don't have energy recovery and 1500 if you do. Um, so that's the proposal. Um, uh, then there's an added section down below, uh, which actually says what DCV is. Uh, previously, we don't actually define what DCV is. So in this case, um, it, it actually says, hey, we're going to have gas sensors and they're going to adjust the air intake in response to changes in um, the outdoor air required by the spaces. Thanks, Mike. Um, Eric and Lisa, you have your hands up. Um, um, well, I, I forgot to take mine down, but actually I, I would like to say that uh, I think it's a well thought out proposal and I'd like to make a motion to approve. I agree and I'd like to second. We have a motion, we have a second. Um, I just wanted to say that there's a grammatical error. Um, oh, oh no, sorry. Where the equipment, okay, so it's equipment, so no grammatical error. Okay, we have a motion and we have a second. Uh, Duane Lowen. Yes, yes, okay, unmute. Um, hey, Mike, I just want to clarify the uh, exception three, that 50 CFM, 100 CFM. Is that the outside airflow, design occupant component airflow? Is that outside airflow? Yes, that was should the we... intent and probably it should say so. It should, yeah, we should set outside airflow in there. And just, just a heads up, you know, this will require a ventilation schedule for projects. So it's not unlike the 90.1 VIAQ uh, ventilation rate procedure calculation. Just, so just to make, you know, this is a substantial um, change for jurisdictions vetting and confirming this requirement. That's all I want to say. Right. I, I think it's a very substantial change in what's being required by code. I actually had envisioned it as someone uh, that was doing code support and code training would develop a table that would have essentially the room size limits for all the room types that trigger this. So yeah, that's be... essentially the, the ASHRAE VRP 
calcs with a, a limit with the table. So, well, right, yeah, the 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 IMC table that just requires the hey, here's the density and here's the CFM. Someone can just go down that and come up with the effective room size for each um, the fifty and the hundred. Would be very helpful. Yeah. Uh, my comment is just, uh, I guess, wordsmithing, but uh, with 60% sensible effectiveness, uh, just recommending that same minimum 60% so that if you have a 62%, then it doesn't have to be exactly 60, so minimum. Yeah. Good catch. Um, there is one thing that I missed in this, and that was over in the DCV section. Um, I think the intent here was that the, in DCV, we would eliminate the exception uh, for heat recovery when there is, in, I'm sorry, in DOAS, we would eliminate the exception for uh, heat recovery when there's DCV. So I, I, I feel like that's a change that should be added to this proposal. Um, Where exactly is that and what language? Uh, well, in the DOAS section of the code. Um, a different section. The, it's in a different section, yes. And um, I wasn't sure whether I could just make that change in the document. Um, I could make a change and send it and then we could revisit it in about two, five minutes. If it's, a, I guess, a correlation thing, then we have we can do that easily. If it's a, I don't know, substantive change, then we probably want to have it in front of us to vote on. So right. we could we could table this for for ten minutes or something like that if we wanted to. Um, will you generate the code language? Motion to table for. 10, well, let's give them fifteen minutes. What the heck? Okay. We have a motion to table on the floor. Is there a second? Second. A motion in a second. Um, all in favor of tabling this for 15 minutes, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Okay, you got 15 minutes, Mike. Okay. Um, Eric Vanderman is still on vacation. <laughs> um, parking garage ventilation controls is the next one. Um, does anybody feel like defending this one? And normally we would wait for the proponent to show up. Um, however, I'm concerned that we won't um, get to all the proposals if we keep that practice. So does anybody want to talk about this one? Defend it. I have my hand up. Okay, go ahead, Lisa. Um. Yeah, I, I would like to say that I, I would actually like to make a motion to approve this. Um, I would agree with Eric's assessment here that um, by removing the exception to the uh, system activation requirement and just you know simplifying it and saying it, it must be activated by gas sensors, uh, I think that that uh, is a good cleanup um, I think that it, the uh, exception is, is difficult to enforce. So I would be in support of this. I'll, I'll second uh, Lisa's motion to accept because this, this eliminates what's all currently a, a, an actual conflict in the construction codes. Great, okay. Further discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Um, Aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. Okay. All right. Um, Kitchen DCV. This is Nick, uh, Nick O'Neill proposal. Nick, yep, I'm, I'm here, Joe. Great. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Loud and clear. Great. <clears throat> okay. Thanks, Krista. So, um, this is a revision to the original proposal as well. The, the intent of this was to clean up the language surrounding DCV required on kitchen exhaust hood systems. And so this uh, was originally basically moving a lot of the exceptions up into the, the body of the charging code. Um, 
Krista, is this? Yes, okay, this is the most recent one. Um, and so what, what it tried to do was kind of similar to what Mike had done, the, the main DCV proposal was remove a lot of the um, requirements and, and then have exceptions that apply to some requirements, uh, confusion and make it a little bit clearer. And so I worked with Mike and Robbie on this one to try to streamline it. And basically what it does is require DCV on kitchen exhaust hood systems over 2000 CFM. Um, and it allows, you know, the same kind of exceptions that were there before for um, uh, heat recovery and smaller size hoods and, and certain types of hoods. But what it, what it does is it removes the exception for uh, transfer air to, to exempt you from doing DCV. So that's kind of the big, the big change between what was there before and what's there now is that we are no longer allowing 75% uh, transfer air to basically uh, exempt you from, from doing DCV. So I don't know if Robbie or Mike have any thoughts on this one based on what we discussed. It, it's been a little while, but uh, I think we came to a good agreement on this um, back when we were revising it. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. Lisa. Uh, yeah, again, I, I uh, appreciate the proponent's efforts on this. I, I think it really clarifies this section of the code. It, it is a diff it is a, a code section that is difficult to enforce. So I'd like to make a motion to approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve as, as written, Dwayne Llewellyn. Yes, since we just maybe have added a definition for DCV specific to CO2 ventilation control per Mike Kennedy, I suggest we add also add a definition for DCKV since that's a new term that's introduced in the code. That's a good point. Hey, we have a few thumbs up for that. We don't have language yeah. for that right? Or is it a very simple thing to come up with language for that? I think it's simple. It's just based on smoke, grease, heat, whatever off the off the cooking surface. But I just want to just, we use DCV ubiquitously between different systems, and this is a different type. And since we're adding a definition based on CO2 control, we should differentiate the two. Okay. So um, uh, mo motion to table then, until somebody can write a definition. How quickly can somebody get together a definition? I guess we have a motion to table on the floor, um, but I, I, I heard a question in Duane's motion as well. So um, Nick, I'll second the table. I'll, I'll second to table it and give the proponent opportunity to create a definition. Okay, from, from Duane who made the original motion, how long is this table for until next meeting or if, oh. as a proponent, sorry, as the proponent, can I just say that I'm I'm not in front of a computer right now, so I can try to type something out on the phone, but uh, I won't be able to submit it uh, officially unless I uh, can just speak again at the meeting uh, during this meeting or or until next meeting. Okay. Um, if you can tell us verbally, say just after our lunch break, what what it is, then we can type for you. Okay. I can I can do that, and if I'm not in cell service, I will email it around, um, and okay. hopefully somebody can bring it up if that's okay. So yes. I'm I'm proposing we we table till after lunch. Okay, and so let's vote on that. All in favor of tabling till after lunch, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Say nay. Okay tabled until after lunch. Um, we're gonna do garage ventilation, which is uh, Mike Kennedy proposal. Mike, you have the floor. All right. Um, this proposal basically um, is implementing language from uh, uh, I believe it's it's 90.1. I think it might be addendum D. It's a published addendum for the um, to 90.1 2019, um, and it basically um, change it. Basically, it requires that they have a, a VFD um, speed control um, and also um, removes the word enclosed. 
Um, and the argument there was that that was a, a confusing uh, term uh, since a lot of garages that have ventilation, it's, it's basically saying, hey, if your garage has a ventilation system, it has to do this. Even if say the sides of your garage aren't totally enclosed, if you've actually decided you need a ventilation system then it needs to comply with this. Um, so that's the basic proposal. Hey, are there comments, questions? So just to clarify, Mike, you're saying if you have, code elsewhere defines that you need a ventilation system. This is just talking about how that system is controlled. Uh, this, in some ways, yes. Okay. Um, it's not saying you have to have a garage ventilation system, although the IMC would generally say you do. Sure. The, the point being that if you have a garage that has a ventilation system, you want to control it because that word enclosed gets tricky. It does. And it's not the point of the energy code to define when you need ventilation. Uh, I move to accept the proposal as shown. Second. Okay. okay. Is there further discussion? Okay, the motion on the floor is to approve as written as shown in front of us. All in favor? Is there a aye. second? I didn't see the second. I believe Dwayne. 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 Okay, thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Okay, garage ventilation has been approved. The next one is uh, Eric Vandermeijen. I bet he's still on vacation. I bet he doesn't even know how much fun we're having. Uh, does anybody want to talk to refrigerant piping clarifications on behalf of Eric, officially or unofficially? Uh, is is that it? What we see in red on the screen, or is it everything underlined or what? Uh, yeah, this is Austin with rushing. Um, I think this was just to clarify uh, kind of some confusion with uh, this um, 10.4. Uh, if this was added, it would help clear up some of the confusion with the insulation needed for um, uh, factory installed um, HVAC equipment. So I think it's a relatively straightforward um, amendment. I think it's just really, I honestly can't remember if Eric said this was a, just clarifying what was a, a director's rule or uh, some kind of previous code interpretation, um, but this is just adding it back into the, to the language. This is Henry with Ecotope. This is a good clarification. Um, the piping insulation table would, imply you need, I think, like an inch and a half of insulation on field installed refrigerant piping, but the most common product is just pre-round coils, which would match this definition, so. Well, um, could, could I add, though, that, that um, this has been a, a brutal discussion uh, with, with Seattle to try to figure out what, and, and um, uh, it's extremely difficult to, Get a hold of one inch insulated refrigerant piping, and and there are. Um, uh, it was it was not completely clear whether whether the um, the suction line and and liquid line should be treated with the same broad brush, which this does here. Um, the it's. Might not be justified to have uh, one-inch insulation on the exterior part of the the liquid line. In fact, it probably isn't. So, um, and, and in fact, it, yeah, there's different temperatures in these things. So, I'm I'm actually I, I want something like this in here, but I'm really reluctant to go with this language since this was the first thing that Seattle proposed. And um, I'm, I'm still a little bit bloody from getting beat up on that argument. 
Sorry to hear about your war injuries, Wayne. Um, Lisa. Yeah, so this we, we've also heard uh, about this a lot through tech support and just some of the feedback that we've received from designers who uh, thought that they had to figure out a way to change the uh, level of insulation on this, you know, line sets. Uh, the feedback they were getting back from manufacturers is if they altered that um, insulation, that it could impact the equipment warranty. I don't know if that's still an issue. I'd like to hear from the group if they're hearing the same thing, but that that is just another detail to add to the pile. Thanks, Lisa. Does anybody want to respond? Uh, so I have heard of that, but it's usually when it's smaller than half inch. So I've never heard anything being required per manufacturers that it needs to be more than a half an inch of uh, insulation. Well, the, the problem is that that since this is HVAC system piping uh, and there are rules in, in C403 for the insulation on that, it's um, uh, the, if we're gonna have something different, it has to be clarified. And, and so, I think what we arrived at in, in, in Seattle would, would be um, one inch insulation on the, on the outdoor portion of the vapor line and then half inch insulation on, on, um, on the indoor portion of the vapor line and then half inch insulation on the liquid line where insulation is required by the manufacturer because there was some uh, split systems that actually don't want insulation on, or there are some kinds of systems anyway that don't want insulation on that liquid line. <laughs> so um, uh, I'd like to table this and see if we can get it fixed before next meeting. Is that a motion, Dwayne? That's a motion to table. We have a motion to table, which takes precedence over everything else. So is there a second for this motion to table? Second. We have a second on the motion to table. Um, all in favor of tabling this until the next session, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. I will let Eric Vandermey know that we've tabled this and tell him what my objections were. OK. And then I just wanted to bring up from the chat that Helen um, uh, would like the manufacturers to be engaged in this conversation as well. So Helen, do you have a way of contacting Eric Vandermey? Um, I'll put my email in the chat if that's helpful, maybe. Helen, you could contact me. This is Dwayne Chonlin. Okay, Dwayne. Yep, thank you. Thanks, Dwayne. And, and um, we're also, we don't have time for a full sort of um, uh, one of your processes because <laughs> It's, okay. it's got to be resolved next week at the very latest. Okay, great. Thanks, Dwayne. <laughs> okay, great. We tabled something for 15 minutes, and I think our timer is about up. So let's bring that one back. It might be in Krista's box now. Okay, we'll see how fast the internet is today. If the smoke is affecting the internet somehow. Krista, do you have, how oh, you do? It just popped in this very second. Wow. Cutting it close. Hmm? Ooh. Uh, oh, there we go. And, yep, here we are, zoom in. And is this what you were hoping to have on the screen, Mike? Yes. So this is the exception that, um, that basically it, within DOAS, there's, it requires DOAS to have energy recovery and there's an exception for DCV. And this is just eliminating that. And whether the DOAS needs to have DCV or not will be determined by the DCV section and the thresholds there. So the idea is that this is additional modifications appended to 190. Right. I'm sorry. I didn't have 
because we had made some edits on the screen. I didn't have the current language. And okay, how do people feel about this? Um, raise your hand if you have comments. Um, otherwise, we could make a motion on this thing. Or do you want a minute to read, Robbie? Sorry, I just have comments on the base proposal. If that's okay. Go for it. So the the one and the two there at the top, Mike. Uh, I don't know. The and at the end of one feels awkward to me. Hey, these are ors, aren't they? Like either one or two would require TCV. Um, let me read it. Yes, I think. I mean, it feels to me like you either use or, or maybe you just don't have a anything at the end of one. Like it's it's just a list. Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> um, could we scroll up just a little bit, Krista? Yep, not that much. There we go. So what am I deleting? Uh, well, we're just looking at the language of one or two and the and at the end of one. I, I, yeah, and I think we could delete the comma and. It, uh, sorry, this is Nick. Um, Mike, I think we that the intent of this was that we were going to require it on all single zone systems regardless. And then also the rest of this. I think that's why the end is there. The original mashup had single node systems in the charging language along with all the other requirements. And this was, I think, our solution to include both of them in the, in the requirements down here. Right. Well, I feel that it would could be misinterpreted that those are two that you have to meet because you're using the word and that you have to meet one and two for it to be required. I would agree. But I, I'm, th I'm guess I'm saying I think you do. You, if you have a single zone system, you have to provide DCV. And if you have a space with this occupancy threshold, you also have to provide DCV. Yeah, the word and there is confusing. Yeah, it's better without the and because uh, it could be interpreted easily that uh, oh, that they are only required where you have both. I got you. Okay, thank you. I, I, yeah, I had I had to read the intro to this proposal to understand that that was your intent. Because with the and there, it seems to me like they're both required. Understood. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think this does follow us through in the intent. I think this is a good change. Okay. Lisa. Perhaps an additional clarification in the uh, top sentence there. It could say demand controlled ventilation shall be provided uh, in the following conditions or for the following conditions. Or like in spaces that meet either the following criteria or something like that. Yeah, something like that. So that it's clear that it's it it's required in item one and in item two. Like in both both situations, the DCB is going to be required. Mm -hmm. Everybody have a proper code language for that intent. Um, spaces meeting either of the following. Yeah, that's even better. Provided um, for spaces meeting either of the following. Yeah, that that's better. Thanks, Wayne. Sounds good. Robbie. We're done with this section. Uh, could you scroll down, Krista, to the C four three dot seven one two. Mike, could you just explain what's the rationale between item two there? Um, I mean, the rationale is to keep people from just throwing a, a damper on the unit and reducing the flow. Like a, like a throttling damper? Yeah, which I heard at least one engineer say, well, that's this is simple. We'll just throw a damper on the system. Um, 
And I, I think it is a, I mean, to the extent that that's happening, this would be a, a pretty significant change potentially. Okay. I don't have any concerns with that. Okay, we have, suppose we have modifications. Chris, if you scroll up a bit, there's, there's just a little bit of language that needs this, uh, this thing right here. I think it was from uh, a narrative above. I think it needs to be elsewhere, but other than that, are there comments on this proposal, further comments on this proposal? Ex to the extent that we're deleting exception one, exceptions could be exception. And I'll clean that up later. Um, well, also, I, I find in a situation like this, it's important to say exception to C4037111 so that we don't think it's an exception to the to item, just item two. I think actually the intent was that this was just exceptions to item two. Okay, then let's clarify that. Exception to item two. Um, Mike McGivern. Yeah, back to the edit. Uh, for C40371, we've got spaces there listed four times in the first three, three sentences. Can we just eliminate spaces in the modified wordage there? So it would say DCV shall be provided. You no, know, uh, up above provided for either of the following. You could do that, or you could just take space, you know, in, in items one and two, take the word spaces with out of it, because you're already saying, I totally agree with you, Mike, you're already saying spaces up in the charging statement. So then it would be, you know, just start ventilation provided by single zone systems or, um, yeah. yeah, we've got spaces down in the exceptions too. So I, I kind of like the way it, it was initially set up if we just eliminated those two words in the charging statement, that would probably make it cleaner. Okay, I do think that's clear. Um, yeah, that's clear too. What comments, further comments do we have? Or otherwise it's probably, uh, we could someone can make a motion. I do have a standing motion on the floor. You do, okay. For approval. Oh, okay, is that, was that, okay. That yeah. was made right before it was tabled, so. Oh yes, of course. So we had a motion on the floor, so ideally that motion would be amended to include the new, the modifications in the meantime. I think I made the original motion. Yes. Yeah. So I'd like to make um, a motion to approve. Amend the motion, please. Yeah, I would like to, sorry. I would like to amend my motion um, to approve this proposal um, as we see on the screen. And Dwayne was the second on that, I believe. Uh, second. Okay, we have a motion on the table to approve um, as modified by the tag today. I mean, as seen on the screen, we have a second. Is there further discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay, good work everybody. That's That was great. I think that was a good idea to table 15 minutes and to come back to it. And that way we don't have to remember next week what we had talked about this week prior to the, the motion to table. So um, we now have radiant heating required for unheated spaces by Dwayne. Come on. Okay. So um, my uh, this is something that's, that we've had in Seattle code to clarify what's going on um, with spaces like um, a, a repair garage that's you know, doesn't heat the space because they have a big door open, but but they they can have uh, radiant heaters positioned over the people who are working. 
Um, another example is um, unheated warehouse with that desk where people check things in and out um, that you could have a radiant heater over that thing. Uh, and and uh, so I'm, I'm, I want to extend the heating outside the building to include also those low energy or unconditioned spaces. Um, and and uh, then on the last line there that's highlighted to, to clarify that it's, you, you have the same 20 minute limit on it that went, um, requires, uh, uh, requires a thing to shut off at a reasonable time. That's it. I move, to, I move to approve. We have a motion from, was that Kevin? Kevin, yes. Okay, we have a motion to approve. Uh, is there a second? Mike, did you, Mike McGivern, you have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion to approve. We have a second. Further comments? Um, Dwayne Wallen? Yes, I was just going to mention that I, I think you could delete unconditioned because at, by definition, unconditioned spaces are low energy. Don't we have two separate categories for those two? I don't believe so. Well, somebody's looking that up. Ben. Go ahead, Ben Rosh. Double muted, sorry. I, I think there's actually two BTH cutoffs for that that you're gonna find if you go really dig in in um, the definitions. I My comment is uh, what about, not that we've done many of these at this point because these thresholds are so low, but what about spaces where that heating is for freeze protection, not for people? That, that is irrelevant in, in our code. We do not have any separate category for freeze protection. And we don't have anything that says that our rules are for, for, for occupants. No, I, I know. But so I'm I, all the same. If I am heating a space primarily to prevent the fire, the sprinkler riser to, from freezing, you would still want it to be a radiant system here. And it can't shut off by 20 minutes. So if I, if I meet the requirement of a low energy space that 8 BTU per BTH per square foot, <clears throat> would that still, this one tells me to turn it off after 20 minutes, which I can't do if, if it's solely for the purpose of, the, of pipe freezing issues. Well, you wouldn't use a radiant heater for, for, for free, keeping your pipes from freezing. That's, that's like just point at a human while they're there to that's red. Right. I mean, I, I'm be... in agreement, but in this case, if we are heating in a low energy space, by the by the way we read this, they shall be radiant systems and such heating systems shall be you, you need an exception for freeze protection. That's what I'm really saying. I don't think so. I see what Ben is saying. Yeah, so the way this reads, it doesn't matter <laughs> that it's not intended to be an occupied space. <laughs> if it's for freeze protection, if no occupants are present under the letter of this, we're going to turn off that system after 20 minutes. Yeah, like in a sprinkler room. Like in oh, a sprinkler if, room. If your room is considered conditioned, then you would not have to meet this requirement, right? Correct. Yeah. And, and again, because this threshold is so low, it's, it's very rare we can even fit under it. So it's, it's mostly not an issue. But in the case that you do have a, a something that's not for people, that's there for equipment in some way for, for freeze protection, I think you got to cover it here or exempt it here. But wouldn't those spaces just, I mean, you could just classify them as conditioned, right? What's stopping you from doing that? Um, there are some things that you get to not do in an unconditioned or in a low energy space that you might want to take advantage of in something like a riser room. Well, the, the only thing you don't have to do is to insulate the opaque walls. Yeah. And it's very hard to um, have a low energy space that's, that's heated to 45 with uninsulated walls. 
It and may allow you to reduce the insulation might be the way to say that. I'm thinking of fire pump buildings and I'm thinking of fire riser rooms and electrical riser rooms. You yeah. know, th those sort of non-occupied, but often in some way freeze protected spaces. Well then, <laughs> then, tough luck, Ben, you have to put some insulation on there. <laughs> You know, okay. I, That's fair. Low, low energy building doesn't say, I mean, I guess it does say separated from the remainder of the building by a thermal building envelope. So, okay. And I think that's fine if that's, if that's your intent. Okay. Thank you. Um, thanks, Ben. Uh, Lisa? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I, I appreciate Ben's comments. However, this this provision has always been pretty clearly applied to you know those radiant heaters and the outdoor restaurant seating areas and places like that. And so um, I'm not aware of this provision being used for freeze protection. We have freeze protection criteria in the energy code already. And so I'm a little confused by the, the comments. And I'll also say too, that if we want to, uh, maybe to make the language uh, uh, kind of align with the way it's stated in other places, we could say uh, low energy spaces um, in accordance with section C402, you know, so that may, instead of saying regulated by, um, perhaps that's better wording, um, but, uh, and maybe we need to add some language in here that makes it clear that, you know, we're really only talking about where you have people, you know, this is not an, an exception or this is not a, a, a provision that is intended to provide um, heating for anything other than occupants. Well, it's so, clear there, Lisa, I, that, I look at the bottom. Is. It says yeah. when no occupants are present. Yeah, so I think it is too. So that, I guess that's my point is I, I was confused by the comments. I, I've always thought that this was pretty clear and that that's what this applies to. I think it was because it used to be limited to heating outside a building, but now it's going to be extended to low energy spaces. Well, I would agree that it that unconditioned space is a little confusing. I agree with you, Mike, that unconditioned space is under the purview of low energy spaces under section C402111. So uh, I would advise to, to remove unconditioned space. That, that is a friendly amendment. Um, okay. So, okay. so we just, so it would just read, uh, Krista, heating outside a building or in low energy spaces. And, and with the would the correct terminology be in accordance with or is regulated the right term? That's fine. Well, okay, in accordance with, yeah, that's good. Okay. <clears throat> Lisa, does that, is that your end of your comment? Uh, yes, it is. Thank you. Okay, Teresa. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Uh, my question goes to the idea that we were just talking about, but the way I'm familiar with this is outside of a building on top of an apartment building where they have these radiant heaters. And my question is, it looks like this will require, if you choose to do a timer switch instead of an occupancy sensor, that timer switch must be no more than 20 minutes. Uh, usually people put twist timers of like an hour or two hours on those things. So I just am trying to clarify that the intent for a timer switch is that we have to find one on the market that won't go more than 20 minutes. Uh, that, that's my intent. Um, the, that that having, having something you can set uh, for an hour that would, would, would run whether you're still there or not is and is kind of goofy. I think I think uh, I'd, I'd like to direct people towards ox sensors because then it doesn't matter how long you're there; the heater will keep running as long as you're sitting there. Okay. Okay. 
Thanks. I'm not, I'm not sure that'll be easy to install, but I understand the intent. Um, oh. I have the Robbie. same concern that Teresa does. Uh, I, I think that oh. I think it's probably not great to, to require something that's, that's not available on the market, the, the 20 minute thing. It's also a little, uh, I mean, it could be implied here that you basically have to have an occupancy sensor given that it says uh, it's, the timing is contingent upon people leaving. Um, so I, I would suggest that Dwayne, you either strike the, you know, eliminate the ability to use a timer switch or um, not have this requirement uh, influence I, I, there the timer are, switch. There are plenty of 15 minute timer switches. That's a normal product. For a, for a light, maybe. I don't know. Is that a, a different time? I'm, I'm I mean, seeing we're, we're dealing with high voltage. I, I don't think that we need to eliminate the possibility of using a timer switch. I just, um, um, but you can, if, if everybody feels strongly about this, you, you can. You just want to get it as a relative long term strength. Um, I'm just, I'm on Intermatic website. There's 120 to 280 volt, 15 minute line voltage crank timer. So they're available. Yeah, I've I've spec'd and installed them before in Seattle. Okay. Um, I, I think that when we were cleaning up the language, the the word unheated can go away because the low energy space is is you know can have a little bit of heat. It is strike through. Okay, I just couldn't read that strike through then. Real, real subtle strike through. You ain't well, 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 well. Yeah, I just wanted from a commissioning standpoint, I think we do need to state the, the 20 minutes as to a available product. So I, I, I would say 15 minute, 30 minute, one hour. But um, if they've got a 30 minute timer and you're trying to commission the 20 minutes, it doesn't comply. Well, then I, I I'd suggest I, I'd accept 15 minutes as a as a friendly amendment instead of 20. I feel like we're we're chasing energy savings here that, that aren't worth very much. And you're making the timer switch not really function as intended. Because what you're what you're suggesting here is a timer switch that can only go to 15 minutes. Well, that mm -hmm. means that every 15 minutes I have to get up and go turn it back on, right? Or more intelligently, you just do an aux sensor like is a commonly used control and device for for outdoor uh use of these devices and and uh i mean i wouldn't say that's common every time i go to a restaurant it's it seems to be on a timer but i i think that 15 minutes on a timer switch makes it unusable at that point you may as well strike it but realize that you're only really capturing the difference between whatever the maximum setting of a currently available product is and 15 minutes right versus you know that it's not going to be on all night right so would everybody be happy if it was 30 minutes? That's still not very useful for like a restaurant setting. Uh, this is inside, this is inside a building. It's not used very often, but but it's something that has come through our our permitting process on a number of times that people want to have some kind of a, uh, an option for radiant heating in these spaces. So I don't want to. You're, you're influencing outside a building, right? You've latched onto an outside a building section. Yeah, and 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 we also do have a, a 20 minute rule in Seattle instead of one hour. Dwayne Wallen. I, I I don't have anything to add. I just want to clarify from a commissioning standpoint, wherever we end up, that there's equipment that's provided that will. 30 minutes, 15 minutes, or an hour. Okay, I'll accept 30 minutes as, an, as a friendly amendment. We can move this along. Okay, Henry, do you have any further comment? Yeah, I would just uh, support Dwayne on lowering that limit from whatever it is to at least specifying in 30 minutes is great. I'm doing a C407 model for a high rise in downtown Seattle and they have outdoor heaters and without any explicit time limit and it raises the EUI of a high rise by over a half. So this is a very real energy savings measure. 
Thanks, Henry. Uh, Lisa. Uh, yeah, I was actually going to. Uh, oh, I concur with Henry's comments, um, and and I understand uh, that by adding that additional sentence at the end there, we're now capturing not just the low energy spaces. Which, yes, you know, th that's a circumstance where you've got a worker and they've walked away from the heated area, and you definitely want these this equipment to turn off when they're not there. Uh, it does impact the heating outside of a building um, element of this, but I uh, would also concur that um, it is important that those controls uh, turn that system off when there's nobody present and those occupancy sensor controls don't always function. So having a timer as, as the secondary, uh, I think is beneficial. Okay, thanks Lisa. Kevin? Uh, so circling back to Ben's concern about a fire riser room or a fire pump building, I, I'm reading this to say that those would have to become semi-heated spaces or buildings at this point, because all low energy spaces must use radiant. No, I, I'm only saying, I mean, a low energy space is already limited to how much energy can be used for heating in the space. Uh, yes. Uh, and, and so, I'm, I'm saying that, that in, in addition to this, if you want to have some uh, radiant heating, you have, to, you have to have some additional heating, it's gotta be radiant. Okay, and the way I'm reading this sentence says, low energy spaces, if you, have, if you have heat in a low energy space, it shall be radiant. If I have a 100 square foot, fire closet, I'm probably going to put a cadet heater in there, not a radiant heater, just for economics. Um, but I, the way I'm reading this is I would no longer be able to use that cl classification yeah. as a low energy building and I've used a semi-heated and therefore insulated. You know what, you're, you're breaking through into my little brain. Yes. <laughs> um, Sorry. Motion to table. So we have a motion to table, is there a second? I'll second it. So, we have a motion to table and a second. No discussion. All in favor of tabling, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. We have tabled this. Um, all right. Is there anybody who needs to provide input to Dwayne to, I guess, Dwayne, you'll reach out to other people to make sure this is done well, and if anybody wants to talk to Dwayne about this, just email him, um, and Chris is gonna help you contact him if you don't have his email address. It will be a thing of beauty. It will be a thing of beauty for 30 minutes at a time. Um, <laughs> so, so Sean, you are up. You have a half of an hour maximum because you have to go and uh, celebrate a birthday. <laughs> John Dennison, are you, are you in the house? I am here, yeah. and thank you very much for your flexibility. Especially this, this tag meeting fell on my wife's birthday, and the last one fell on our anniversary, so we're not doing real well. <laughs> but thank you for your flexibility with this. Thank so you. This, um, so this proposal was tabled before. The tag expressed some desire to see more integration of the the base California Title 24 language that this is based on, especially in how this would work in multi-zone um, applications and some greater clarity about what a demand response signal might be. So we've gone back and we pulled some of that language to do that. So we now have clarity about how this applies when you have central control of a multi-zone system. Um, we've also just changed the terminology a little bit since, you know, thermostat is really used more on the residential side. The commercial terminology tends to say thermostatic controls as just a minor editorial thing. And uh, a few other just little clean up things that you can see in the modifications. In general, the main intent of the proposal stays the same. Uh, this just provides a little bit more clarity uh, in application. Okay, you, you, you see it, you reviewed it before. How, 
other comments on this? Motion to accept. We have a motion, we have a second. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. All right, Sean, one for one. You got two Eight. more. Right. Well, that's definitely not my proposal. I don't, I don't want to engage in that one. <laughs> All right. So this one is for the demand response of water heating. We've had a, an opportunity to have some discussions with representatives from AHRI and through them a little bit more contact with the manufacturers. I uh, wanted, wanted to say one of the reasons that we proposed using this CTA 2045B is uh, through the Advanced Water Heating Initiative, which is something else NBI is involved with that does have many of the emerging technology representatives from uh, the industry. Uh, one of the obstacles to getting B actually into products is a concern about uh, market demand. So that is one of the purposes for putting this in the code is to ensure market demand. But we are hearing from the manufacturers that probably by the time this code goes into effect, we may not have the kind of equipment availability that we would like to see. So we have revised it from the B version of the protocol to the A version of the protocol, which is in products on the shelf right now. Um, this does have some overlap with the commerce rule that's in legislation, but that rule only goes down to 40 gallon water heaters. And so it misses 30 gallon water heaters, which are a very, very common water heater, especially in small commercial buildings where they're just serving, say, a couple of lavatories and a, a kitchenette. Um, this is also a size that you would see in uh, multifamily buildings when they do use individual water heaters, which, you know, that is on, that's only a subset of multifamily. So we think it's an important size to get this kind of functionality into. This doesn't conflict with the commerce rule. It really just overlays and expands it to an additional um, size range. Uh, we did have just this morning, so after I, I submitted, we, we met with AHRI yesterday and got our revision in, and then we also had a, a short conversation this morning that there are some 20 gallon pony type water heaters on the market. We didn't see them in our initial survey because evidently they're very uncommon, but they do exist. So we would be open to moving that 20 gallons to 25 to ensure that we still capture that 30 gallon size but that we don't get those um, those pony water heaters. We just don't think that that's, that's a worth the investment in the technology. The last thing that I want to say is that uh, right now, when we look at the market, um, you know, the this demand responsive technology had previously been in some resistance electric water heaters, but when we look at availability now, it's almost all in heat pump water heaters. So you. If the concern is about 30 gallon water heaters being able to meet this requirement, well, to meet first hour needs in general, those 30 gallon electric resistance water heaters would probably, in almost all cases, need to go to a 40 gallon anyway. And we definitely have those 40 gallon heat pump water heaters with this technology available now. Okay. And I think that covers everything. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Um, Eric. Hey, Sean, thank, thank you very much for presenting. And, and my question is mainly, you've already answered a little bit of it. Um, I'm gonna, A, gonna ask for an amendment, I think, for this one, but uh, I wanted to get your response first. You mentioned that it's 40 gallons and above is where the predominantly that cutoff is, where the, the manufacturers basically have this ability to provide this the demand responsive, the controls. But 30, it's sorta maybe not as much. Uh, is that a true assumption or a true statement? Um, so that's what we've heard from the manufacturers is that they are still working on implementing this at the 30 gallon level. Yeah. Um, however, you know, like I said, when, when you look at, if, if you have a 30 gallon water heater and it's electric resistance, then you're probably gonna have to go to a 40 gallon heat pump water heater anyway. So I don't think that that's a concern for this 
I mean, it's, it's, it's a reality, but I don't think it's a concern for this proposal because you're not going to, you know, you're not talking about a water heater that you could have done with say a, a 20 gallon or a 10 gallon. I mean, would you be open to uh, amending this proposal to equal to or larger 40 gallons? Uh, or do you feel, I mean, this is, just, I'm, I'm just worried about if we did put 30 gallons and we put that in the code that it, it would be tough for people to find that 30 gallon without either spending a lot more money um, or then again, just go into a 40 gallon. <laughs> to, no. to, I, I, I don't know. And, and I understand not... that with, with the revision of going from B to A, um, if we don't capture the 30 gallon water heaters, then this code proposal really doesn't do anything. Okay. Um, because I'm, it would be covered I'm by the code back code. off then. And, and you said that in the next couple of years anyway, by the time that it, most likely this code gets adopted, which is in July of 2023, that the, the technology will, will be there for the majority of 30 gallons and above. Is that well, a, another they, they are they are They are still implementing it on those smaller ones. Um, but since the 40 gallons are available right now and the 40 gallons fit the same niche that a 30 gallon electric water heater, electric resistance water heater fills, I, I don't think that there's a concern there. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mark Frankel is next. Yeah, I have some questions for you, Sean. On the B versus A, I'm considering that this standard's not gonna be implemented for maybe two or three years. Isn't the B gonna be the market standard by then? I mean, it seems like the A is response to what's available now and B is what's coming is one question. And two is how does this align with both the law on you know, larger equipment that we're, that I think is moving towards B and uh, the advanced water heating SPAC that NIA published that we refer to in other code sections mm -hmm. or, or try to. Uh, is there a disconnect there? Because I think B is is the one that's a more, a more robust B is B is certainly more robust. That is certainly what we would like to see. Um, however, we have, based on, you know, what we're hearing from manufacturers right now, we are concerned that there would be equipment availability for B by the time this code goes into effect. There, there may be, but there may not be. And so we, uh, you know, in a, a very, in, in, a, in a fit of hyper practicality, uh, where we, we don't want to see a requirement for B go into effect, there not to be equipment available, and then regulators get soured on B, and, and that becomes a roadblock to B being adopted. So, um, it, but you're talking about the small stuff, right? Because it's available in the big stuff. So right. I'm this wondering is, if this should this be is focused. specifically smaller. Well, it is, it starts smaller, but it doesn't end, right? So I'm wondering if it says larger than 25 or whatever it says, and you, you know, you could interpret that, that a, a 50 gallon or a hundred gallon tank just has to use A by this language, even though other language encourages B. So should we put a top range on this for A and everything above that have B. That's, that's I guess, the gist of my question. And the I, other okay. is, um, this language sort of implies, I, I can't quite tell, but the CTA 2045 is a port. It's not a controller, it's a port, right? So you can plug a device into CTA 2045 that has the demand response capability, but the port itself, well, the B does, but the A is just a plug. So, you know, are we requiring two things here? Are we requiring the 2045 port and the controller? So the the controller, and, and this does get a little bit confusing, um, but the controller is actually in the water heater, even with A. The plug-in is the communications module. So that plug-in provides that bridge between the water heater and whatever is providing. So whether that's an ethernet connection, a wireless connection, we would love to see cellular connections, but we've not seen many of those so far. So that, that module is not the controller, it's a communications module. Okay, so you're requiring the controller and on top of the module that's built into the tank. Mm -hmm. So if you look at say the water heater that I just had installed in my house, which is a ream model, it says it complies with CTA 2045A. It does not have the communication module. And then to your first question, um, this applies to electric storage water heaters. So it, it's not water heating systems with storage tanks, it's electric storage water heaters, which if you look at the efficiency tables, that is an integrated, you know, that's a water heater 
heating an, an integrated storage tank water heater. So it doesn't apply to those larger systems that are commonly used that have a storage tank that is separate from the actual water heating equipment. Okay, I'm still a little concerned that we're we're sort of mixing up for the larger equipment that's required to have the the higher degree of control, but maybe it's not an issue. I mean, I, I support the idea of going down to the 25 or, or whatever the threshold is, that's great, but I'm worried that this introduces language that might be interpreted for the larger stuff as an easier pathway. Sean, would it be worthwhile to then specify that everything over a certain other uh, minimum size complies with B, or is that, um, that's what I hear Mark suggesting. Um, I, I think it would probably make more sense to put just a cap on this of the storage tank size if we're concerned. And then the B requirement can be handled wherever the B requirement belongs. Um, we haven't thought about how to apply B to larger systems. And so I'd be afraid to say apply B to larger systems if we haven't thought through all the details. Um, okay. If I remember right, 120 gallons is the upper range of this type of water heater, and we would be fine putting that in, in place for this. Okay, Mark, is that- Sorry, right, let me make one more comment. What if we said A or B so that we don't force people into A when they're maybe putting in B for the bigger stuff? I mean, is there a reason to have the language say A or above or something like that? Um, if you comply with B, you comply with A. Uh, a, okay. the, the functionality within A is a subset of the functionality in B. Okay, that's fine. Um, I'm, I'm, suppose I'm, you could just take off the moniker entirely and just say 2045 and let them apply any of any versions, which right now is just A and B. I wonder if that might make sense, actually. And if that provides clarity, I, that, I don't think that has any impact on our intent. So I think we would be fine with that. 120 gallons is the upper range that's uh, used for storage uh, storage water heaters in the efficiency tables. Okay, um, let's move to Mike Kennedy. Yeah, I wanted, I guess this is a, a kind of related uh, um, alterations. Um, is this, I don't see it here, so I'm thinking it's okay, but um, does this language just requires the capability of the tank to have the demand response? It doesn't actually have to have, the building doesn't have to have a demand response system in place. Is that correct? And if That's it's, correct. It this like is, it. you just have to have the control in place for the water heater, however that is provided. Maybe there's a system-wide approach that works with water heaters that would be allowed if such a thing exists. Um, I don't know that it does, but generally what this is, is, you know, it's, it's some control logic that's integrated into the water heater itself. So it doesn't actually have to communicate with anything. The water heater just has to be capable of communicating if that communication was set up. Right. So if you look at the definition of control, it's a control capable of Hmm. Okay. Okay, let's go to Helen. Hi, I'm Helen Walsh, Chair, and the VP of Regulatory Affairs at AHRI. I just wanted to maybe clear up some things. Um, uh, the, uh, the Department of Commerce regulation for com uh, compatibility compliance with 2045A is new, um, and uh, equipment manufacturers are working to comply with that, that requirement. Um, they have not started working on uh, compliance, uh, many of them have not started working on with, uh, compliance for smaller models, and uh, most of the ones that we surveyed uh, feel like they will not be ready in a year and a half, largely because of challenges that they're facing due to the pandemic. Um, that would be a very tight time frame, uh, you know, from uh, December of this year to July of 2023, uh, under normal circumstances, uh, but with the issues around supply of especially electronics, uh, and uh, the challenges that they're facing, uh, largely their development uh, folks are focused on uh, 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 qualifying equipment and components uh, to replace components that they would normally use. Uh, but because of the supply chain disruptions, uh, they're having to uh, do some different things. Um, 
In addition, uh, their access to the testing laboratories, so the nationally recognized testing laboratories such as UL or Intertech or what have you, um, uh, they are backed up uh, because of um, uh, various shutdowns uh, around the country. Uh, so they, uh, and also a heavy load of regulations that are um, uh, pending at this time. So uh, from our perspective, um, there's a lack of readiness for this. Um, uh, we would be very happy to talk with um, uh, the proponents, to continue conversation with the proponents of this, uh, to find a way forward um, that can be implemented in a from a practical perspective. But at this time, uh, equipment manufacturers don't see a way forward um, uh, for this, the equipment uh, with a gal with a, uh, that stores more than less than 40 gallons. Okay, thanks, Ellen. Um, I'll just note that the, a few other provisions in the code have dates on them where the date is out further than the um, than the implementation of the code in general. And that, I guess, if if we're if there's a time crunch, that's perhaps an option. Uh, let's go to Lisa. Sorry, I'm taking my hand down on that. <clears throat> the uh, AHRI addressed the. Uh, question I had. Okay, great. Um, Kevin. I move that we amend this proposal by striking A and B from the certification and add a time of implementation or, or when this becomes effective per the AHRI comments. And what would that time frame be, Devin? I would look to Helen for recommendations on that. Um, I, I'll need to go back to the manufacturers for that. I apologize for not having that at my fingertips, but I'll need to go back to the manufacturers uh, to see what they think. I've heard, I've heard uh, some say as um, normal time frames for development can be three to five years. Uh, so I, I just need to go back and have a conversation with them, which I'd be happy to do. So a motion within within. X unit for that we don't know the answer to. So I guess um, then I amend my motion to table this until we have more information. Second that. Okay, we have a motion to table and a second. Um, let we need to vote on it uh, without further discussion. So um, all in favor of tabling, say aye. 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 Any opposed to tabling, say nay. Okay, hopefully we can review this next week with, um, with the, the suggestions and especially a time frame um, for implementation. Okay. Um, um, I just wanted to, to direct Helen to my question in the chat if you could come back with some information on that. Yes, uh, sure. So Amy asked, do any manufacturers have 30 gallon equipment? So certainly there is 30 gallon equipment in, in, um, in existence, Amy, I, I guess that's your question, but um, uh, as for the 2045A, is yeah. that? Is... That's my question, yeah. So, yeah. Um... Uh, Helen, this is uh, Joe Burrows with Reem, if I could uh, help answer that question. Please, Joe. So, so we don't currently offer a 30 gallon water heater with, uh, the, with the 245A or B control capability. Um, and we're not planning to in the short term uh, either. And I, I would just add that I would support the comments uh, that, that Helen made as well. I, I would, uh, if, if you would permit me, I would like to ask just one quick question. And that is, this proposal talks about electric storage water heater. And it would be interesting or be helpful for us to define what that is. We, we know that the state uh, regulation with respect to uh, demand response defines electric storage water heaters as uh, being residential under 12 kilowatt input rate would be helpful to define what we mean by electric storage water heater in terms of input rate and definition for the, the water heater. Thanks, Joe. I think, Sean, um, when you look at this again, can you, add, can you respond to Joe's comment? Not now, but um, when you uh, submit a revised proposal? Yes. Awesome. Yeah, and, and for Helen, um, not to answer now, but for if, you know, AO Smith or um, others make equipment at this point or have it on their, their time scale, it would be interesting. And 
Mark had a similar question in the chat. So thanks. Um, sure, we'll, we'll come back. Yep. Thank you. Okay. There's three people still with their hand up. Um, do you, if if please lower it unless you have something you want to say right now. Um, we are about to consider a different proposal. This one's been tabled, so there's no further discussion on it. Um, so, um, Kevin. Sorry. Okay, Mike Kennedy. Okay, hands are down. Last, Sean, uh, the indoor horticulture dehumidification. Um, you have the floor, Sean. All right, so the, the tab when we first heard this uh, expressed a desire to see a heat pump option for uh, as, as one of the, de the dehumidification options, uh, we were able to meet with a subgroup. And as we looked at the language closely, we decided that options two and three allowed for a heat pump. Um, so we made just a slight, well, I, just, I made, I'll take full responsibility for it, a slight adjustment to the language to highlight that a heat pump does meet this requirement without actually requiring a heat pump. So that's where you see this, including but not limited to heat pump technology. So this will make it clear to users that options two and three, you can use a heat pump to meet this requirement um, without actually changing any of the substance of this proposal. I think we can stop at that. Thanks. Are there comments, questions, anybody else on the working group or whatever that uh, <laughs> wants to add? Mike Beller. Uh, question, Sean, uh, in the proposal in the, um, purpose section, it references Denver and their standard is a 1.9 minimum energy factor. And so I'm curious why your proposal has a 1.77. I mean, would one, why not 1.9? So yeah, we highlighted that it's similar to what was used in Denver, um, but this, this version and these specific thresholds were worked out through the California process with fairly substantial uh, participation of the industry. So we're, we're more confident in the process that came to these numbers than the process that went to, into Denver's numbers, which were based on an engagement process with a smaller number of, um, you know, just the local industry representatives. I mean, some, some national, but it was mostly local concerns. So we just, we feel more confident in the numbers that came out of the California process. And I would say, I would imagine there are more growers in California than Colorado. Yes, there are more more growers in California, and the California process. Um, let Let's say the the national and outside of California growers were more motivated to be involved in the California process because what is happening right now they knew would happen. What What was done in California would end up in other places. Good to know. Okay. Um, are there further comments on this proposal? Anyone want to make a motion? Motion to approve. So motion to approve. Second. Second. Okay, Lisa has a second. Um, further discussion. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. All right, this passes and Sean, you are off to your birthday. Great, thank you very much, everyone. Good luck with the rest of the day. Thanks. Happy birthday. All right. Okay, that brings us to, um, we are done with item group four. That brings us to uh, item group seven, because we're gonna consider six after five, because six is the, um, five is, is where we, consider the base C46 proposal. So without further ado, let's go to uh, 179, which is starting to get into chapter five, which is um, gonna consume probably the rest of the day if we get through the, the key item discussion. So Dwayne, you are up. Okay. Um, we've, we've in Seattle heard a lot of pressure to, to um, simply, not allow uh, 
gas appliances in, in apartments. And um, <clears throat> I'm a little too chicken to go uh, that direction, but uh, we wanted to make sure that that everything is literally plug and play uh, for a future conversion from gas appliance to uh, a, an equivalent electric one. So, so if you've got a, a gas fired hot water heater or or um, range in your in your um, uh, or clothes dryer in your apartment, uh, it's got to have a a conveniently located receptacle meeting those uh, criteria in one, two, and three, um, fully circuited and, and ready to, to uh, accept uh, an electric appliance in the future. Thanks, Dwayne. Uh, Kevin. Uh, a question and a comment. I, I, in the item number one, it mentions the Seattle Electrical Code. Is that intended to cover the whole state, or is there something in okay. there that? Oh, um, thank you. Seattle, Seattle should be Washington State. And then a uh, couple comments. Um, I guess I, I I don't agree with the fundamental principle behind this, which is that electrification is the only path to decarbonization. And since, as far as I can see, all energy systems are on a path to decarbonization, uh, this I, I don't see the purpose for this except to eliminate gas. And what this will do is add cost to systems with gas appliances and probably, in effect, make them cost prohibitive and, uh, and thereby <laughs> essentially mandate through economics electrical appliances. Um, so there's that. The other piece is I don't see how this saves any energy. And I don't know that it belongs in the energy code as such, perhaps in the electrical code. Um, I think that's, yeah, that's all my comments. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Mark, frankly, you're up. Thanks. Oops. I just uh, wanted to respond to the all the comment that all energy sources are headed towards decarbonization. There's actually an article in the New York Times today that says that supposed blue hydrogen is actually more carbon intensive than, than black hydrogen and nowhere near the path to green hydrogen. So I don't know if that's what's being referred to, but gas is not on a path to decarbonization. So electricity is the option we have for decarbonization, not, not all fuels, that's all. Motion to approve. We have a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? Mike McGivern. Yeah, I think the reference to the Washington State Electrical Code should be the National Electrical Code as adopted by Washington State. Krista, is there an official name for what the Electrical Code in Washington? Uh... I'm not sure. It would be adopted, not amended. Thank you. Okay. I'm fine with that change. Let me see it's adopted by Washington. Okay. Um, Kevin, you got your hand up first, so I'll call on you. Yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, the cap and trade law that's been passed in Washington does support the decarbonization of all energy systems, gas or electric. And there are similar 
legal structures in Oregon, namely the Executive Order 2004, that uh, do the same. And so I, I dispute the comment referring to the New York Times article that there is uh, no effort being done to decarbonize all energy systems. Okay, um, Michael Curry. Yeah, I just the expression receptacle, an electric receptacle. I look. I looked up the definition for that. It's it's basically what you think of as a receptacle where you plug an appliance in, and of course that works for a gas dryer, electric dryer, range cooktop, whatever. It does not work for a water heater. Water heaters don't get plugged in. Um, I don't know if the verbiage needs to be changed for the water heater to a, not a receptacle, but a future rough-in or something of that. But uh, re receptacles don't work for water heaters. Okay, um, Amy. Um, yeah, I support this proposal. I think it, um, you know, it, 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 it's a good uh, starter step for, for these appliances um, and save some potentially costly retrofit money down the line. So I think it makes sense. So I, I, I just want to like respond to um, the concern about, about water heaters. You now you bring it up, I can't remember seeing one with a with a, a cord attached to it that you can plug into the wall. So um, where and actually in that item number three, I use somehow used the word outlet. But if we strike outlet and and put in a re receptacle or or um, or junction box. Would that do it? Dwayne, I, I, that's the word I don't like is receptacle when it comes to water heater. Well, I, I do like junction box. A, a receptacle by definition in electrical terms, what I could find is where you could readily plug in an appliance. Um, I do like junction box. Um, okay, uh, I'll buy that. I just, um, Yeah, I think electrician, electrician could just take the receptacle off and you're at the same point, but the junction box works fine. Yeah, but Dwayne, when you say junction box, it, it achieves the same thing. The power is there, the circuitry is there. Um, it's all there, ready to, ready to go for a replacement. Okay. <clears throat> if we lay that word better, I just want to point out that the word receptacle is used maybe eight times in this um, in this section, so maybe we should review and just make sure that it's it's consistent. Well, I was I was concerned about that, but um, uh, then then I do say meets the requirements of, of items one to three, um, and does it uh, does it need to say receptacle or junction? But uh, um, the, this is Lisa, could you add a junction box in the charging language? You know, up at the top, it says an electrical receptacle or junction box and circuit and just put it at the top. Would that kind of clean it up? Sounds good to me. That and way it would not be, it wouldn't be needed down in item number three or I'm not sure how you would Maybe it is, oh, but just, that would be fine. I, I'm was worried about this this particular thing because <clears throat> it seems like that that could also say junction box. Yeah, sure. And Lisa, you are up next for your hand raise, so you lowered it. Maybe that addressed your concern. 
Um, actually, well, I'll just, I'll say, if you could also say um, electrical, uh, electric connection or something like that, if you don't want to repeat receptacle or junction box multiple times, but yeah, that, that's better having that in the charging statement. That was my point. Okay. Um, next is uh, Mike um, McGivern. Yeah, regarding all this receptacle junction box, the definition of outlet in the National Electrical Code is a point on the wiring system at which current is taken to supply utilization equipment. So in the charging statement, uh, an electrical receptacle or outlet and circuit would be appropriate. And then below the receptacle or outlet for each gas appliance shall be. And then um, I like the idea of a receptacle at the ranger cooktop and at the dryer. And with the gas water heater, uh, an outlet would be appropriate. I, I'm not sure that's, I'm not sure that's uh, conforms with, with the normal use of, of the words receptacle and outlet. And somebody once explained this to me, I think, is it, is it um, that if you got a duplex receptacle that has two outlets, that how it works, but I don't think a junction box is, is an outlet. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm so saying I don't, outlet is, we're trying is to, the proper term, not junction box. No, I, I think the, that, that outlet is not because that would imply something you could plug into. It's a point of utilization. Per the definition. Well, I'm, I'm maybe maybe that is technically true, but it would be very confusing to people because most people don't know the difference between an outlet and a receptacle. Uh, I would guess, including a lot of electrical inspectors. What if it simply said junction box, and you could put the receptacle in later? No, we want to. We want this to be. Uh, a receptacle in the wall by the range so you can plug in your your new electric equipment, literally plug it in and not hire an electrician. Okay, Mike McGivern, you asked your question. Uh, Michael Cartwright, you raise your hand as well, so go for it. Yeah, so I have to understand Dwayne's intent. Um, but like when you install an electric water heater, you will employ an electrician uh, to make the to, to make the final connection. You'll have a plumber and electrician working on that. So, just to Dwayne's comment, yeah, those appliances are plugged in. They got plugs, receptacles, outlets, whatever you want to call it. That it's ready to plug and play the new appliance. You will have an electrician there with the water heater. It, it, right. If that's one of the one of the appliances in the apartment, then you need that. Okay, uh, Dwayne Wellen. Yeah, I just I just wanted to clarify. I think on number three, we could simplify this by saying rather than saying junction box, basically served by a dedicated 240 208 volt 30 amp circuit connected to the dwelling unit electrical panel. You don't need to say three conductor branch circuit because that's already defined by 240, 208 volt. So you could delete that and then minimum load of 4,500 VA. Well, we Did got this, the, I don't remember the exact origin, but we got this language from sources that that um, seemed like it was, that it, this was all gonna be necessary to pin down exactly how this is built. Right. So, but he, that, but is heater location, heater is location, by by getting rid of this, are you actually making it clearer or better in any way? Uh, I'm simplifying it. Clearer. Okay. So we have. Junction box versus circuit as the, the the discussion point. Is that true, Dwayne or Dwayne? Right, yeah. That's and then delete three conductor branch circuit because we've already stated that. And by definition in the code, it's three conductor. Okay. 
Mr. Angelman, how do you feel about that? Uh, I, I'm, I'm um, not an electrical engineer and neither is Dwayne the second. <laughs> and I would rather just leave it there. It, it's not hurting anything. And I think it might be necessary. Okay, is there anybody else who has comments on this proposal? I, there's Dwayne and Michael, you still have your hands up, but um, you've already spoken. So we have a motion on the table to approve. I would assume that whoever made the motion would like to amend it to include the as amended version on the screen. Correct, uh, motion to approve as amended. You're revising your motion to approve as amended. Quick question: Should W A be spelled out as Washington, or is that a is that a defined term? That's just me being lazy right now. I'll fix it. Okay. Do the end. Okay, so we have a motion to an amended motion to approve this as written on the screen. Um, all, I think we'll do a roll call vote on this one. Just gonna preempt that one. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing a nay will occur on this one. So, um, Chris, you wanna do the honors for voting? Okay. Eric Bedell. Yay. CJ Brockway. Martin Connor, Michael Kurtwright. A. Is that an A or a nay? That is a yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Kevin Duell. No. Mike Fowler. Yes. Patrick Hayes? No. Scott Henderson? Chris Holliday? Luke Howard? Yes. Dwayne Johnlin? Yes. Mike McGivern? Yes. Alan Montpelier? Eric Olman? Yes. Andrew Poltorak? Irina Resputnis? Yes. David Reddy? Yes. Lisa Rosenau? Yes. Gavin Tenold? Sean Vig? Yes. Amy Willis? Yes. John Lang? Abstain. Okay, motion carries two, three, six, seven, eight, nine, 12 to two with one abstention. Okay, motion carries. Um, so we are going to take a 20 minute break and we will be back at noon for our key issues discussion where we'll be doing C406 and a heap of water heating and then C406. So see you all in 20 minutes. Enjoy your lunch. <clears throat> all right, good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully you had a decent lunch and are excited and ready to cover our key issues today. Um, I made a request in an email via um, 
Krista, that since we've covered this proposal before and you've all diligently reviewed it and because it was posted early Wednesday morning, that we do a full discussion, but we do a quick discussion on it and um, make any modifications we need um, for the heat pump water heating one, including the minority reports. Um, so I'm hoping we don't have to relitigate all the issues that we've discussed previously when we talked about this one. Um, so, so please, if you need to reiterate points, make them, make them brief and just remind us that you've already made these points before. Um, we have a lot to go through and, um, and all of our time is extremely valuable. So I wanna, don't wanna take any more time than necessary. So um, there was a fairly large group that um, put together any modifications to the heat pump water heating proposal as well as the minority report. So I'd like to have Johnny um, pro provide, I don't know, three or four minutes on the modification based on the working group. And then have any other members of the working group try chime in and then, um, and then consider the proposal after, after a bit of testimony. Um, Kevin. Yeah, the proposal on the screen is the minority amendments. Yeah. Ah, so let's, and how many minority, uh, is there one minority uh, report or are there multiple? Just one with okay. you know, multiple tweaks. Okay. So why don't we bring up the, um, 136, uh, the Johnny version. And um, Johnny, you have the floor. Yeah, um, <clears throat> thank you so much to everyone who was involved in the last couple of weeks to um, make edits to the proposal and answer any concerns that folks had. Um, as you can see on the screen, uh, we've uh, made some edits. We've this is uh, no longer referencing the NIA standard in the charging language. So it is now an exception, um, exception three. Um, the language is largely based off of the Seattle heat pump water heating um, code that went into effect, but uh, we made some modifications to it based on both some learnings from folks in Seattle um, who are under that code as well as um, just uh, general amendments that folks just had it, um, on top of that. I think most of the changes that we made were in the alteration section, which is uh, at the end, if we wanna kind of just skip to that, that seemed to be the one that had the most comments. Um, and this is the final language after working with several people. Um, we're basically allowing for a replacement of single electric resistance or fossil fuel fired Service water heating appliances with a unit that has the same type or same type and same efficiency and uh, same or lower capacity. So, like for like replacements, um, not even necessarily for like a burnout, but just like you're coming up to an opportunity to replace a gas water heater, um, you can go ahead and do that as long as there are no other um, major alterations to the existing service water heating system size or configuration. So if you're not ripping out the district hot water uh, equipment or um, service loop and putting in a new one, then it's expected you'll be able to replace uh, a gas water heater like for like, yeah, same with electric resistant. Uh, we're also just allowing for general replacements for um, more quote unquote consumer grade replacement water heaters. Um, so these are defined in federal code and uh, that's exception number two. Um, and then if it's determined that uh, for folks that don't fall under exceptions one or two that um, they're unable to comply with the language in section uh, in chapter four, uh, a code official is allowed to basically give uh, an exemption for any alterations that may um, not be possible due to existing space or electrical capacity constraints. Um, that's it. We had, we, had some, we had some like minor edits on like other language that didn't really change the uh, scoping of it, just temperatures and groundwater, ground source heat pump language and things like that. Okay, thanks Johnny. Are there other 
people who participated um, on that group that want to uh, make make comments, just point out a, a thing or two about what might have changed. Go ahead, Lisa. Um, hi, yeah, I was um, part of the group that helped with the uh, upgrade for the alteration section, and it was a, a, you know a really good discussion with a lot of folks that. You know, we, it, was, it was a good compromise, I think, in the language that it's there. Um, there are two, <laughs> apologies to Johnny, um, there are two small, well, I guess small-ish details that um, Carolyn uh, Traub brought up. I don't know if she's on the call, um, that one, one is just a section reference correction that could be made, and that is, um, in the C503.4, it references tables. Uh, it should. It only goes up to table 12, and it should go up to table 16 because we have 16 tables now. So. Um, hey, Lisa. This is Caroline. Yeah. To jump in here. Yeah, yeah, those edits had to do with the the heat pump space heating cycle. Um, oh, I'm sorry. So we'll we'll I'm sorry. get to those later. Yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry. Sorry. Correction. Okay. Then, but other than that, I would say that. Um, of what we're seeing here on the screen for the existing building section is uh, they're reasonable, you know, that provides some flexibility for folks um, for those situations where, you know, you just have one piece of equipment that needs to be replaced or there's something urgent going on or for item number three, you know, where it really is, there's just too many constraints that would make putting a heat pump water heater in there really um, difficult to do. And so we feel like this is a very um, reasonable um, a change to this section of the code. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, are there other people in the working group that wanted to chime in on something? Um, otherwise, just open it up for, for anyone on the tag or the public to make comments in support or opposing or, or suggesting a revised wording. And please be succinct and provide specific feedback. Helen. Um, good afternoon again. Thank you for letting me speak on this. Um, uh, Johnny's been very generous with his time kind of chatting with us the last couple of days around this issue. Um, uh, we, we do have some concerns um, that around readiness um, for this type of proposal. Um, I would note that the specification from NIA that is uh, uh, identified in, this, in the proposal is not yet complete, um, which means that Nobody really knows what they're exactly what they're signing up for when uh, if they were if this were to be implemented. So uh, not even sure how to finalize the conversation without that information available. Hey Helen, um, can I ask a question right now? Sure. So my understanding is we 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 at the last peg decided to go forward with the version that is not is not based on the NIA standard. Is that the same NIA standard you're you're talking about? Yes, but I think there's still a reference to NIA here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for thanks for clarifying. And, it's and I understand the that voluntary it's, alternate path. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Um, yes, it's it's optional, but I, again, we st we still don't know what that looks like. Um, another, you know, again, you know, manufacturers are are still in this pandemic mode, trying to kind of keep up with a with a short supply chain. Um, uh, you know, while they're trying to it, it, you know keep up with development for new products and. And it's been a, a pretty big struggle. Um, in addition to that, I, I would note that um, there's a training element to this uh, for technicians that um, it, has, is, it has not even uh, been kind of discussed or you know kind of uh, started work there. So the time frame again, it's just too short. And um, uh, you know, I think as well, I think there are other issues that kind of need to be um, addressed or considered in terms of. Uh, cost and space and electrical capacity. So um, there's just a number of different issues here. And, um, uh, you know, there's just a, an overall lack of readiness. So just wanted to put that out there for folks consideration. Thanks, Helen. Um, I have Lisa next, although Lisa already spoke. Did you have more? Yeah, I actually would like to address um, Helen's uh, concerns about the NIA advanced water heating specification. Um, that, that specification is in its eighth edition uh, and it is it was actually developed. Um, it, it's been uh, out there for uh, actually a, 
couple of years at least. I'd have to check in with Mia to find out um, the exact time frame. So it, it is readily available. Um, I think it, it, it is, it's fair to say that the latest edition, um, that they are finalizing the details to that, um, but the changes in that edition are not necessarily substantive. So uh, I just wanted to address that comment. Thanks, Lisa. Um, next, we have Dwayne. I'd like to address Helen's comments about about timing. Um, this is this is a code that goes into force in in mid twenty twenty three, which is already actually plenty of time from now. But that's for permit application date, and then by the time you've got your permit and dug a hole in the ground and built the whole superstructure and you're installing. Um, these systems, you're into to late 24, 25. And if you can't like get uh, the supply chain and people together uh, by that time, there's something just seriously wrong. It's not, it's not a challenging time frame at all. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, Mark Frankel. Hi, this is Mark Frankel from Ecotope. I also would like to address Helen's comments. Uh, perhaps you're referring to some of your manufacturers who have not uh, taken steps towards this technology, but Ecotope has been working with four to six manufacturers of, of this technology. We've designed over a hundred installations with this. There's uh, you know, at least three manufacturers on the market and approved in code, for code in California right now. So there is not a shortage of, of market readiness at all. There may be some laggard manufacturers, but in general, there's plenty of product, so. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Brian Ahey. Hey, we'd like to uh, thank the members of the tag team. This is Brian Ahey uh, for Bradford White Water Heaters. We're a manufacturer of water heating equipment in the US. And I'd like to echo uh, some of the points that Helen made earlier. Uh, there is actually a limited number of commercial heat pump water heater manufacturers, and heat pump water uh, heater models that are currently on the market. Uh, we are a Energy Star Partner of the Year 2021 and 2020. Um, we're making advances on this, but the supply and availability isn't there yet. Um, with the language that's in this uh, proposed amendment, uh, it, there's concerns about the uh, HFC requirements less than 675 GWP. Uh, that exceeds the CARB standard that's currently out there. Uh, we'd also ask that um, exceptions be made or considered when we're talking about essential facilities, emergency centers, hospitals, clinics, laboratories, hazard buildings, factories and industrial buildings. And like I said, the language has, language needs to be tightened up on it. So there's many references that uh, say heat pump in here. Is that to heat pump or heat pump water heater? Uh, just think this bill needs some more work. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Um, Can I direct response one portion? Please. Um, just around the concerns for the 675 global warming potential, that's an optional credit. So it's not a requirement. That's just uh, for folks that want extra points. So there's no requirement for um, anyone to use. Uh, so that's a C406 measure for C406. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And I'm. Um, okay. Any references to the to heat pump over heat pump water heater? Would love to to see any of those like um, corrected. So if you have like specific red lines on that, that'd be appreciative to tighten up the language. I don't think it will change the uh, scope of this proposal at all. And then to Brian Ahey's point, I uh, was there exceptions for critical infrastructure considered by the the working group? Um. Yeah, we we uh, the exceptions we gave were specifically for the alteration section uh, for new construction. We are still pushing forward for um, both additions and new construction to use heat pump water heaters or 
uh, electric resistance in, in that there's 24 kilowatts given for every building plus 0.1 watt per square foot. So okay. no gas allowed and critical infrastructure, even if it's no. Okay, thanks, Johnny. Uh, Helen, you have your hand up still? Did you have more another comment? No, a um, couple of the comments. Um, I just wanted to note that the commercial heat pump water heaters were, were just added to NIA in this revision. So um, it, this is a little bit of a different of a revision than, um, than just merely a, a, an update. Um, I also wanted to note that, um, as Brian mentioned, that um, uh, the American Innovation and Manufacturing Act was just uh, passed, enacted at the, um, at the federal level, which re, um, phases down high global warming potential GWP HFCs, refrigerants. Um, and so uh, manufacturers are still working through uh, what refrigerant they need to use. And, and um, uh, they have not sorted through that. Um, uh, the testing that's required for the refrigerant alone uh, takes years uh, for equipment to pass the all the uh, many many tests from a safety perspective because there um, there are different characteristics to these new refrigerants. Um, uh, so that that testing does need to be done. And as I noted earlier, the the nationally recognized testing laboratories like the UL and others are backed up because of that, as well as some pretty big energy efficiency change requirements uh, at DOE at the federal level. And so um, from a testing perspective. Um, uh, they're even having trouble just keeping, keeping up with certification requirements uh, during the pandemic because of, of various quarantine requirements that have happened. So uh, th there's a lot going on. And, and also I would note that probably be a good idea um, to have some engagement with uh, some of the folks that actually install this equipment uh, and, and a conversation around the necessary training. Um, uh, what we found on the refrigerant side alone, and so these folks will need that refrigerant training in addition to whatever else is needed on this side of things. Um, and uh, we've been working for a couple of years now to kind of uh, to build that readiness on the refrigerant side of things. So I think there's, there's a lot of work here to do and um, you know, it'd probably be good to have like a bigger overarching conversation around a path forward um, uh, for this space. Uh, because I think that um, there's, there's a lot of more pieces to the of puzzle, puzzle pieces here um, than folks may uh, think there are uh, kind of looking from the outside in. Th thank you. Thanks, Helen. Um, I have Dwayne Jarman next. Yeah, um, Helen, I'd like to re respond to a few things. And we have been having this conversation for a couple of years now. So it's not like it just emerged. Training, there's lots of time to get training done, like I mentioned before. And you, your, your main objections seem to be to two entirely voluntary things, that, that there's this NIA standard that, that is close to finalized, but not quite, that you can use if you want to. So that would actually perhaps be a benefit. Uh, if, you don't, if it's not a benefit, you don't have to use it. And the, if you don't wanna go for the, the additional efficiency credits um, for low global warming potential uh, refrigerant, you don't have to do that either. Um, is it okay for me to respond to that directly, or how does that work? Um, let's see. Dwayne, did you ask those questions directly to Helen? Please uh, give Helen a chance to talk. Okay. Helen, go for it. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so the refrigerant transition is not optional. It's mandated by the federal government um, uh, under the American Innovation and Manufacturing Act that was enacted December 27, 2020. Uh, so that, that's not optional. Um, in addition, uh, the DOE provides uh, three to five years for transitions for water heaters uh, because of all the work that needs to be done from a testing and qualification listing process uh, at the nationally recognized testing laboratories. There, there's, uh, there's just simply a lot to do. And um, I, I know that from the outside looking in, it seems like uh, things should go faster, but, uh, but I think, you know, uh, what I've seen with other transitions uh, with with these these types of equipment that um, there's there's just uh, an overwhelming amount to do and during the pandemic uh, where everybody's attention is trying to keep the the supply chain which is on life support uh, moving forward so that people can access equipment um, this it's a very very difficult time for uh, equipment manufacturers for everybody in the supply chain to uh, kind of think about how to move to a new technology. So if it's already mandated by the feds, then why is your why, why have a concern that we're putting it in this role? Uh, for the HFC piece? Yeah. 
Uh, so the, eight, uh, the reduction to 675 uh, kicks out some uh, pretty critical options uh, that uh, will no longer be available. Um, uh, and and uh, this, this part of the industry has not even thought through what the, the appropriate limitations are and EPA has not yet set them. So uh, 675 knocks out some pretty good options that are, that are very energy efficient. Uh, and I would think that we would, would wanna be a little bit more, you know, takes a little bit more time and, uh, and look at the test results and, and testing data to um, determine what is most appropriate. Okay, you got about four years to figure it out. Okay, um, Eric. <clears throat> So I have uh, two, two questions, and I think one of them you already answered, Helen. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, I think this also goes to Brian. And what, the first question is, is the equipment available today to specify by a plumbing engineer um, to meet this code right now? Yes. I, so I wasn't asking you, Dwayne. I was asking <laughs> Helen and Brian. Uh, th thank you, Eric. So uh, um, I, I need to yield to Brian and let him answer this, but um, or perhaps Joe Boris is on the phone as well, and he may want to respond. Uh, there may be some companies that have something available, but um, wholesale, uh, widespread. I, I do know the answer to that that it's that it's not yet available, but but others can maybe answer on the onesie twosie kind of perspective. Go ahead, Brian. Brian, can you can you answer that question? Uh, I would say that Bradford White Corporation is still in development. Okay, so so I'm going to make a comment now, and, and thank you very much for answering that question. So in engineering right now, we are potentially, at least on a couple jobs, designing uh, projects that will go into permit after 2023, July 1st, right? So as an engineer who's, you know, if you're an engineer and you're working on DD documents right now, you're, you're potentially specifying that equipment uh, and water heaters today, right now, in 2021. Yeah, two years away. So Dwayne did make a good point that you're right, Dwayne, the buyout of that equipment will not happen for approximately four years. But the engineering and specifying of that equipment and getting in the specifications um, is happening literally right now or will happen potentially in the next six months on jobs that will be submitted after that July 1st, 2023 date. And if that technology is not available for the plumbing engineers to specify that piece of equipment, that's gonna be pretty tough to put that into a permit document. Um, I'm just gonna leave that there, but the, my feeling right now is that technology is not there. We have, according to you, I wrote down the DOE has a two to three la two to three year lag. We also have the pandemic. Again, people are trying to do supply chain or then putting their money towards the engineering departments. And it feels like this should be addressed in the next code cycle when that technology is available. Thanks, Eric. Um, Dwayne Llewellyn. Yes, uh, my question is basically on alterations to existing buildings. Um, most of the time when uh, water heaters that would become under would be regulated by this change are replaced on an emergency basis, whether it's a fire station, restaurant or whatever, gas fired. And so I'm not even aware that they're permitted. So I'm trying to figure out who's going to enforce this. Do we have any building officials online? Replacement water heater permitted? We have Dwayne and Mike McGivern on the line under that. Oh, go to the go to the 503 section there. This has been extensively rewritten. Have you looked at the new language, Dwayne? I'm not looking at it now. On I saw a brief. Um, way at the bottom. Because going to a heat pump from a gas fire would require electrical service update. It just doesn't happen overnight. Correct. Right. So there was this thing, but look at that exception that. The other exceptions there, basically, it, th there's there's not going to be very many uh, projects that uh, for for alterations that have to uh, switch to a heat pump water heater. Well, the gas fired under seventy five that's small. I'm thinking about a fire station, a restaurant. Yeah. Look at look at look at exception three. That's instantaneous water heaters. I'm talking about a tank type. 
Oh, exception yeah. three. Oh, yeah. So the code you're you're putting it on the code official to exempt them, right? Yeah, we're we're willing to take on the struggle. No, um, it it we these were the kind of complaints that we we'd heard was that uh, you know mechanical room space is always really tight, and and the electric service capacity might not be able to handle the, the transition and and even if you could um, the you know several 500 gallon tanks is a lot of structural load and so those become exceptions that let you not um, take this uh, take this path so it, it, it really basically loosened this this up uh, tremendously and that was at, at request of industry. Okay. Okay. That's all I had. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, Henry is next. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to speak to availability of products. Um, Ecoto has been installing these since 2009. And so uh, heat pump water heaters are readily available and successfully installed. Um, in terms of the 265 mandated uh, limitation on global warming potential, there are several products on the marketplace. Uh, they have global warming potential of one, also successfully installed, and they're becoming rapidly popular. And a question back to Helen is, uh, if, uh, I'd like to know when exactly you will not be allowed to purchase global warming potential above 675, because my understanding, even though it's being limited, it's a uh, very long ways out until you actually cannot purchase a piece of equipment. So if you have that date, that would be really interesting to know. Um, and in terms of refrigerant piping, most of these heat pumps come with packaged refrigerant uh, entirely. And so there's actually not a refrigerant technician required. It's actually a plumbing and electrical connection. You're not wiring, you're not routing refri refrigerant piping around your building. So um, I don't think that applies either. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. And you did ask a direct question. So I wanted to get that direct answer. Helen? So, so maybe I can speak to, um, I, I'm not sure if um, the speaker was talking about maybe carbon dioxide as a refrigerant, um, uh, very, you know, high cost. Um, uh, I, got the, I got the impression that Henry was asking about um, when the federal standards okay. that you were mentioning okay. earlier, when those would <clears throat> sunset sure, sure. the ability to purchase equipment. Okay, so um, so the way that the AIM Act works is that it phases down the supply of of, uh, of HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons, which includes refrigerants, uh, based on their global warming potential. Uh, next year, there'll be a 10% reduction compared to 2011. So that's about a 50% reduction based on what we use today uh, in the country. I'm uh, sorry, uh, about a 40% about a reduction based on what we do today. And then in uh, 2024, it'll go down another um, to 60% of the original basis. So. Um, there's a gradual um, displacement of the availability of supply. Um, when can you uh, actually not purchase a piece of equipment with traditional HFCs? What uh, year can you not? Sorry, I'm, I'm, thank you, Henry. I'm just getting to that. Um, okay. And so uh, it could be, uh, so, so based on that, the decision-making around who gets refrigerant and how much and what GWP uh, goes to the refrigerant supplier um, and uh, it, it, it is a very disruptive time for this industry to kind of uh, figure out when and what they need to do. There is no definitive date. Um, it, the decision-making is out of our hands at this point. Uh, we will probably try to come together uh, and make a proposal to EPA around a timeframe for this, but, um, uh, but we, uh, we are still kind of working through this because the research is not yet complete. So it's a very disruptive time, um, and uh, a lot of work remains to be done on that front as well uh, as on this front. Okay, thanks, I'm hearing Henry. your concerns actually don't have a direct impact to this proposal. Uh, so uh, sorry, I, I, um, I, uh, but the the reduction to a 675 um, pulls options off the table uh, that are are very energy efficient um, and uh, and may uh, fly in the face of the goals of of this proposal. I, I just want I would to disagree clear. with that, but I uh, stand down. Thank you. I just want to be clear that we're the C406 is the next key discussion item, and the refrigerant part of this proposal is a C406 option, just so that everybody's clear on that. Um, it's not required, it's an option. Um, and, and we're going to discuss, probably going to discuss that next if we get to it. Um, Mark Frankel. 
Thank you. I just want to be sure to reiterate that this product is available now for multiple manufacturers with multiple manufacturers delivering more new products on the market coming up this year. We've been using it for over a decade, as Henry mentioned, and it is available now and ready to install. I totally understand that not all the manufacturers are as far ahead as others, but I don't think it's the job of the code to wait for every manufacturer to have product available as long as there's multiple manufacturers moving forward. Plus, we have a four-year window before it's really required. By then, there'll be a lot more equipment available than there is now. It is already available, ready to go. So don't get the wrong impression about the state of the industry. Thanks, Mark. Um, Johnny. Yeah, a um, couple things. Um, thank you for everybody for, for the comments. Um, I'm still willing to make any changes specifically around that uh, references that, that uh, Bradford White made on where it says heat pump versus heat pump water heater. So if you have those specific red lines of just textual mistakes, please send them um, or say that now because we're likely going to vote on this today. Um, and two, um, you know, 45 cities in California have moved forward on all electric. Uh, California Energy Code on Wednesday certified um, a code that's going to require heat pump water heaters in pretty much every, like most new California homes built in 2023, um, as well as a lot of commercial buildings, small commercial buildings. Um, this isn't, this is coming. And, um, you know, industry's going to be ready because California's moving that direction. So Washington's going to be moving that direction as well. Um, I'm not really, as the current code proposal, open to any changes that, at this point um, that limit the where this is going to apply. Um, we've gone through eight weeks now of, of going through this this proposal. I'm sorry that some folks weren't able to see, it, uh, weren't aware of it until a couple of weeks ago. Um, I have um, met with AHRI a few times now to try to work through any concerns that they have. But at this point, you know, it's kind of late in the process. Um, so, yeah, um, Bradford White, HR, AHRI, I hear you. Um, not going to be making any large changes to the proposal at this point. So we can keep talking about it, but I think um, we've met probably 25 different people have, imp have uh, made inputs into the code language at this point for the proposal. And I don't think it'd be fair to them to make any major changes this late in the game. Okay, thanks, Johnny. And thanks for all your work in shepherding all those people towards what we see in front of us. I do want to note that the, despite what Johnny said, um, the tag can make modifications um, today. So um, even if Johnny doesn't want that to happen, it could happen today. So um, Austin had his hand up, put it down. So I guess, Austin, if you had nothing to say in addition. Uh, personally, I just wanted to say, yeah, we, we're also seeing projects that have uh, Heat pump water heaters like this, so it is available. And I have personally seen and uh, look through products where they do offer already different refrigerants like C uh, CO2. Um, so there's there's definitely options out there already. Thanks, Austin. Uh, Lisa. I think so. I just wanted to respond to uh, two comments that were made. Um, with regards to the uh, alterations. And that is that uh, exception number three that you see on your screen, um, it, it is a very flexible exception, um, even though it does um, state that the code official is the one who would make the decision here. It does put the burden on the um, in installing contractor uh, to uh, bring to the code official their um, reasons for not being able to do it. it. It still puts the burden, you know, some burden on the code official, but it really does come down to the contractor on that one. And there is language like that uh, under the mechanical section of the energy code. It's been in there for several code cycles. And so uh, this is just mimicking similar language for that. And it does give a lot of flexibility to deal with existing conditions where this it wouldn't be conducive for this. And then I, I did a little bit of research. I apologize. I didn't have this off the Talk my head, but um, Nia's standard um, version number seven is the one I was able to put my hands on, and that was published in December of 2019. Thank you. 
Thanks, Lisa. Um, I have Michael Kurt right next. So there were some comments or questions about uh, enforcement of this section. So we don't have an energy code inspector per se. So this section, as I understand it, would fall under the plumbing plan review and inspection group. Um, and as I understand the exception three, that code official is that that would be the plumbing plan reviewer or inspector that would make that determination. So uh, just clarification there. Is there a question to our resident uh, building officials? Michael Curtright, is that a question to Mike McGivern or, or Dwayne? Or is that just a comment? No, I've had, I've had considerable discussion with, uh, for example, Steve Hart in Public Health, Seattle, King County, but whose jurisdiction is it to enforce this? And if it relates to the plumbing system, he's told me it would fall under his jurisdiction as plumbing, chief plumbing plan reviewer and inspector. And if any of the AHJs that are online want to comment on that or, or clarify that, I, I would welcome that. Okay, now, uh, Governor Dwayne. Locally, we have we have um, split up some of the responsibilities there. So, so yes, your your primary point of contact will be uh, the the county uh, plumbing inspector, and and there are aspects of this work that are uh, looked at by our mechanical. Um, and boiler people. I would agree. Okay, thanks, Michael. Um, I have Eric Bedell next. Yeah, th th this is two. Uh, there's a there's a gentleman in the in the chat. Um, I think his name was Joe. Yeah, I wrote him down. Um, Joe he's, Boris. He's he's second uh, from now. Oh, okay. Yep. Again, I'm going to ask that question to Joe too that I asked, uh, and you're with Ream. Um, is this technology from Ream available today, Joe? And I, I have a second question after you answer that question. Joe? Yeah, thank you. Um, let me just, before I answer that, let me just start out by saying that the you know, I, I'd like to echo the comments uh, made by AHRI and uh, Bradford White concerning their, th th this proposal. And then to your question, uh, REAM is, is developing uh, commercial water heaters, heat pump water heaters to meet this requirement. There are some products that I, I would say are fairly close to meeting this, but we are in the uh, development process as well. I should, I should also point out uh, maybe clarify the NIA spec. So the NIA version 8.0 is, is what includes the central heat pump water heaters or the commercial heat pump water heaters that we're talking about here today. That was issued earlier this year and the common period for that closes at the end of this year. There's about 30 pages that were added to that spec. So it's actually a really good specification and includes a sizing tool and various other requirements. So I, I think it's ideal to adopt that in some form or at least reference it. But at the same time, the document is also under review. So, so I, would, I would say that, uh, you know, there's some work here to be done to, to refine these requirements. We, REAM generally supports fully and, and in many cases uh, agrees with the proposal here, but, but I think there's some timing uh, issues here and some detail here that we have a concern with. Thank you for allowing me to comment. I, I pre appreciate that, Joe. So that I just want to let everyone here know that's two manufacturers that I mean these are the these are the, the cream of the crop, the people that are supplying the majority of the heating. Uh, sorry, the service water heating or domestic water heating uh, on projects, right? Bradford White and Ream. Right? Um, and the the question, the next comment I have is actually to Henry and Henry. Um, Odom, sorry, Henry Odom, you mentioned that you've done this numerous times in either California or, or near what manufacturers do meet this requirement. Um, I, I really would like to know that, uh, you know, if it's who, who's meeting this right now. 
Yeah, sure. Um, I would say there's also several other manufacturers currently in development that um, can't list, but everyone's seeing this and, you know, um, it's kind of what the code's also for, right? You create a requirement and people respond to it. But um, we've been using Colmac, which is a Washington State manufacturer for a long time, developed their product with them for a while. Um, recently, Sanco 2, uh, Gen 4 Sand and Systems, those are smaller. And uh, Mitsubishi has a product as well. And uh, Mitsubishi is a very well-known brand. Um, that, that's the, that's the bar is what, yeah. But, but again, I don't know what market share and maybe Bradford White and Reem could say how many, what the market share of how many water heaters they probably sell, you know, in the whole, they gave a pie chart, you know, they, they probably are a lot of that pie chart. Uh, so there are a lot of the heaters. small stuff. Let's keep in lot, mind, we're talking about big yeah, central that, that's stuff. A, that's a fair statement. That's a fair statement. So I just, again, um, we have experts, we have industry who, who say the technology is just not there for them. And it will be, and they like this code, but it feels like there's a time frame issue and when we're, we have the potential to adopt this. So I'm going to leave that there. That's my last comment. Hey, um, Joe Boros, did you get your two cents in or do you want to contribute more? Yes, I think uh, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to comment. I don't have further comments. Okay, thanks. Um, Kevin, you are up. Thanks, Joe. Uh, again, similar to the, the receptacle proposal, I think the language in this one is very strong. I, I helped contribute to it. Idea of a fundamental disagreement with the, the basis of it, which is that electrification is the only means to decarbonization. And we'll bring that up more in the minority amendments. Okay. Um, I heard, I'm just, I'm seeing nobody else with their hand up. Um, Johnny and Eric, you still have your hands up, but I'm assuming you have said your piece. Um, what I heard was um, there was possibly some cleanup of heat pump water heater versus heat pump or something like that. I heard that uh, there was, a, you know, the, the infrastructure, uh, primary infrastructure um, kind of question that seemed to get addressed. I heard that there was a timing, potential timing issues among people, uh, from some people, and um, to bring product to market. Um, but there were, weren't, you know, there weren't code language suggestions made um, today. So, uh, I, Helen, go ahead. Sorry, I, um, I I think maybe uh, maybe I dropped my hand and, and you didn't see it. I did I did want to okay. clarify around California if that's okay. Uh, what's kind of happening in California? Go for it. Um, so I I just I just wanted to um, clarify that uh, California has uh, moved its proposal forward to the next step of the building codes uh, around using a performance metric rather than a prescriptive pathway. Um, it doesn't specifically ban um, use of, of water heating systems like this, but, um, but there is uh, encouragement, you, you would have additional requirements um, uh, if the proposal does go through the building codes as, as written. So I just wanted to clarify that, um, uh, that, that that's kind of moving toward a performance pathway. Okay, thanks, Helen. Um, I think it's, it's getting about time to to vote on this. And I just wanna make sure everybody's aware, it sounds like um, we, we don't have a motion on the, on the, on the table yet, um, but the, the only kind of substantive thing that I heard that would suggest different code language would be to put a delay in this. Um, so I, I guess let's, somebody make a motion on, on this one way or the other. Motion to, Approve as shown currently on the screen without further amendments. Second. Okay, we have a motion and we have a second. Um, I am gonna hazard a guess and say that there'll be some dissent on this. So is there further discussion? Okay, Krista, do you wanna do the honors? Do a roll call. <clears throat> Helps if I unmute. Uh, let's see, Eric Bedell. No. C. 
CJ Brockway, Martin Connor, Michael Kurtwright. No. Kevin Duell. No. Mike Fowler. Yes. Patrick Hayes. No. Scott Henderson. Chris Holiday. Luke Howard. Yes. Dwayne Johnlin. Yes. Mike McGivern. Yes. Alan Montpelier. Eric Olnon. No. Andrew Poltorek. Irina Rasputinus. Yes. David Reddy. Yes. Lisa Rosenau. Yes. Gavin Tennell. Yes. Sean Vig. Yes. Amy Wheelis. Yes. And I think Elizabeth is on for Alan. Yeah, I just sent a message. Sorry, I joined late. Okay, Elizabeth. Uh, yes. Motion carries 11 to 5. Okay, thanks, Krista. We are going to stay on the same proposal, but with the minority um, reports right now. So, um, is there somebody who wants to present the minority reports? That would be me, Kevin Duell. Go ahead, Kevin, you have the floor. And I'd like to cue this up with a brief uh, introduction, just to put this in context. So may I share my screen? Okay, make sure I get the right thing here. Okay, I assume you're seeing that, which is nothing. <laughs> uh, a black screen. Great, that's the intent. So I think I mentioned this in meetings before, our guiding star mm -hmm. for decarbonization is Denmark. And I wanted to just put this in context a little bit. So as you can see, Denmark is significantly smaller than the state of Washington, but has a fairly sizable population nonetheless. And it is arguably the cleanest, greenest energy system of any country on the planet. And they endeavored to get there first with electrification, 100% electrification, and then thought better of it uh, for a number of reasons, and including cost, resiliency, et cetera. Anyway, and they began that program of uh, of decarbonization on the gas side with renewable natural gas. So when, as you can read better than I can say, they enacted an incentive by law and were able to get RNG in the pipeline soon after. Uh, right now, it's averaging about 20% plus. They did have a record day on July 25th this year of 63%, but that's obviously a low consumption day, but still, that was a record. And their goals are, well, you can see right there, 100% by 2040. And just a little bit about 
their pathway or intended pathway. There's been discussion about, hey, there's not enough RNG to make up the full use today. And that's true. Uh, that's true in Denmark as well. And of course, the response is to lower use. And at some point, those lines will cross as indicated here. Um, so back to Washington, wanted to just raise House Bill 20, excuse me, 1257 that was passed in 2019. Uh, and just note the, the large text that the legislature encourages the development of RNG to transition to a large, low carbon energy economy. And that, that bill continues to go on and say that, I'll summarize, you can read faster than I can, than I can talk, but basically a gas supplier has to provide a renewable natural gas alternative to customers, which might sound insignificant, but this is what opens the door to RNG because a utility by law has to provide the lowest cost resource. And this opens the door to other resources because otherwise you would continue to operate as business as usual, right? So as an example of how that's playing out, uh, like I said, it was signed into law in 2019. The rulemaking occurred in 2020. So that's when it could actually be put into effect. This year, we heard from Chris Burroughs at Puget Sound Energy that uh, they're at one and a half percent as of June and they hope to be at two and a half percent this year. And you can read better than I can, three and a half in a couple of years. Um, so then the question is, if we can get the RNG, how do we pull down the usage? Oh, I forgot to mention the front. Oh, I would like to get through this. It's very short and then tender questions and comments. And this is one of the ways of getting there is a gas fired heat pump water heater. This is on the market. Uh, you can read the stats there. It is uh, that last bullet point, Fortis BC, the utility in British Columbia is offering an incentive for these. So they're not just on the market, they're uh, being incentivized. And that the bullet up from that, that it's best to use these as a hybrid. The, the point there is that yes, you could get all of your water from this unit, but it's more cost effective and space effective to use this in conjunction with a, a traditional water heater for peak load or uh, heat maintenance. So that's the end of the presentation. I will stop sharing my screen and we can go back to the proposal or the, excuse me, the minority amendments. So obviously, I would like to get gas-fired water heater heating back into the code. And so I, I, we have to strike that first sentence to make that so. Uh, that really the key exceptions here are three and six. So focus on those out of order. So exception three, I'm just referencing Nia, but in a broader take, they have a commercial gas fueled advanced water heating spec as well that basically requires a heat pump water heater or equipment with an efficiency greater than one, which would be a heat pump. And owing to what I just said about hybrid systems, exception six would allow a standard combustion unit, but at 92%, it would be condensing. And so ideally you would couple those two technologies together. And then exception one just paralleling with electric resistance, allowing uh, gas heating as uh, with efficiency as, as, as specified elsewhere in the code. And to talk more about the, uh, the heat pump water heater at 129%, granted that's at good conditions, right? When it's not freezing cold outside, um, but that's a substantial change over the federal minimum of 80. So it's a dramatic savings in gas and energy and emissions. Uh, the, the goal there, as I mentioned, is to pull down that demand line 
so that we can make up with uh, renewable sources. And then there's more exceptions further down, or excuse me, other, other changes further down, but fairly simple, just adding in gas, water, heat, where electric resistance was specified or removing electric, the call for electric resistance where it would broaden the, the definition back to a, uh, a code approved water heater. And then this last, I think that's the last one that we just passed by, just again, adding gas water heating for temperature maintenance, owing again to that design principle of a hybrid system. Thanks, Kevin. Um, well, uh, that concludes it, right? Correct. Okay, cool. Um, what comments or questions are, are there on this? Um, David. Um, thanks, Kevin. Uh, the, did you consider, so as opposed to um, incentivizing or encouraging use of gas, uh, you pump water, you pump water heaters. Did you look at just combination of using electric heat pumps with gas, uh, condensing gas with uh, coupled for, for cold temperatures and peak loads? Because uh, when we've looked at that approach, the COPs are higher, much higher than 1.3. I mean, that, this as proposed in front of you would certainly allow that. And if, yeah, I mean, flexibility is key in design, right? One of the reasons for a, a gas unit is if you have an existing system, for example, that's gas fired, this is not quite a drop in, but you don't have to affect your, uh, your electrical system as much. And I, 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 I may have not been clear when I mentioned how the Danes are approaching electrification and uh, decarbonization. They are certainly using electrification for their railways in particular, uh, automobiles and buildings, but they, they're looking at a combined approach for uh, the entire energy grid. Yeah, I, I guess that, I would say, um, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just responding to the chat. So that roadmap for, for electrification, that's specifically for their rail system. I don't speak Dutch, but I've seen the, the uh, Translation. <laughs> no, I just want to clarify, though, your your proposal is not to require something necessarily that's greater than one point three or or better. The exception six would allow any condensing gas system to qualify to meet the requirement. Is that right? That's right. And I did want to mention that the way this is structured is very handy because normally that kind of requirement would run into preemption problems. But I believe because it's an exception and you could do any number of things that it will not run into preemption issues. Yeah, I'm not worried about that. I'm just, I think it's it's basically still allowing COPs less than one uh, and for systems. Whereas your, I think part of your argument is that the advanced water heating specification for commercial gas fuel equipment is, is that it's greater than one. And, and so let's see. That's true, and, and part I appreciate you bringing that up. Part of the reason for making that a separate exception and not an integrated one is there aren't a lot of manufacturers making these gas-fired heat pump water heaters. So I'd like to use the, the spec, but recognize market availability, and also in it just owing back to 1257 House Bill 1257 encourage that development of the, uh, the natural, uh, the, the renewable natural gas system. And also this is intended to be, uh, shall we say, a, a, a softer lift to higher efficiency systems. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I see a softer lift as being using existing heat pump technology, electric heat pump technology that may not operate necessarily at, at cold temperatures coupled with uh, gas for extreme low temperatures and peaks, um, that being way more efficient than, than what you're proposing here. Well, as I said, um, flexibility is key. Yeah, and, and Kevin, unless someone addresses a question directly, we're not gonna 
you, you don't get to respond to everybody. Uh, oh. Just, 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 just like Johnny, but he didn't respond to everybody directly. Um, if somebody asks you a question, go ahead and respond um, and raise your hand if you have a, a comment. But thanks for that clarification. Through. Yeah, I'm just trying to make sure everybody who wants to speak. And the last one we had, you know, like 15 or 20 people. So I don't know if we'll have that many people this time. Henry. Yep. I just want to clarify I'm in support of uh, Johnny's proposal that just came up but also in, uh, would agree with David Reddy in that um, making a lower blow would actually be supplementing heat pump water heater electric. Um, the way this is written is basically how current code is used anyway through C406, the uh, condensing gas water heater is far and above the most often used uh, piece of equipment. So this actually, in my eyes, is not an energy saving proposal. Thanks. Thanks, Henry. Are there other comments? I suggested to Kevin a minute ago that there might be, um, but I'm not seeing hands raised. Amy. Sorry, that was a mistake. Um, I didn't hear what you said, Amy. Um, a child hit my phone. <laughs> I still didn't hear that, but Mike Kennedy. So I guess I have a, a question for the proponent. If, if there's these units out there that are 129% efficient, um, why, is, why is that not part of this uh, exception to require at least some portion of the capacity to be met by a much higher efficiency than 92%. So Kevin, you can respond because you were asked a direct question. Okay, thank you. Um, well, good question. I, again, wanted to leave the availability for more product to be able to uh, meet the requirement because again, there's not many that make these. But that could be, there, there are levels within the advanced heating specification and that could be incorporated. Thanks, Mike. Are there any other comments on this proposal? Okay, well, I'll entertain a motion to do something with this. Motion to approve. We have a motion to approve as written. Second. We have a second. Further discussion. Okay, Krista, uh, I think the roll call is in order. Okay, Eric Bedell. Yes. Michael Kurtwright. Yes. Kevin Duell. Yes. Michael Fowler. No. Patrick Hayes. Did you say Patrick Hayes? Yes. Yes, I did. Yes. Scott Henderson. Chris Holiday. Luke Howard. No. Dwayne Johnlin. No. Elizabeth Joyce. No. Mike McGivern. No. Eric Olman. Yes. Marina Rasputinus? No. David Reddy? No. Lisa Rosenall? No. Gavin Tennell? No. 
Sean Vick? No. Amy Willis? No. Right, right, right. That was an interesting suggestion. He, I would, I would. Motion failed five to 11. Okay. Um, I'm forgetting, do we need then a motion to disapprove this or do we move on? Krista, do you, do you know, since this is a minority report to a... Um, I don't think we need another motion. I think because the motion failed, it does not modify the previous motion. And so we don't need a, a motion to overturn it. Okay. Uh, Mike McGivern. I was... Proposing to table this to allow an opportunity to uh, modify it to make it more amenable to the other uh, comments made about efficiencies in the design world. So I'm making a motion to table it. I, I think it's already been voted on. So the tabling is off the table. Yeah, my, my understanding, which could be, which is imperfect probably, is that we would need a motion to take it off the table and then another motion to table it if we wanted to reconsider it. Or at a future date, Mike, um, we could reconsider it um, through a, a vote of, I forget whether it's majority or two thirds, uh, we could reconsider it. Um, so I, th those are the paths that I'm aware of for going forward. Um, okay, that's fine. Thank you. So if you wanted to work with the stakeholders um, to to do something with this, you 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 would be welcome. And um, as a tech member, you could, I believe. Uh, make a motion to reconsider it at any point, but probably later when you have talked to the proponents. So that's, I'm not a lawyer, so it's just my understanding. Okay, um, then I think we're done with uh, key issue number one, heat pump water heating. Well, the then I'll, I, to, to your comment, I will make a motion to remove this proposal from the table and to table it for further discussion. Yeah, I, I would really need to look that one up. Um, <laughs> I, I was kind of winging it there where I, I know you can't take something from the table once it's been, I guess it hasn't been approved. So I don't know what status that is. So um, Kevin, if you wanted to look up the rules on that, um, I'd be more comfortable if you looked up the rules on that and then through, through Robert's uh, rules of order newly re revised and then made that motion later today. Um, Fair enough. When, we're, when you're confident that that's, that's the appropriate motions to be made. Um, Can do. Okay, great. And okay, go ahead. I also had other discussions. So the proposals we just heard, or the proposal 136, he, the, the water heating and 103 space heatings are probably two of the most consequential changes to the Washington Energy Code in its history, I, I would suggest. And I would say so they deserve a thorough analysis. So therefore I would request that the TAG uh, have the SBCC prepare a report detailing the economic impact that those proposals will have on small businesses housing affordability, construction costs, and life cycle costs. Uh, there's been no dispute that these proposals will result in higher costs in construction, and that will impact affordability. 
particularly to small businesses that are less likely to absorb that economic cost. And I just wanted to refer us back to item six in the tag rules that when reviewing a proposed amendment, the tag is shall identify proposed changes that may have an economic impact on small businesses, housing affordability, construction costs, life cycle costs, and the cost of code enforcement and shall report those findings to the Economic Impact Enforcement Correlation and Construction Committee. So therefore, with that preamble, I move that the tag request in writing that the SBCC prepare and submit a report detailing the economic impact that the key electrification proposals will have on small businesses, housing affordability, construction costs, and life cycle costs, namely proposals 103, heat pump space heating, and 136 heat pump service water heating. Second. Second. Oh. Okay, we have a motion. Um, I mean, this is this is probably like an other business thing. So we're considering it out of order. Um, but I think it's important and I think it has to do with uh, the one we were just considering. So um, it, it seems reasonable to me. So um, we have a motion um, to in writing request that the State Building Code Council um, provide a, a third party study, I'm assuming, to look at the costs and effect on small business of proposals 136 and 103 as the tag has passed them and will pass them through the remainder of the, this, this week and next week. So that, that's the motion as I understand it. Um, further discussion on this, this motion, Lisa. Yeah, question about this, uh, if we can expand the request that's being presented uh, for vote that that analysis be performed without, not just focused on energy efficiency, but also of course, um, you know, carbon reduction uh, with an appropriate value uh, attached to that as well. So that I would like to add that to the request. Okay, Kevin, is that reasonable to you? I, I, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. I think you had asked for a life cycle cost study and Lisa is suggesting that uh, the, the study should include um, carbon emissions, uh, increases or reductions, as well as, as other things? Yes, that's not just the request. Mm -hmm. not I just see. Economic and, costs. Directly. And I'm not, I, and I, excuse my ignorance, with the SBCC process, I know that there's an economic impact analysis that's required but I'm not sure what all that's intended to include. I'm just looking at the yep. tag rule six. And I, I know that it, it, it's the impact specifically on small business, et cetera, mm -hmm. and includes life cycle costs, but also other things like housing affordability, construction costs, et cetera. So I, I don't know, I don't know if that's what they do, I guess is what I'm getting at, the, it, including the cost of carbon and, and emissions and all that, I, I don't know. We're, we're charting a bit of new territory, Kevin, and everybody okay. else. Um, so I think um, I think that will probably be included in any study. Um, so I, but Kevin, are you, do you see that as some part of your motion or would you amend your motion to include that information? Well, I mean, it's, it's my understanding that the SBC's current scope doesn't include that. It's just, it's just not spelled out as such. And I guess I'd leave that up to the SBCC. Okay, but you have a motion to, to ask the SBCC to do something. So you could do, you could accept the amendment or you could reject the amendment to ask them to do, to include life cycle or to include um, carbon in the analysis as well. Uh, I, I, I guess I'm gonna stick with my, my proposal as, as is. Okay, so 
the the options would lisa would be you could propose that as a non-friendly amendment and then you could vote on whether that's an amendment to kevin's original motion um or uh or you could not do that understood um and and this is where i i would have liked to have done some some more research ahead of time um on this detail so the the mandate of the state building code council it uh for the you know final analysis um does it include the the state mandate for carbon reduction or no and that lcca process as i understand it that is from the um ofm includes a cost of carbon within it is my understanding and I assume that that's the process or a, the math that we would do, but I don't know that for a fact. Krista, do you, do you know? I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, well, um, if Lisa, you wanted to, or anybody wanted to do that, you could make an unfriendly amount a motion and then that could get appended to the original motion if we wanted but i'm going to start calling on people this is um uh amy i guess I, just a point of clarification since this spcc will already be doing this economic analysis already at some point um i'm just confused at how what this is but what we're what we're doing here, what 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 how this is different from common practice. And this is uncharted territory, so I don't know how this is different. Someone made a motion and it got a second, and so we're going to follow it to its logical end. Um, it's entirely possible that so so the building code council is required to do some actually story on where you are you on here? I saw you earlier. Looks like you dropped. Yeah. Okay, because I know Krista Soyan and I have been talking about the economic analysis that will be performed or or sh should be performed after the tag finishes its process and the MVE committee and the Building Code Council put this out for public comment. And that process is unknown at this point. It's unknown exactly what pieces will be done or not done. Um, so um, it, it's hard to answer at this point exactly how that process is gonna go. It's, it's, it's been required before, but it's never been done before by the Building Code Council. Um, so to the best of my knowledge. So. Um, Joe, this is Dan Kirshner. I have my hand up. Can I help, uh, hopefully help illuminate the conversation? Please. Uh, section four of the Building Codes Council bylaws uh, mm -hmm. references the work group on economic impact. Yes. Uh, the work group on economic impact may conduct research, and uh, I'll just skip to the to this part. The uh, work group on economic impact shall conduct research upon request of a technical advisory group, a standing codes committee, upon the WI's own motion or at the request of the council. I believe, uh, and Kevin can correct me if I'm wrong, that this is what Kevin is asking the uh, group to, is asking. Okay. So this that's, is that, this is the motion. That's helpful, Dan. Um, uh, yeah, that would, I would agree. Okay. Um, uh, okay, let's go with uh, Dwayne. Yes, I'm speaking against this motion. I don't want to start this precedent of, of sending these kind of notes. The, the, as has been mentioned, the council's already charged in law with providing an economic analysis and, and a small business analysis, a uh, small business impact. This is the technical advisory group. That's what we're named. And we like work out the technical things and then, and then the council deals with the politics of it. And finally, this is the kind of thing that goes in a minority report that you can, you can say, hey, we, we need to have more analysis of the costs or something. 
um, and and uh, to to like single this out and say, well, council, you do this stuff that you're already required to do. It's kind of absurd. So I don't want to start down this path. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, Mark, Franklin. Yeah, I just want to offer, I think, a clarification to Lisa's potential amendment that if we do a carbon analysis, it should be with the carbon values that we've recommended be adopted in the code as well. Okay, that sounds like a amendment to the original motion, uh, friendly or not. Um, Shall I have my hand up again? Yep, but Johnny's also had his hand up for a while. Okay. So okay. I'm calling on people in the order in which I see their hand go up, which okay. is imperfect. Yep, thank you. So Johnny, if you... Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I kind of, to back up the comments from Amy, um, you know, this is gonna be done later. Um, if it is decided to do this analysis, I'd like both proposals to be also be analyzed um, together. So systemic savings, such as loss of natural gas infrastructure costs would also be analyzed. And if carbon's going to be analyzed, I'd like there to be a in-depth research on what the sources of that carbon could be and whether or not that is from biogas sources that already exist versus are created, which are impossible to be carbon neutral. Okay, uh, tag member would need to make, to amend the motion with with that information. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'll just say that. Dan, you are up next. Thank you. I'm, I'm not a tag member, but I will speak in support of the motion. Just again, noting the section four of the Building Codes Council bylaws, uh, which says the WEI work, uh, the work group on economic impact shall review or prepare appropriate economic analyses for the council, a requesting tag or a requesting standing code committee. That's all I have to say, thanks. Thanks, Dan. Um, uh, Kevin. Yeah, just going back to the tag rule number six, I just wanted to note that this report is not discretionary. The rule actually requires that if a proposal at the tag may have an economic impact, then findings must be made and reported to the SBCC at the request of the TAG. And that's what this measure, or that's what my motion does. Yep. Okay. Um, and the world is full of unfunded mandates. And um, I, I'll just say that. Um, Amy, did you have something to say? Um, I was on the difference here and, and what the causes could be um, and the scope Amy, I'm not able to understand you. Um, you're breaking up too much. I'm sorry. Okay. If you want to put it in the chat, I will read it. Um, Okay, we have Gavin. Um, Shell, you kind of alluded to my question here. Like, does does this uh, work group have funding? Um, I see two members of the State Building Code Council, yourself included. I'm asking, you know, do we have funding for this at this point in time, or does this, you know, perpetually deadlock our process and timeline for trying to get this this thing done? In I, the MP? I, I think it would the. I think the building code council probably should do this. So um, we just need, uh, you know. I think we should do this. So um, uh, yeah, I. The money maybe it will be found and maybe it already exists. Um, so I, we shouldn't be bound by whether we think the money exists or not, because we don't really know the answer to that. So, um, okay, I'm gonna read as 
I said, I'm going to read Amy's comment. I'm still confused what the difference is between this and the SBC economic analysis. And Gavin is basically asking my other question. So my understanding from what Dan has been saying is that some of this analysis needs to be requested by a tag or by some other group. And therefore, this is the official request um, for the SBCC to do so. Um, that's my understanding of where, where we are with this. So um, I have Mark Frankel, people lowering their hands. John Frankel, there you go. John? John, I do not hear you. Still don't hear you, John. Um, Patrick. I think I'm supportive of this on, for both sides of the fence. Um, it's important that this gets done because as Kevin said, these are very big things. And there is an RCW on the books regarding rogue state agencies. And some lobby group or something could use the RCW to go after these proposals of a rogue agency. So the economic impact, as Kevin is asking for, could help defense of the council so it just should be done for you know all the right reasons okay um there was a question in the chat about whether we can um table this we can table any motion at any time so um uh john frankel john frankel i still can't hear you but you have the floor Not working. Not working. Yep. Yeah. Okay. David, ready. Uh, yeah, I'd like to make a motion to table this so we can work on the on the uh, the proposal yep. for the okay. agreement. We have, a motion. we have a motion. We have a second. Um, okay. There can be no further discussion after a motion to table. So, um, Derek, you've got your hand up, but you can't. We're not supposed to discuss this at this point. So, Kel, I, I got lost somewhere. What are we tabling? Yeah. There was a motion that Kevin made to request that the Building Code Council do an economic analysis. That was a motion. There was a second on that. Then we have a motion to table that motion to request that the Building Code Council do this economic analysis. Um, and that's what is being considered right now. Does that make sense? No, thank you. Yep. So now um, I am going to call a vote on that. And um, I'm going to risk a voice vote. All in favor of tabling the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. 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 No. Krista, Krista do the honors. Eric Bedell. Nay. Michael Curtright. No. Kevin Duell. No. Mike Fowler. Yes. Patrick Hayes. No. Gary, oh, let's see, skip that. Uh, Luke Howard. Yes. Dwayne Johnlin. Uh, yes. Elizabeth Joyce. Yes. Mike McGivern. Yes. Eric Olman. No. Arena Rasputinus. 
Yes. David Reddy. Yes. Lisa Rosenau. Yes. Gavin Tennold. Yes. Sean Big. Yes. Amy Willis. Yes. Motion carries 11 to five. Okay, we've done a motion to table. I would request, Kevin, that you reach out to those who had suggestions for the motion and um, work with them to bring this motion back up next meeting and with, with, uh, with their input. Does that sound good, Kevin? Fair enough. And could... I, I'm not tracking who all these people are. So if that could be put into the chat, perhaps. If you want to work with Kevin on this motion to request economic analysis, please put your name in the chat and, um, and probably your email address. And he will reach out to you and talk about this motion so we can take it up next time. And Kevin, please, if we don't put it on the agenda, uh, forget to put it on the agenda, please bring it up at the beginning of next meeting that it should be on the agenda, okay? Fair enough, and a Amy had a question about potentially involving the SBC staff. Yes, I think that'd be great. Um, I think it would be good to involve them. And I'll have to do some research on who that might be. Okay, that's Krista, who's in this meeting. Uh, Stoyan, who's the director. Um, probably, right, you could just reach out to Krista and she would connect you with the right person at the, at the staff level. Great. Uh, I do have a follow-up motion, but I'm not sure if I'm out of order. Um, I guess, if is it about the heat pump water heating proposal? It is. I believe you can make that then. Uh, it's uh, related to the prior, prior one, and I'll just get right to it. So I, I, I moved that the tag prepare an equity impact statement and submit to the Washington Office of Equity with a formal request that it apply the equity lens to the following proposals, 103 heat pump space heating and 136 heat pump service water heating. And this is pursuant to RCW 43.06D. Okay. We have a motion to do what Kevin said, and um, we have a second for that. Is there further discussion? You have a second. This is Michael Kurt, right? I think Patrick seconded it. I seconded it. Okay. Um, Dan, do you have a comment? I'm sorry, no, I think my hand is still left uh, up. I'm sorry, I'll lower it and apologize. Okay, go ahead, Kevin. So just a little discussion on this. Uh, and then, you know, as we know, an increased energy burden has different consequences to a household or a business owner that uh, may be of lower income or have fewer resources compared to those with a, a median or, or greater income. And since we've seen that the proposals I mentioned will have a, a cost burden. I would expect that they'd be proportionally heavier on small businesses, low income communities, black and indigenous communities and people of color. And that may create a, a barrier for those least able to afford those, uh, those amenities. So. Yeah, I guess I'd just make an observation that we just decided that the proposal to request additional studies needed work with, based on what the state already requires and what we're able to request and what char what characteristics we want to include. And I don't understand why this wouldn't be part of that same motion where we couldn't just ask once for a study that has the following factors considered, and why it would be, we're not going to do a separate request, we're going to ask for one study with various criteria. So it seems to me that we should just build the the proposal for the study we want with all the factors in, into one motion.
Don Frankel. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right, good. Okay, thank you. Solve that problem. Uh, just to clarify, this is actually a different uh, review than what we had uh, discussed in the previous motion. This is uh, an action that is mandated by the legislature that a separate department, not the SBCC, but the Office of Equity, uh, apply um, uh, that lens of equity to any agency actions, which, the, which would be one that we've determined to be uh, likely considerable based on the costs. So they actually possess the criteria, the metrics, the process. Um, we wouldn't be spelling that out. So if we did table this one and said, we would like to have it done this way, and then told the Office of Equity, they would likely disregard that because they have their own processes in place. So this is mandated by the legislature. It's not something that we have an option to do. Um, where in the previous motion also, there was language that indicated that the TAG has to request this. Uh, this is really one that we are recommending that the TAG do uh, as appropriate. But regardless, if this was um, moved and seconded and then uh, disapproved, the Office of Equity would perform this regardless. So I think it's a, a probably a very sound idea for this group to indicate that yes, they do have uh, concern for that, uh, that equity view and that they should approve it. Okay, thanks, John. Dwayne. So if it has to be done anyway, and it will be done anyway, what is the point? It's, if, if that's a question directed to me, it is that uh, we should indicate that yes, we have considered this and that we would like for them to perform it. Um, again, they will do it, but it, with this motion really indicates that we are supportive of that, that effort. So if, you, if, if, it came, if it comes forward as a motion as it does right now, and then it was declined, that would be an indication to the Office of Equity that this group really does not have any interest in applying that equity lens. Uh, that's not how I'm expecting this. My my thought is that uh, something to, to put in a request for something to be done that is going to be done anyway is just a waste of time. And, and we'll be looking at the entirety of the construction code package that we're adopting. And as we do every code cycle and its impact on small businesses, and then now we have a site we have an additional requirement that we look at equity impacts for the whole package. It's not a separate study for this one issue. I'm sorry, um, Chair Anderson, was that a question that I can respond to? I don't know that that was a question. Um, I think that was more of a comment. Um, because as, as indicated, this is a different evaluation than the yep. economic impact. Yep. I have next on the list, uh, Eric. So, so just, I guess, two things. Are, are we still talking about the last thing that we just tabled or is this diversity? No, this is a, there was a new motion that Kevin made um, and was seconded. That is to request an equity study on these two specific proposals and I mean, I'm, I, I'm trying to get us done uh, through these uh, today and Friday, next Friday. And I'm, in general, I think that this motion should be made by a different group, but it was made by this group and it's just, it's gonna, okay. it's just, it's, that, that was my, that it's just at this point kind of frustrating. Um, okay, then I'm going to stop talking right now because I was thoroughly confused. It sounded like we were talking about something that was already tabled. And now no, we're talking yeah. again about this. A, okay. a new motion that was made regarding this, um, regarding an, an equity study that appears according to the, the maker of the motion that, that is already required anyway. So, um, okay. Thank you. Uh, Patrick. I think it's the motion is important because it takes these two largest items and puts them under the microscope of the equities uh, review, these two in particular. That's why the motion is important. It 
as opposed to being lumped in with the other 150, it puts it on the radar screen and we should pass it. Um, you don't want to be labeled a rogue agency and not have any of this stuff go through. There'd be a win for the tag to pass it. Thanks, Patrick. Kevin. Just wanted to clarify that the, the motion is to for the tag to prepare an equity impact statement and then submit that to the Office of Equity for its review. For the tag to prepare this. Correct. In, I guess, who on the tag? Um, I, I, I don't know who would, who would do that. Um, are you well, it's, 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 would? it's not a study, just a statement. So, oh, the, the tag prepare a statement. Correct. And do you have a the statement prepared or, or what? I do not. Okay. So we we have a motion to prepare a statement, but we don't have the statement. Um, so this seems like it's ripe for tabling until we have a statement that we can actually review. Does that sound reasonable, Kevin? Agreed. Okay, so do you want to, you could withdraw the motion and then just make the motion with a statement prepared next time, or we could vote to table it, or, or I don't know what you want to do with this motion at this point. Uh, I think I'll let, let, leave it as it is. <laughs> it might okay, not complicate things more. But we don't have a statement to vote on. So, so um, I think that's, I, I'm well, not sure what to do with that. The motion is to prepare that statement and then submit it. And would we then vote on the statement once it's prepared? I, I suppose that's true. Okay, I, I would like to see the statement before I ask the tag to vote on it. Um, Fair enough. Everyone in this virtual room thinks equity is important, but um, the way it's worded, I think is also very important. Sure. So I would, if I had my way, I would suggest that the motion either be withdrawn or tabled because uh, we don't have a statement to vote on, um, but you as the maker of the motion, but the only person who can withdraw it, um, anyone else could make a motion to table it. Um, we can also take further comment. Amy. Thanks, Jill. Um, yeah, I'm finding this whole discussion frustrating um, because I don't think the tag knows what we're talking about. Um, I would move to table. Okay, we have a motion to table. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Okay, we have a motion to table. We have a second that cuts off discussion. I'm guessing we're going to need a roll call vote for this one. So, just a. Uh, So, so Amy, was that a motion to table though, but we are still gonna generate a statement, right? That is that, or is it just a motion to table? Tabling this current motion, because I don't think we have any information. Okay. No. And then I would, if we table it, I would ask the, the maker of the motion to figure out what the statement is and reach out to interested parties. And then we can review the statement at the next tag. Fair enough. So, Krista. Eric Fidel. Yes, yes, we'll table. Michael Kurtwright. Yes. Kevin Dwell. Yes. Michael Fowler. Yes. Patrick Hayes. Yes. Luke Howard. Yes. Dwayne Johnlin. Yes. Elizabeth Joyce. Yes. Mike McGivern. 
Yes. Eric Olman? Yes. Marina Rasputnis? Yes. David Reddy? Yes. Lisa Rosenau? Yes. Gavin Tennold? Yes. Sean Vig? Yes. Amy Willis? Okay, that passes 16 to zero. Hey, thanks, Krista. Um, I would urge anyone who wants to make motions like that to, and it sounds like, Kevin, that you were prepared to make that motion, but to perhaps have some language or some wording or something before you make those motions so that we don't, we don't spend lots of time on it. Um, Fair enough. And so, I, I request again, if folks could, Put their names in the chat if they want to be involved in the development of that. Kevin? Okay, C406. Uh, Reed, you, I mean, Amy and Patrick, you have your hands up. I'm assuming you don't need to have your hands up, but. Um, Take it down. Okay. Reed, uh, you have the floor. This is C406. We spent some time on it uh, uh, a while ago. Um, we are bringing it back up, and my hope is that everybody's reviewed it. We have a few comments on it here and there, if we do, um, and then we, we make a motion on it, and then we are going to go to other C406 proposals, and we have another 20 to go through. So um, I guess if, if someone has a big comment on what's in front of us, know that we will Relitigate most of the many of the issues later. Um, I would also like to remind everybody that at the last tag we we voted to use carbon emissions and not energy in the our, uh, C four hundred six table, and we also voted to um, use the 0.1 percent carbon savings per point. So we're into you know big point numbers. We did not, however vote to cap the number of credits uh, at all. So for, for a given pr uh, proposal. So with that, um, Reed, what are any changes to this C406 um, over the last um, few weeks? Two weeks. Yeah, thanks, Kiel. Uh, so I outlined in the document the, the changes we've got. So basically, uh, in light of Proposal 230, reaffirming the uh, opinion that you can separate areas out, uh, not just use groups. Uh, the front end was restructured and, and revised to kind of pull that out uh, as a separate subsection since it's not gonna happen most of the time um, and, and provide a step-by-step -step process there. Um, now, there were some comments last time that we couldn't shut off ventilation in a residential space with dwelling unit HVAC control, and I did dig into the Washington Mechanical Code. My understanding, this code we're working on today applies to uh, R2 that is, you know, four stories and above, and uh, the mechanical code section 403.8 with the continuous ventilation is not for that. It's for three stories and below. Uh, and so there is a provision to allow basically actual ventilation based on the number of people present for commercial buildings or buildings, three uh, residential three stories and above. And I believe what we're doing is valid under that. Um, so we did leave that in there. Uh, there was a suggestion related to also the same measure for window switch controls. Uh, the working group did meet twice in the interim. We discussed that. We felt that those were a little bit uh, challenging to maintain, and we didn't want to impose that. Uh, and would point out that there is a section already that requires door switches 
to control HVAC. So if you had an apartment with a large sliding door to a balcony, that door switch provision would, um, would come into play. Um, let's see, we just generally change occ occupancy type to occupancy group to be more in line with formal code language. And um, the credits, so, so we added a provision. So if you did a corn shell under the earlier code and you were carrying credit for that forward, you could multiply the old credits by six to get the new credits. And so we made that clear in the code. Um, we did revise a heat pump water heater. And, and so we the tag just passed that. We don't know if it'll totally survive downstream. It does provide a pretty healthy exception for 24 kW and, and greater in a building. So what we did was provide a provision for a small water heater to be a heat pump water heater and get credit for that. And we also included some conditional language, assuming that's acceptable, that says um, if for some reason the heat pump water heater main provision does not pass, then we would pull that language in without the exceptions as a credit and insert it into the document here. Um, we got rid of the service hot water thermostat balancing valves. Uh, it's redundant with proposal 175 that puts that in the base code. We tried to coordinate with some of the other proposals and we got rid of the base DOES and fan control option um, as that really only applied to R2 and we felt there wasn't that much savings there given the requirements for continuous ventilation and that sort of thing. Um, we considered having an intermediate level, but the working group discussed that and we stuck with uh, the main level. Um, let's see. And we, I adjusted the, the DOAS um, energy credits down a bit. We actually, there, there was a separate proposal that uh, made the HRV more stringent and also the fan got significantly more stringent. So that reduced the savings. So we've accounted for that in here since that proposal has passed. Uh, there was a separate proposal for uh, fault detection. Um, and so we brought that in here um, and we added an R2 laundry. That also was a separate proposal. I believe that was um, separate proposal 88. And uh, we added some language around the HVAC uh, control load management measure to provide a minimum three hour ramp period. I think that was a suggestion at the last meeting. And uh, there are some minor edits throughout. And in fact, in, in purple throughout, there are another set of minor additions that I got late breaking from Dwayne. I unfortunately wasn't, uh, didn't see those before I sent in what you had today. So those are new and additions, but none of them changed the content of the code. They're simple things like getting rid of the word may and replacing it with shall and getting rid of can and say shall be permitted to and that sort of thing. So none of those uh, changes um, were substantive, except we did add um, right now for the heat pump water heater provision for small heat pump water heaters, there was a requirement based on COP at certain testing conditions. And we felt that not all manufacturers would have that data readily available. So we added either do that or use a UEF at a level that is readily available for multiple manufacturers. And you know we can look at that if, if anyone wants to. So that's a rundown of the provisions. Um, if we want to look at any of them, I don't want to you know, drag us through all that if, if we don't need to. Um, so back to you, Kia. Thanks, Reid. Um, and then I just want to reiterate something that was said last time, which is that this doesn't, this proposal does a lot of things, but it doesn't necessarily increase stringency. Is that is that a true statement or is that? That's correct. We came up with a basket of proposals that someone would use to meet the old uh, requirements. We looked at what the new points were for those, the new credits, how, and that's how we came up with the credit requirements for each different category. Okay, yep, and there's, there's a proposal we'll look at later that, that increases stringency, but this one simply has better language and then changes the points to be a bit more 
um, based on reality. Um, okay, so this is a, not a short proposal. What comments, questions do you have? Kevin. Thank you. So I know at the last discussion, there was a, a, a consideration of a cap, so to speak. And I think there was a discussion in particular about if you had a measure with an enormous number of points that it would cap at the maximum required points for a given occupancy. Is that fair to say? That was discussed and I think voted on and the vote did not go in favor of a cap. Uh, we did discuss that at the working group and really the only measures that are really large are the heat pump water heating measures. Um, and actually, you know, if the base heat pump water heater heating measure passes, uh, there's a note in here to make those NA for R1 and R2. So they would pretty much go away, those large numbers. Uh, and then the second consideration there, you know, just to be sure, we did put a sentence uh, in the heat pump water heater requirement that said you had to do this for the entire building. So you couldn't just do it in part of the building and then carry it over to the rest of the building uh, for that particular measure. So, so we address that in those two ways. But again, if the heat pump water heater measure carries through, that becomes a moot issue. The, right. That's the only one that's really that that large. That makes sense. Thank you. David Reddy. Um, can you go up to the summary of the changes from the last proposal the, related to the ventilation for Group R? Uh, was Eric involved in that discussion that came to that decision that it didn't apply? I don't Wait, know if, if he was. We discussed it in the work group, um, and, and I read the, the language. And in fact, you know, uh, even 403.8 that relates to smaller buildings allows for a manual shutoff switch. Um, so I, OK, and then I guess the, um, the, the decision on the window switch, um, you point to that door switches are, are required, but you're, I think, acknowledging that those switches are not, there may be issues with longevity. So are you, are you kind of saying that the door switch is gonna have the same issue with longevity? Uh, I, I, I think door switches are a lot easier to install. Windows you know, have to seal tightly. Um, you know, I, there are a number of ways to do it. It could be done. Um, it's just once you hit every window in an apartment, that's just a lot of integrating rather than hitting one door. Um, okay. And, and it's kind of in line with the, the thinking at 90.1 where they um, did, you know, considered window switches and finally ended up making it a, a door switch proposal, which is, I believe, the source of the one in this code. So. I remember at the last tag, we did have a lot of support for this. So I'm, um, I guess, not surprised by the lack of comments. But if you have any comments on this, please. Kennedy. Yeah, I, I have, um, I was gone for a week. Um, I have a lot of mostly minor editorial issues and I wasn't sure how to bring them up. Yeah, I, I just ran through those uh, and I think there are probably three reference errors uh, that probably are critical. I, I would suggest maybe we adopt this and come back with an amendment uh, next week rather than let it hang fire or if we can do the three references now that'd be great if okay. you could just direct Krista what three references are and then if other things sure. are editorial let me um, those can be addressed easily later uh, just through the staff process if they're simply editorials or um, through a motion next week if if they're but but I think we should get the references right just just to avoid confusion later. Okay, if you go to 406222. 
keep going. There you go, two, two, two. Um, about the third line down in that, there's two references that need an additional two in them. A two and a point. Yeah. Right. And then if we go down to uh, the next paragraph, there's an or just above the exception that's crossed out there. That needs to go away. It just didn't get deleted. Um, and let's see. Then if we go down to more efficient HVAC heating performance, 223, we've got a similar thing there. OK, there we go. Uh, just the last line of that charging paragraph, it's 406.2.2.3.1. Through 2.2.3.2. We're getting a lot of, lot of numbers. Okay, you're going to have to pull me through that one again. Oh, OK. So it, it's basically just referring to the two paragraphs below there. So it's, it's 2.2.3.1. If you just, you know, 0.2.3, there you go. And then the next one, same thing, 2.2.3.2. 2. Yeah. I believe that's correct. Or one more. Two point, yeah. Do we get enough of them in there? Oh, 3.2. Yeah. Yep. There we go. Right. And then. I believe that is it. I mean, there's some other items that maybe are minor changes, but I don't think any of them left are structural flaws. Mike, I did provide some responses to what you found while we were going through those earlier motions. So um, I don't think there's anything left that's a killer, but we can maybe come back with a little minor editorial kind of amendment next week. Right, okay. Um, one general comment, I guess I wanted to know how, and I can't remember whether we talked about this before, but why initial tenant improvements get, have a fixed number of credits that they have to comply with. Um, well, you know, that was the, what was there before. Um, so I was just following that language for those and I just said it, it used to be three and I just did the three times six is 36 concept. I mean, if we thought it was important to make a change, which we could maybe bring up next week, we would put another line in table C406.1 if we think that varies by occupancy. Well, yeah, I guess I got concerned that it seems like what you want is for the tenant improvements to have to comply with the same number of credits as required by the table. Um, yeah, except the, the theory is that the core and shell should have, should have already done something. Well, I mean, they get to the, take credit for those. What? The tenant improvement areas would get to take credit for those, right? Mm. Yeah, I that hear what you're that saying. That was the logic between making them have this do the same number of credits in the current code. OK. Well, that would be a, a little more subtle approach rather than the, the kind of single number for all of them. Um, and and maybe- Is that gonna be easy to, to talk through today or should we attempt to I, vote on this whole thing except for- oh, I, can, I can put together a proposal on it, I suppose, along with a couple other things because some of them I don't want to let go of. I guess what yeah, we did, I, yeah, I think Mike and I can, you know, come up with an amendment that'll that'll work. Okay, I guess what we did with the heat pump water heating one was we passed it except for uh, assigned a piece of it to be worked on further. So, so I'd, I'd like to make that motion then, Shell. Okay. That we um, approve this uh, 
wonderful work read, amazing, um, uh, as it shows on the screen with knowledge that uh, Reed and, and Mike will come back uh, with just that, that one aspect of it um, cleaned up and thanks to Mike for noticing that. Oh, there are a few, it's not just this single tenant space this way and there's several areas I'd like to clean up. Um, have at it. Okay. Um, that will be part of my motion is to do uh, to agree on the necessary cleanup and come back to the us uh, us those limited areas. Yeah, I think they're just a handful, and it it'll be pretty clean to look at those once we get this all accepted and you know, okay, build on it. Okay, great. So we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second for that motion? Second. Okay, we have a second. And the motion, I'm just gonna attempt to restate it, is to pass this um, large proposal uh, with the full knowledge that the tenant spaces and perhaps a couple of other areas will be worked on and we'll revisit them later. Um, Mike and Reed are gonna work on that. If anybody else wants to help work on that, um, please let them know. So um, that is the motion. We have a second for their discussion, Lisa. Yeah, thank you. And, and thanks, Reed, again, for all your, your hard work on this and for corralling everybody's comments. Um, just for the benefit of the tag members who brought this up, could you just very briefly cover your discrete area section that you've added, just so that everybody knows how that, the intent of that section? Right. If you can roll up just above the table, Krista, um, to the main charging language, a little more. All right, so, so we have the main charging language. We have number one, new buildings do this. So we broke this out into a numbered list. And then um, we also, number two is they'll do the load management credits. Uh, then tenant spaces shall comply. And that refers to the later detailed section. And then it says projects using discrete area credit weighting shall comply in accordance with the later section. Then if you can roll down to uh, 40612, which is just below the table. And you can see there's that new area and it basically says you can break up a, a building into multiple areas. You know, that's kind of, that's in line with that opinion that came out last time. And then it, it walks you through a little more detailed step-by-step, -step. here's how you would calculate that weighted average. So you calculate the requirement as a weighted average, you calculate the credits you got for each area, then you weight all those together and then you pass if the weighted average credits is equal to or greater than the weighted project requirement. So, and, and we work with the proponent of, um, was it the other proposal whose number escapes my mind uh, to, to say that this kind of captured the language in that other proposal. Great, thank you. Yes, uh, 230, proposal 230. Yeah. Hey, are there other comments on this proposal or the motion on the table? Okay, with that, I will risk a voice vote and, oh, Mike Pilar. Muted, Mike. You raised your hand, Mike. <laughs> Thank you. I just didn't realize I was muted. Uh, um, quick question for you, Reed. Uh, if we can go up just to the table. Um, I mean, over overall, I'm fine with the structure. I just want to view. Um, and just going with the rough assumption that um, sort of like what was one point is now 10 points. Um, and if we had six credits before, um, what's the variation? Well, I guess what determined the variations for group B to be lower uh, and the variety for like say group M versus, you know, to be 63 versus group B at 36. I forgot right. why so, that was. Right, so what I did is, is I took the six credit. Well, first I, I looked at the prior measures that we had available that would total up to the six credits and I picked a handful of measures uh, that would be typically applied, not everyone, but you know, uh, probably a half 
between three and a half dozen measures for each building type, uh, then I assigned those measures the new credits and saw how those related to the six credit requirement before, or, or I'm sorry, I, I looked at what the old credits were and said, okay, if, if I get, if I look at this handful of measures and I get say 36 credits and only six were required, I need one sixth of those. And then I looked at the new measures, similar measures, because these now have different numbers by building type uh, and looked at those and, and made them equivalent. I mean, that's probably the best way to describe it. I, you know, maybe I need to pull up the spreadsheet, but uh, I'd have to dig it up. So the idea was if you did a basket of, of credits before and you said, how much of that basket do I need to get six points? And if I look at the same basket of measures now, um, what does it take to be equivalent to that six points? that answer your question, Mike? Um, partly. Um, I'm still trying. Uh, I mean, we, before we had everybody was, I thought, all, all the same. And the, there was variations like we like you currently have with the points difference. But um, It was the same, but but depending upon each typology, you would be required for the, the optimum cost path would probably require you to achieve a slightly different level of efficiency than a different typology. Now, one thing we can consider as Mike and I work, as I'm sitting here thinking about this, is you know we did basis for group R1 and R2, which do have a higher requirement on having that heat pump water heater available. Now, if that's not available, um, then maybe those points should be reduced and I can recalculate that. And again, we can include that as a provisional item um, when we come back with, with these revisions I'll work with Kennedy on and you know, say, well, if we have the heat pump water heater in here because it's not in the base, then these are the points we're looking at, but if, the heat pump water heater becomes part of the base requirement, then there would be probably a reduction in, in those two buildings at least. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would propose that we do that now, that now that you brought it up. Hey, David, ready. So can I make a motion then to table this until we see that, those revisions? You, you are free to make that motion. I am making that motion. Okay, we have a motion to table. Second. We have a motion to table and a second. Um, let's do a voice vote. I'll risk a voice vote on this one. All in favor of, well, no. Okay, let's do a roll call vote, Krista. The, the motion on the floor is to table this so that the, the main motion was to pass this, but there were a few things outstanding that we had referred back to Reed and Mike. Um, the, the, the other motion is now to table it um, and not pass it, but in fact, just to table it. So that's the motion on the floor is to table it. So Krista. Okay, Eric Fidel. Day. Michael Kurtwright. No. Kevin Duell. Yes. Mike Fowler. Yes. Patrick Hayes. Yes. Luke Howard. Yes. Dwayne Johnlin? No. Elizabeth Joyce? Mike McGivern? 
Yes. Eric Oldman? Yes. Arena Rasputinus? No. David Reddy? Yes. Lisa Rosenau? No. Gavin Tennold? No. Sean Vig? Yes. Amy Wheelis? No. Motion carries eight to seven. Do I get a vote? No. No. No, I don't. No, because while your vote could change the outcome, it would just make it a tie that we couldn't resolve. Yep, I, I'm gonna vote no on this one. Um, I think we need to move it. I think we need to, there, there are some outstanding issues, but I think they're relatively minor. And um, I think we can, I liked the other motion better. So um, I'm gonna vote uh, not to table this. So it's a tie, so. So it does not pass. It does not pass. Um, and did we have a, a main motion to pass this with a few caveats on it? Yes. That's where we were. So um, are there, is there further discussion on that main motion? Okay, let's do a roll call on the main motion, which is to pass 406 with the idea that several of, a few of these areas rather, will go to Reed and Mike Kennedy and others to work on and come back before the tag um, next week. Eric Fidel. Yes. Michael Kurtwright. Yes. Kevin Duell. Abstain. Mike Fowler. Yes. Patrick Hayes. Yes. Luke Howard. Yes. Dwayne Johnlin? Yes. Elizabeth Joyce? Mike McGivern? Yes. Eric Olnon? Yes. Karina Rasputinus? Yes. David Reddy? Yes. Lisa Rosenau? Yes. Gavin Tennold? Yes. Sean Vig? Yes. Amy Willis? Yes. Motion carries 14 to zero with one abstention. Okay, so this is passed 
who wants to join, please put it in the chat if you want to join Mike and Reed on our exciting adventure to um, work on the TI language and um, perhaps a few other um, mostly clerical and um, yes, possibly minor edits. Okay, um, we are moving on to uh, 078. Um, this is a Mark Frankel uh, proposal. Mark, are you there? You are. I am. All right, Mark, you have the floor. All right, this is a proposal to require on site renewable energy. It's modeled after a combination of Seattle language with a uh, the California calculation protocol was developed by myself and Rahul. I will say that uh, there's some language in here for C406 that has been modified in the C406 proposal we just passed. So we'll have to change the C406 language in here. Uh, it, actually, I think it can just go away because the, it, it doesn't need to be dependent on C406, the proposal here. The proposal is to require a modest amount of, of on-site solar for all commercial buildings and uh, to also allow for additional credit for additional solar in C406. So Mark, I guess just if the portion that was C406, which is the main topic today, um, is not the main piece of this anymore because it's um, it would be taken out of this, I guess I'm wondering if this is the right time to talk about this or should it be discussed later? Well, it was only, it wasn't the main portion. It was just the first por por portion because it was in order. The, the main part of this is a, a revision to the solar requirements in the Washington State Code in C411. Uh, okay, and so I guess. But, um, but whatever you think, but uh, I'll would, just say that. Yeah, I would. I think we should table this. That's just my opinion on that because we're, co we're covering C406 issues today and this is no longer a, a major C406 piece, um, but that's of course not my choice. That's just what I'm thinking based on what, what else we're considering right now, so. Okay, well, and I can't make that movement, but I don't oppose it. I'll move the table. Second. Okay, the motion to table, we have a second. Um, all in favor of tabling this, say aye. 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 Any, any opposed, say nay. Okay, tabled successfully. Okay, we, now we will go to 146, which is also Mark Frankel uh, proposal. So this one is highly dependent on a number of open questions before this committee. Uh, it, the proposal is to increase the stringency of or the number of points required in C406, which is effectively increasing the stringency of the code. And it's sort of dependent on how well we do with the rest of the code as to whether we're meeting the goals of the legislature towards achieving a 70% reduction by 2030. And given the fact that we don't know what's going to be in the required and what's in the optional as, you know, the, in particular, the big ones, the hot water and the and the heat pump water heater and how that play into C406, I would actually suggest that we should wait on this until more of that is resolved. I move to table. We have a motion to table. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion to table and a second. All in favor of tabling this, uh, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Okay, we have proven ourselves to be great at tabling things. Um, we are going to now discuss the one uh, two, three, six that we had tabled until after lunch. Uh, Kitchen DCV with uh, Nick and Neil. Nick, are you, are you still with us? I am, I just joined. 
Great. All right. Do you want to walk us through what you just did to this? Yeah, the the red section there that, that Krista inserted is, is basically what we did. We just came up with a definition for demand control kitchen ventilation to match what we're requiring in the in the language edits below. Um, and I chipped it off. It sounds like both Robbie and Mike thought it looked okay, but if others have comments on it, this this is language that is used pretty commonly with uh, with Energy Star on, on the types of sensors and things like that. And a lot of the, qu the kitchen equipment manufacturers uh, use similar language there. So just try to put something together that that use the industry terms that are, are used for this. Thanks, Nick. Um, are there comments on this? We had discussed the proposal earlier and then kind of towards the end, we decided a definition was necessary. And so Nick supplies a definition. Are there further comments on this? I'd like to make a motion to approve the proposal as we see it on the screen. Second. Okay, we have a motion to approve and a second. Further discussion. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Great job, Nick. Um, I love that, that we can get things done quickly. Um, so now we are back to um, item six on the agenda, which is other C406 proposals. Uh, so I think we're going to go to do 221 now. Um, this is an Eric Vandermeer. Um, on vacation. He's been on vacation all day. Um, in the past, we have skipped ones where the proponent's not here, but we're kind of getting really down to the last few. So I don't know. Um, we could table all of Eric's today, unless someone wants to speak for them. 221, does anyone want to speak for 221? Shall I move to table Eric's proposals until next week? Okay, we have a motion to table all of, all of Eric's proposals, which is 221, 220, 120. Uh, Jill, a little clarification. 120 is, in fact, my proposal. That was a typo on the agenda. I just oh, okay. Catch, didn't catch that till now. Sorry about that. Okay. okay so we'll so read your awesome, Krista. So the motion is 221 and 220 to table both of those because Eric is not in the room. Is there a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. All in favor of tabling, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Okay. We are then on to 120, which is Gavin. Chris, I would hope that you would be able to bring up the revised one that is labeled contingent on um, Mr. Reed's proposal that came earlier, which we passed with a couple of uh, stipulations there. I think this is it. You got it. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we had a lot of conversation uh, during the 4, 407 portion of the um, process here regarding offsite renewables. Uh, this is a proposal to um, bring in. Oh, Chris. This isn't the right one. This is, is the right. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yep. It, it, the, the, the file name says contingent on. Do you want me to share my screen possibly, Krista? No, let me pull it up. I've got it here someplace. I just have to. There it is. Thank you. Um, nope, this isn't it. Nope, this is not it. 
There you go. Put it in the wrong folder. No worries. Um, yeah, so um, on Shell's uh, email to the TIG, you know, he kind of said that it looks as, as if uh, we, we may be heading in the direction of a uh, 406 proposal um, that, that's largely based on reads. Uh, prior to the TIG process, uh, we, um, and uh, we being the Washington Solar Energies Industries Association had put together a proposal for community solar and community solar alone. Uh, not knowing about the conversation we were about to have as a TIG uh, in the 407 process. Um, so this is simply a proposal which is trying to use the framework that we um, discussed in the 407, discussed and adopted in the 407 proposal, uh, not changing any of the allocations for credits that Reed had proposed. But if you go down a little further there, Krista, to um, keep going. And many of you will probably remember this, the 406, the 407 multipliers for uh, distance of offsite renewables. So. Um, it is a proposal which allows um, for uh, credits in the 406 portion of the code for offsite renewables based on the same ratios that we agreed to in the 407 process. So Gavin, just to be clear, this what's all the stuff in yellow has already passed the tag, is that correct? Uh, no, no shell that that is not true. All the stuff in yellow is not what Past. I think that that might be a, a formatting. Um, okay. That would have been highly clever of me, but no. Okay, so all of this stuff is new. To no, the we we adopted this table multipliers for renewable energy procurement method in four oh seven, where yep. we had directly owned offsite renewables, Western Interconnect, and yep. in the states of Oregon or Idaho, just trying to bring those into. 406. Okay. Okay. I understand what you're doing in the code language is just copying, pasting the table into C406 as a C406 table. Is that correct? And you're on mute, Gavin. That is correct, Jill. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, is that your uh, presentation, Gavin? That is my presentation, Joe. Okay. Are there comments on this? Dwayne. A question for you. Um, I, I'm not clear on whether this is increasing the amount of credits that are uh, provided uh, in, in this system or leaving them the same, but just sort of reorganizing them. Dwayne, I did not change the credits that were on Reed Hart's proposal. So we moved. Uh, 40 minutes or so ago to, you know, take reads forward with a few um, items of homework, but those, you know, going across the table right there on number row 11, those are the same uh, credits that we okay. kind of just looked at. Then can you scroll down to the charging language down below that you've got in the yellow? So. <laughs> Uh, and where did the formula come from? Formula came from the proposal that we passed uh, just just a while back. 
Okay. So this basically the function of this is to is to create some appropriate weighting for for offsite renewables. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, David, ready? Um, yeah, so just so I know, this, the requirements are in terms of watts, not necessarily kilowatt hours in your proposal, or are you suggesting a different using kilowatt hours for renewable, for community solar systems? Um, David, this is not a proposal for community solar anymore. Okay, all right, I'm sorry. Can I rephrase that? So. You you have a table for kilowatt hours per square foot somewhere. If I saw correctly, is that right? I think the tables are all for systems of power. That was an old table, David. All right. Okay. Well, I guess uh, is the rationale for going to watts product uh, per ca capacity. I mean, we all recognize that there's different capacity uh, potential depending on where you're located in the system design. Why why abandon foot thresholds? David, that's a fantastic question. Um, that was the change I made in trying to kind of line up with language that I was seeing coming from Reed Hart's proposal. Um, and I would defer to Reed if, Reed, Reed, if you want to try to explain why we went from energy to power there. If yeah, so the, uh, the credits are based on additional installed watts because that's easy to um, for enforcement to look at what's installed rather than requiring some separate calculation based on tilt angles and all that, what the, the power is. And this is based on a default, you know, uh, orientation and tilt angle um, as far as how we calculate what savings will accrue from the installation of those, those watts. I could also chime in that that um, Seattle's based its renewable energy um, C406 credits on on installed watts, and that's also the direction that we took with um, renewable energy for 90.1. Yeah, I guess it makes sense for Seattle because production is kind of somewhat uniform. But I mean, it does. I mean, if we're tying all this to emissions reductions, um, it seems. I mean, I guess all of these measures could be our climate zone dependent. So there's that trade off. But um, I don't know. I guess for renewable energy, it's pretty not that difficult to quantify using the available free programs for modeling, similar to like you would have to do for, say, TSPR. It sure is a lot easier for us code officials, though. Well, you could just do a printout for PV watts. I mean, that's how it was documented, required for, uh, for what was it? Seattle references PV watts as a requirement for their, their submissions, don't they? In, in any case, David, we, we should mention that that um, this proposal we're talking about right here is just augmenting what's already been decided upon, which includes that per, that watt basis for the renewable energy. Yeah, all, all this proposal does is adds the ability for offsite to meet it. Is that my understanding that correctly? Yeah, Jill, that is correct. That is correct. So um, my understanding of the moment of time we're in here is the table shown on the screen uh, and the formula is part of our draft. So. Okay, I guess the, the remaining, can we just reference the other table rather than two tables in the code? Or, or put this in C406 and reference it in C407, something like that to mitigate uh, con conflicts potentially? I think that that points back to the conversation, um, which was tabled, uh, Mark, Mark Frankel's proposal, just trying to kind of create a, a, a spot in the code for, re, you know, renewables in general. Um, I think you were, we were looking at 411. Um, you know, that's definitely a conversation I, we ought to be having. I feel like we could do that right now and just modify this proposal to insert this in 411. Just call it table C411 point something like that. Well, I think, yeah, C411 would become renewable energy and 
C411.1 would be solar readiness, and then C411.2 would be offsite solar or something. Yeah. Um, I guess that would be a lot of probably wordsmithing right now. Unless it can be done quickly. Um, so. I don't know that it can be done quickly. I feel like. Yeah, I'm, I'm not feeling like I want to um, chew the proposal up too much that, that we've already got here. Um, given that we've tabled a solar, um, you know, section altogether already today, I would, I would like to see us just kind of see this stand on its merits and, and maybe it gets uh, moved into 411 when we reconsider Mark Frankel's proposal. Okay, that, that sounds reasonable to me. Um, Kevin. Yeah, a quick question in the formula, uh, if that could be on the screen, there's a, a term RR sub R in the formula, but it's struck out in the, the description. Should that be reinstated? You wanna take that one? That, that was the edit that you and I spoke about on Wednesday. And I think that that was in your proposal today too. Uh, let's see, I don't think we struck that out. Maybe we... No, we didn't. Yeah, was I'm, I mean, the idea is, and, it, and it's somewhat redundant, redundant, I mean, and I don't know, I'm, I'm referring to section C412, um, which I guess still doesn't exist. Exist, right? I mean, there's not a base requirement. Uh, I think in our proposal, we may have changed that. Let me just look on the screen here. Hold on a second. Um, that says, let's see, where are we at? 625. I think I get the intent. You want to give yeah, credit yeah. Oh, for what's okay. not required. So that, in, in what we just voted on, that says rating of on-site renewable energy systems required by other sections in this code in what? So, so the idea there is you're gonna subtract out from your total installed anything uh, that is already um, required elsewhere. So if Frankel comes back with, with his proposal, and I didn't put a reference to a section number, I just made it generic. Um, I hadn't seen that yet, Reed. So, so if the tag is okay with it, I'd like to just re revise to say what Reed. Yeah, it, it just says renewable energy systems required by other sections in this code, parentheses, wants. Yep. And I guess- And the without sense. exception isn't necessary. As the way we handle this, normally if you underline something, that means it's new. And right now everything's underlined. So um, if we pass this, it, it would, to the best of my knowledge, replace the entire part of Reed's proposal because it's all underlined. Um, and I guess that's maybe my my interpretation of, of what's going on, as opposed to, I guess what the goal is that, or the, the intent is that just the red stuff is the modified stuff. Right. Okay. So, so basically, if we didn't change, if we didn't strike out RRR, then it would be whatever Reed has suggested because we didn't intentionally modify it. That's my understanding of how we would pass these things. Is that, is that correct? So people generally agree that that's okay. In other words, if we, if we pass one proposal and we subsequently pass another proposal that has similar code sections, but is not modifying the language in the original proposal, then we wouldn't modify the language in the original proposal when Krista goes to mash these all together. Sure seems like this needs to get tabled to get untangled. I'm, I'm kind of on board, but um, yeah, even though we've tabled 37 things already, I moved to table this. Okay, we have a second. second. Okay, we have a motion to table, we have a second. All in favor of tabling, say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Aye. Any opposed, say nay. Okay, we have tabled this one as well. All right. Um, we have the low carbon energy district one next. This is, and I guess a question for Gavin Wall, Wall um, Clipper, uh, are you around? Um, uh, this is this is Marcus Liu. I I'm a representative of Centrio. Um, unfortunately, Clarence is uh, had to jump off the call about ten minutes ago. Okay. Um, so I, I would ask the the tech committee to. Um, unfortunately, please, please request to table this one until next week. Um, also on the grounds that there are three proposals and I don't know that 15 minutes is enough time, even if we were to go into it. Okay. Someone want to make that motion? We don't have to motion to table because we haven't even opened it yet, right? We haven't started discussion. Okay. Well, we have to, it's on the agenda. It's an exciting one on the agenda. Okay, motion to table. Uh, Second. By, by the way, uh, Chell, I, I sent you the revised language I promised and to Krista also just now on, on the, um, the uh, uh, radiant heating. Okay, is that, was that something we were gonna come up and take up again today? Yeah, I was supposed to have it finished by after lunch. Oh, okay. Well, let's consider that one now because we, this is after lunch. Uh, after we table this one, let's table this one first. We have a motion in a second to table. Uh, all in favor of tabling the say aye. And by this we mean 121. Aye. 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 Any aye. opposed say nay. Okay, let's talk Dwayne's proposal. We appreciate it and we apologize. Thanks. All right, Krista, do you have Dwayne's language and? Pulling it up. All right. So what I did was uh, to, to separate out the indoor and the outdoor um, uh, sections of it so that it. Did... So. Um, oh, and that shows everything underlined. How did that happen? Because I still had. Oh, okay. Um, so, so uh, this way, outside of the building, um, I split it so that that ox sensors would would uh, be limited to to twenty minutes with no activity, whereas timer switches you could run for an hour. Um, and and then I made a separate eleven point one point one for the low energy spaces. And, and for that, um, I said, yeah, you can, in addition to that heating that you can, you're already allowed in a low energy space, you can have these localized radiant heaters with, with uh, aux sensors or, or with timer switches that e each that's limited to 20 minutes. Okay, comments. Ben. Thought you were going to make those 30 minutes, and it still has the same thing where uh, a, a freeze protected space. Can you say radiant heating in, lo in occupied low energy spaces, or you really no, do want to make said, a loophole? No, I, I've made it clear here. It, it, it's in addition to the heating energy that you're allowed already, you can have some local electric radiant heating. Oh, I got it, thank you. So it's an add-on and it really, you would never do such a thing unless there was someone there. I got you. And, and yeah, you're right. It, Krista, could you just change that very last number 20 to a 30, which is what we agreed to the last time. So for the outdoor, which is often a dining situation, you got an hour. Are you talking about that one or the, the other one? No, I'm, we're good. We're good. Just like it. Uh, don't don't change anything else. Okay. 
Kevin. So the original proposal had radiant heating in general. <clears throat> this one is electric radiant heating specifically. Uh, was the intent to have that in the original proposal or was this a restriction on gas radiant heaters that's in, in addition to the original proposal? Well, that, yeah, that's that was what I wanted to be getting to for these uh, allowing some radiant heating indoors. Do you not want gas? Because the best radiant heaters are the gas ones, the electric ones. Um, they don't have a lot of horsepower. You might have noticed um, that I have a, a, a uh, a general trend to eliminate as much fossil fuel burning in buildings as possible. So here we're just opening up an additional clarification for those peculiar situations where it's cold in there and somebody wants a little radiant heater. And in, in my language, it would be electric. And I suppose the initiating part of the sentence there, the existing consideration for low energy spaces allows any kind of heating as long as it's low enough in energy density. Right. That didn't change. Gotcha. Mike Kennedy. I do not understand why they need an extra allowance. <laughs> They're allowed to have heat in there. Um, this actually turns out to be a pretty big quantity of heat when you're talking about a hundred thousand square foot warehouse um you know even the even the low energy space definition i mean it easily accounts for having you know an electric i mean the heat in the low energy space can be delivered right where it's needed it doesn't have to be distributed everywhere in the space so i just don't understand why it needs to be extra as you might imagine mike and i have had this discussion a few times now um, and and uh, my feeling is that is that the low energy space allows a little general space heating, but radiant heating is different. And this is specific things where it's the language really pins it down that each individual thing has to run while somebody's there. So it's not like it's on twenty four seven. Lisa. Yeah. So I'm. I'm kind of with Mike on this one. Uh, I, I I like the original proposal. Um, this this detail here. Uh, well, I'll just say the way we have been advising folks on the low energy space requirement in the energy code for a long time is that um, you can use that you know, for localized heating. I mean, you can't heat a space at three point, you know, or at one watt per square foot, it just, you can't. And so, you know, our understanding was that that was how that energy was used. Um, and you can't even really provide freeze protection with that. And so I'm kind of with Mike on this one that I, I'm a little concerned that, that folks are gonna run with this a little bit. Um, I don't know. I'll think about it a little bit more, but this is different than the original proposal, at least from what I understood it to be. So localized electric radiant heating controlled by ox sensors or, or a 30 minute time switch doesn't still see, sounds to you like you're heating the whole building full time? Uh, no, no, not at all. Um, <laughs> I know what I was what I was trying to say is that when folks have talked about whether they can utilize, you know, what, how much energy can they put in a low energy space, and we tell them, okay, it's one watt per square foot or three point four BTUs, which is not very much. Right. Um, so my thought here is that they can these things are you know these things in the winter are cold, and you can have you're allowed now to have a little uh, radiant heater panel there over your desk. Right, no, so why can't that little radiant heater over your desk be a part of that 3.4 watts per square, or, or, or one watt per square foot? I mean, that's, that's kind of the way we've been advising folks on the code for a well, long time. This is different. Anyway, okay. I'd like to call the question. Okay. Call the question of the two thirds majority vote, two fourths a vote and cut off debate. So, 
Um, all in favor of voting right now on this, um, to call the question. Uh, Motion to table. I think the call the question is, I don't know which one takes precedence, but why don't we do that one? Uh, they call the question the enforcing a vote on this. Um, all in favor of voting on this right now, say aye. Aye. <laughs> Any opposed to voting on this right now, say nay. 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 Okay, let's do a roll call vote because that's that's what the <laughs> rules that we adopted require. Could I withdraw my motion then and avoid the roll call? I think you can. Good. I withdraw the motion. Okay, motion withdrawn. Um, Eric, do you want to put forward a motion? Motion to the table. Okay, we have a motion to table. Second. Motion to table and second, all right. All in favor of the motion to table, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Okay. <laughs> we're good at tabling things. Um, we're, we're expert at it. We have four minutes left. I don't know that we can reasonably start. We could table something in four minutes, but that wouldn't really help. Um, we have a lot to go through next week. I don't see how we're going to get through all this next week. Um, I think we need to go into... August 27th or some some other date. So Krista and I will put our heads together and see if we can find another date. There's an MVE that I think is supposed to be scheduled for August 27th, but I think there's no way we're going to get through this next week. Um, so, all right. Uh, are there any, any closing thoughts from anybody? Kevin. Jill, I'm just wondering if we should talk to the group a little here about schedules going into the holiday and try to find a Friday that is reasonable before we adjourn? Well, I think the 27th is is not a holiday, uh, not adjacent to a holiday. So that- Like a poll, to... like a just a thumbs up, thumbs down, just to kind of get an idea? Sure. Okay, who's available like on the- on the, the date there, yeah, 27th. Who's available on the 27th? Who's not available on the 27th? Um, put your put a big red X up if you're not available on the 27th. Big. Okay. okay, so Patrick and not, not available. <laughs> I don't know how to Eric make it. Are not available on the 27th. Um, the following weekend is a three day weekend, and I really don't want to to do it on the that weekend. Um, there's a notion that we need two MBE committees, committee meetings before the Building Code Council picks us up. So we can't push it too far out. I don't really see a Friday option other than the 27th. Um, so, so Shell, I think there's the reason why I, I again on 27th, I think a lot of people who have families, they're, they're starting school on the first, I think this year, or at least some of the school districts. And again, every school district yeah. is different, but at least, so, so there's some people in my case, taken off with my kids just right prior to school. And, and again, I don't know what that, what everyone's situation is, but just just throwing that out there, why the 27th might be an issue. Yeah, And, and, and I'd like to just say that the, the 27th is probably um, the least unpleasant of a, several unpleasant options. Yeah, I'm gonna be in Idaho with no internet service remote might have cell service, but. Well, we have lots of, we've been done lots of work and we have lots more to do. So I think maybe a doodle poll or I don't know, something, we'll, we'll try and figure out something, Lisa. Yeah, just, and I know we only have one minute left. Um, perhaps we should also have a, a plan for tabling. I mean, I totally appreciate that we are all doing our diligence here to refine the language, which is great. Um, but I also, perhaps we need to have some protocol on, like it can only be tabled once or twice or something like that. So we don't have proposals that just keep kind of get kicked down the road. 
just no. I um I agree. I think we need to be a little less maybe perfect in our language and um because there is still many opportunities for us to change the language after we pass it. So um all right on that note um we'll see you next week and possibly and well probably sometime after that as well. So have an awesome weekend. Um see you all later. Thanks for some so much great input on everything. Good job, Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Joe.